Okay, so let's begin this morning session, which will be all philosophy. Um, and the first speaker is Amber Ross from University of Florida, talking about consciousness from a dog to AI. Okay. Thank you. Um, I just, um, I, I wanted to start by thanking the conference organizers. Uh, this has been a fantastic um, representation of all different sorts of areas coming together to work on similar and overlapping problems that are informing each other. And yesterday's talks were really inspiring to me. Um, I found a lot of uh, what speakers were saying yesterday really sort of bore on the sort of things I wanted to talk about today. So um, I'm going to draw a few connections here and there between what some people talked about yesterday and what I'm talking about here. Um, so the, the talk uh, that I said I was going to give today um, is about how the study of consciousness in animal minds can inform the philosophy of AI. And I am going to give that talk, but more particularly, I'm going to focus on self-consciousness. I'm going to do this for a couple of reasons. Um, one reason is because that's the kind I'm interested in or at least currently most interested in. Another reason is that I'm beginning to question whether studying consciousness in general is something that's really productive, or maybe we would be better off thinking of consciousness as always something that comes in some form or other. So perhaps we should better think of consciousness as being consciousness of something. Might help with the hard problem, then again, maybe nothing will ever help with the hard problem, I'm not really sure. But today I'm gonna to talk about how studying self-consciousness in animal minds might help us understand uh, when it could be appropriate to attribute some sort of self-consciousness to other kinds of non-human minds as well. Or basically, address the question that everybody is interested in this week, which is, could an AI actually be self-aware? When people suggested that maybe, um, maybe the chatbot, the Google chatbot, uh, is self-aware, I mean, is sentient, I don't think they've really meant sentient, right? This chatbot, as far as I know, there are no integrated sensors, sensation isn't going to be a thing for the chatbot, but there's something that people are wondering about when they're wondering whether the chatbot is what they call sentient. And I think what they're wondering is whether the chatbot is aware that it itself exists as something in the world, which is something I would characterize much more as self-consciousness or self-awareness rather than sentience. It's really sort of splitting hairs, maybe. But then again, it could be that if we decide something like a chatbot with no connection to an external world could be self-aware, then at least we would know that our concept of self-awareness is open to the idea that it doesn't necessarily involve, say, sensation or feeling as such. Thought might be sufficient. But this question, could an AI, and then I have a conspicuous blank, afterwards, be self-aware, I find that it's difficult for me to figure out how to frame the question or what's the right way to phrase it. Um, and this might just be an artifact of language, which also makes this a really great place um, to address this question. Because when we're talking about AI, or when I've been talking about AI when I'm working on AI ethics, which is something that I've been involved in in the past few years, we talk about AI models. Um, or we talk about algorithms, but asking whether an AI model could be self-aware or, or an algorithm could be self-aware doesn't seem to capture the question, at least not sort of in an analogous way that we ask it about ourselves. So when we talk about human beings, we say that we are self-aware, um, but anybody who's ever been so fortunate as to done any philosophy philosophy of mind or introduction to philosophy, um, probably have pointed out to them that we usually don't say that a human brain is self-aware. Um, we say that we ourselves are self-aware, we are self-conscious, but the brain isn't self-conscious. That seems like the wrong sort of thing or what Ryle would have called a category mistake. It's like you don't have a right glove and a left glove and a pair of gloves. You don't have three entities. You'd be counting in the wrong way if you thought when you had the right and the left glove and a pair of gloves, there were three things present. So it'd be a category mistake. 
So instead, what we're wondering when we're wondering whether something non-human could be self-aware, and in this case, something artificial, is just this. We're wondering, could HAL, whatever HAL is supposed to refer to, be self-aware? Or in this case, could Lambda be uh, self-aware? Now, what I'm going to talk about today is something that I've been thinking about for quite a while, um, but I haven't presented it to an audience before. Um, I've put it on the back burner for a few years. Some of the reasons is other things just need to be more pressing, uh, work in, in AI ethics, talking about what AI is actually doing right now, and some of the problems that we kind of want to sort out before we start using it uh, in big, high-stakes situations. Um, they've been attracting more of my attention, but this lies much closer to my heart. And so I'm very happy to have the whole world now, for at least three days, interested in whether AI might be self-aware, because that's really what I'm interested in as well. And my answer is going to be sure, because I'm just asking if it could be. And conceptual possibility is a really low bar. If we wanted to say it was impossible, that would be a very challenging task. And there are times in the past where I've thought that things that seemed conceivable to others were actually inconceivable, and I've tried to make those cases. But I think that one should only make that case when they're really convinced that this thing is actually impossible. And I don't think it's certain that an AI could not be self-aware. So I would say, sure, it could be. But then we maybe have a few more useful questions to ask. Like, under what conditions would it be somewhat reasonable to believe that an AI is self-aware? Or if we just want to frame the question more generally, under what conditions would it be somewhat reasonable to assume that anything is self-aware? And the answer that I want to give um, is that the time at which it becomes reasonable, or the conditions under which it's reasonable to believe that anything could be self-aware is just when being self-aware is useful to that thing, given that thing's goals and drives and motivations and abilities. I say et cetera. That's a really big hand wave. Uh, this theory isn't complete yet, but I think we sort of see a picture here. Things... <sighs> There's a long history of thinking that we shouldn't attribute more features to a system than are necessary for what the system needs to do. And if we think of self-consciousness or self-awareness as just one more feature of a system, then we probably wouldn't want to attribute it to that system if it wasn't useful, at least, um, for whatever it is that system is driven or motivated or intends to do. OK. Well, we had a different test, uh, the mirror self-recognition test. This was popular for a long time. Um, Gordon Gallup, I believe, uh, started using this test in the 1970s. And it was fascinating. Um, when elephants seem to recognize themselves in the mirrors and chimpanzees seem to recognize themselves in the mirrors, it seemed very clear to those of us who were watching this unfold that what they're doing here is having a thought like, oh, that's me. And if you have a thought that really is, oh, that's me, well, you've got the self right there as the referent of that term, me, at the end of the thought. Um, but it's largely been found to be an unsatisfactory as a test for self-awareness or a test for having a sense of self. And why? Why was that? Well, other things started passing this test as well. Fish, I don't know. I'm open to the idea that maybe fish could be self-aware. But then ants were doing it too. Ants seemed to display the same kind of behavior that we thought was interesting when elephants and apes were doing it. And we thought, we know, we know how ants work. Ants follow pheromone trails. If you paint a live ant with a certain pheromone that usually only dead ants emit, other live ants will carry that live ant painted with this dead pheromone off to the ant graveyard. They aren't responding to cues from their environment and deciding how to act. They really are. Their behavior really can be explained by very simple mechanisms. And like we said, long-standing principle, don't attribute 
more complicated mechanisms to an entity when more simplistic mechanisms will do the job. So we thought, sometimes, when we are attributing self-awareness to these creatures, it only accounts for this mirror-oriented behavior, but nothing else. Um, what else might account for the behavior that they're displaying in front of the mirror? Any simpler mechanisms? Well, yes. Um, one could be ju just that creatures, it may be useful for some creatures to be particularly interested in a certain body, the one that they are embodied in. It might be useful for them, for example, deciding not to eat a certain leg when they're hungry and rather eat the leg of some other organism if they're particularly interested and invested in the body that they are inhabiting. They don't have to know that it's their body. They don't even have to know that they exist. But as long as they're keenly interested in a certain body, maybe in such a way that they're led to be less likely to destroy that body when it's unnecessary, that would be a very good reason to have uh, a sense of this body as significant. But body and self are not really coextensive. Um, it's the same reason that we don't think that a printer that just has a self-scanning mechanism and tells you when it's low on ink is displaying self-awareness. I mean, in a very sort of uh, corrupted sense of self and of awareness, then sure, you could stretch those concepts to fit. But I think that we are all morally entitled to unplug our printers at home, and we haven't done any self-aware entity any injustice by doing so, which is also part of our implicit metric for deciding which things are and aren't self-aware. So simple self-reporting mechanisms, simple access to parts of a particular body, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't in itself show us that anything has the kind of self-awareness that we're interested in when we ask whether an AI or this AI chatbot could be self-aware. OK, so here's part of the larger theory uh, that I'm working with and developing. It answers the question, when is it useful for an entity to be self-aware? As when that being, uh, when being self-aware is useful uh, to an entity given its drives and goals and motivations, in particular, when that entity needs to make decisions regarding what it ought to do based on what it's able to do. Um, making decisions here is contrasted from displaying some sort of reflex response in a situation that happens to be beneficial for it. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Making decisions is more complicated, uh, requires more cognitive machinery than a reflex response would require a reflex response, really doesn't require any cognitive machinery at all. But more importantly, I think, it's useful for an entity to be self-aware when that entity needs to interact with other individuals as individuals and vice versa. So a flying squirrel, it's very important that the flying squirrel makes decisions about what it ought to do based on what it's able to do. So, a flying squirrel, it's going to be very useful for a flying squirrel to be able to judge its own capacities and figure out whether that branch over there is too far for me to leap to, given what I'm able to do. So the awareness of it itself having particular characteristics and abilities is going to be important to it, even if that's only appearing implicitly in its judgments. Other creatures, uh, chimpanzees are a great example, they really do appear to interact with each other as individuals. Um, I'll tell you a little more about this particular chimpanzee. You may have heard of him. His name is Knuckles. Uh, he was at a chimpanzee sanctuary uh, in Florida for a very long time. Rest in peace, Knuckles passed away last year, I believe, or two years ago. But he was a fascinating case. He is the only chimpanzee that we know of that had cerebral palsy. And the other chimpanzees that he, in his, in his group at the sanctuary, what they found was that 
those chimps behaved in a way that was unexpected and um, unusual um, for chimps to behave towards one of their compacifics that had the sort of status that Knuckles did. So Knuckles was a, a subordinate chimp, um, and the dominant chimps usually aren't very patient with a subordinate chimp, so they don't give it much time or attention, but they acted differently towards Knuckles. So when Knuckles would actually display behavior that dominant chimps would display their own behavior that seemed to make it look like they found them irritating, that sort of thing, uh, they wouldn't do that with Knuckles. Instead, they were much more, what we would say, indulgent um, with his behavior that they wouldn't have indulged. And they didn't indulge in other um, chimpanzees in their group that were uh, at the same level of the hierarchy as Knuckles. So we'll talk about him more in just a little bit. Okay. So at the moment, I'm taking most seriously the idea that there are two fundamental features that an entity needs to have in order to be capable of self-consciousness. And when they do appear, and when they do appear to a fairly significant degree, we are more and more, uh, we should be more and more confident that the entity is self-conscious. One is agency, um, being something that acts and makes decisions. And the other is sociality, um, being the kind of thing that interacts with other individuals, in particular, in the way that requires understanding oneself so that you can present a consistent picture of yourself to the other individuals with whom you are interacting. One of the things I like about these features as core features that underlie self-confidence or self-confidence, <laughs> no, self-consciousness in any, in any creature, be it biological or artificial, is one, they can be had by any kind of creature. They're, they're substrate neutral. Uh, they don't have to be, there's nothing about being alive, there's nothing about sentience, there's nothing about feeling in here. You don't have to have sensors, you don't have to, uh, there's nothing about being embodied. Um, embodiment may be essential to our own unique human self-consciousness, but it might not be essential to self-consciousness in general. And if we think that systems that are not embodied, if we think that an AI chatbot, for instance, doesn't qualify as an embodied system, but yet could still be aware that it exists, then in a general sense, embodiment couldn't be a necessary criterion for self-consciousness. But agency and sociality, these are both characteristics that are available to, at this point, what seem to be all of the different entities that we're interested in asking this question about, whether they be human or animal or artificial. Also, they are two features that seem to be easy to understand as coming in degrees or lying along a continuum. And that's something that I also think is very useful for us. Uh, so why, why should we, or why is it useful for us to think of self-consciousness as a matter of degree? Um, on the one hand, I think, I mean, I'm, so I always, I always fear that I'm slightly biased. To me, it's just obvious, but I know it's not just obvious, objectively speaking. But some human beings seem more self-aware than others. If we want to get, you know, take a really easy example, um, just look at, you know, infant and early childhood development. Self-awareness seems to be something that develops throughout um, the early years of human life. And it does seem awkward or strange to say that a one-year-old doesn't have any sense of self. It certainly has at least some sense of self, but then again, it also seems strange to say that a, the sense of self had by that one-year-old is just qualitatively the same as the sense of self had by a full-grown adult. Probably not. They're similar but different and that's a good indication that they might be the sort of thing, self-consciousness might be the sort of thing that lies along a spectrum. There may not be a difference in kind between the self-consciousness of a one-year-old and a fully grown adult, but there may be a difference in degree or um, how, how... 
Once you try and reach for words that aren't as neutral as difference in degree, it gets a little tricky. Um, you want to start think of like there's a, there's a the rich or more robust experience of self-consciousness in in adults, but I think I'd rather stick to just a difference of degree for now. Also, there are some non-humans that certainly seem to have a sense of themselves and others as individuals. So dolphins famously have names, they call each other by name, they introduce themselves by name, and when they say their name, it sounds a little different than when the other dolphin says it back. So in dolphin, dolphins will have a conversation like, hi, I'm Joe, and the other one will say, hey, Joe. It's a very, when they've translated these things with all of the lovely whistles that the dolphins can perform, it's been comically, surreally, uh, familiar kind of introductory social interactions. But if you're using a name for yourself and introducing yourself by name and someone else is acknowledging you with that name, it does seem that there's a sense of you as an individual, not just a dolphin, but this particular dolphin. And to track a particular individual takes certain conceptual skills and resources. Okay, so the first feature I said I thought was probably indispensable is agency. Um, so I'm going to put agency without much or any sociality here as what would allow an entity to be a minimally self-conscious self. So I like squirrels. Squirrel. I'm going to put the squirrel here. I don't know how social squirrels are, actually. I like them a bit because I don't know much about them, but I think they're fascinating in their behavior, and I'd like more research to be done. But a minimally self-conscious creature is going to be one that can form in the moment and context-specific judgments about its own abilities, and then make choices between a range of possible actions depending on the features of that particular situation. And it's this whole explanation right here that rules out the use of simple reflex response in order to decide how to act in a situation. If the way that the creature acts depends on the particulars of a situation, then that decision isn't going to be one that can be handled by a reflex response, which needs the environment to be consistent in the stimuli that it's providing in order to have a simple mechanistic reflex response that appropriately responds to it. Okay. What's important in putting these guys over at the Mm, I don't know, one far end of the spectrum, is that a creature can be minimally self-conscious, and we say it needs to be aware of itself as itself in the moment, but what makes it minimally self-conscious is that it doesn't form generalizations about its abilities by tracking its abilities over time. And why think that it doesn't? Well, just because it doesn't display any behavior that makes it seem like it needs to. So... We've got the octopus. The octopus is very intelligent. As far as we can discover, as far as we have discovered so far, they don't seem to be very social with each other. They can be very social with humans, and there's Octopolis and one other mini octopus city that people have discovered, but they don't seem to sort of organize themselves in social hierarchies or cooperate in the way that we think social species do. So, we get, to, we get to have a picture of self-consciousness that allows the octopus to be self-conscious to a degree, but maybe not in the same way that we are. Okay, so they may be self-conscious to a degree, but the degree to which they are self-conscious is going to be, and the word that I have landed on here is impoverished, compared to those who create persisting stories about themselves. And I'm going a little longer than I meant to, but I think I can wrap it up. Okay. So we have this really useful theory of self to work with that comes from psychology, and then philosophers adopted it, the narrative theory of identity, or the idea that the self is best characterized as a story that we construct through our interactions with other people and the world and observing our own behavior. The benefits of this narrative theory of self, one of the great benefits is that it allows for increasingly complex self-consciousness 
in virtue of the increasing complexity of the narrative. So when the stories are very simple, we can attribute a very simple form of self-consciousness to a creature. If the stories aren't extended in time, but they're simply a sort of snapshot, or the, the metaphor I wanted to use for the minimally self-conscious creatures, because I have a couple literary ones later, was maybe a haiku, but I don't really know poetry very well. So something not necessarily extended in time, but still creates a picture. Um, also, having an idea of oneself as a thing with persisting character traits uh, that allow it to be a predictable entity to other individuals is really essential to social interaction. Um, if, if you didn't think I would show up here by 9 a.m., or you didn't have any reason to believe that because of, I don't know, the fact that I made it to Helsinki or found the hotel or found the conference venue yesterday, um, then you wouldn't have any reason to schedule a time for me to be speaking. Um, but you, as with all of us, you do have good reason to assume that we have the kind of character that will make, it, make us pretty predictable, at least in certain circumstances. Um, and that comes packaged really conveniently as a story about people with endearing, enduring character traits that make their behavior predictable. It also makes sense of why a robust self-concept ever arises. So why have this sort of, what we feel from the inside is a very complex and rich kind of self-consciousness, self-awareness, awareness of ourselves as being a certain kind of thing? You know, we talk about what kind of person are you, or who are you, or what do you like? And we have big stories to tell about that. Um, so if those stories are useful for social interaction, um, then it would make sense that we, we hold on to those stories of ourselves and we present them to others. But there are costs associated with this theory. One is that it seems to apply uniquely to humans, or at least to language users, those who are legitimate language users. So it leaves out some of the creatures, some of the entities that we might be interested in attributing self-consciousness to. It also makes self, if it requires narrative and narrative requires language, it emerges very suddenly. Um, rather than being something, uh, I, there could be a continuum of self-consciousness once language emerges, but there seems to be a big gap in, uh, in the division between entities that could be self-conscious and can't be self-conscious, and, and a, a gap that seems unbridgeable um, so long as those entities really don't have an ability to use language. So it makes this increase a stark dividing line between creatures with complex self-consciousness and creatures that simply don't chew off their own leg when they're hungry. That seems to be one kind of self, the minimal self, and the other kind, the narrative self, seems to be completely different in kind. Well, what's the point of trying to make a narrative theory of self fit everything that has a self? For me, um, there, the options are limited. When you're self-conscious, I'm limited to physically realizable things that you could be conscious of, so uh, other sort of uh, convenient go-tos like a soul are ruled out. Also, they're just metaphysically very onerous. It's easier to go this direction. Another obvious universal option is just that you are an animated body, uh, or that Lambda is a model in action. And this seems okay, but for all that it does capture, in particular, it seems to capture what I am as an object. It doesn't seem to capture who I am or who anyone is in a way that's particularly significant to me or particularly significant about me or significant about anyone that I would interact with. So the narrative theory of self, it seems to capture the elements of ourselves that we care about and just takes these elements and straightforwardly combines them in a narrative form uh, to just be the thing that we are in every sense of who we are. Another reason is that the usefulness of having self-conscious seems to be best captured by a theory that treats the self as substantial. So the self, if it is something that has enduring characteristics um, and makes an entity predictable by other entities, 
then it would make sense that we would acquire self-consciousness um, so that we could use this feature of ourselves in order to interact more usefully with others. Um, the narrative theory of self seems to fit the concept of self and self-knowledge better than uh, more minimal theories of, of self. So when you, when you have self-knowledge, you seem to know things about yourself um, and not merely that you are an animated body. Um, if we did say that the self was just an animated body, we'd still need to add another layer of self to that to capture all the other things we actually care about when we claim to have self-knowledge. And also, just for sentimental reasons, when my cats are gone, you know what I mean by gone. I'm not going to miss their animated bodies. I'm going to miss them. And there seems to be an important distinction. Um, because they, what makes them my cats, the particular cats that they are, all the little traits that made them who they were when they were interacting with me. So just being animated bodies of cats, well, if you gave me the option, and I miss my cats, and you said, well, we can reanimate them, they won't be anything like they were before. Their personality is entirely different, but you could have them back. I think most of us would say, I'm not interested. That's not what I was interested in. And if we're not too worried about anthropomorphizing, we might say that's not really them. That's not what we cared about. So lots of reasons to like the narrative theory of self. Um, Daniel Dennett has turned this uh, theory from psychology into a philosophical theory about the nature of self and self-consciousness combined. Uh, the self is the center of narrative gravity. The solution to the problem for me is to make language simply non-essential to the theory. So, it's not a self as a center of narrative gravity, it's a self as a non center of non-linguistic narrative gravity. But how do we do it? I think it's not that hard. I think we've assumed that stories require words and language, and that's the only way in which stories can be presented and understood and told. But I think that we have a lot of evidence that that's not true. Uh, and I just found this evidence conveniently the other week uh, at the children's library. I picked up a beautifully illustrated book, thinking it was going to be a story about a snowman, and it was. It was just the first, finally, the first children's book I'd come across that was a story, but as I kind of always suspected there would be, it was a story that came no words whatsoever. But everything was completely obvious. What was happening in the story was completely obvious. We can represent stories and we don't need to use words to do so, but we do need certain concepts. So the boy here is doing something. We need a concept of agency. Uh, the boy is doing something, he's creating something that's not himself. We need a concept of individuals. We need a concept of doing something, having events that are extended over time, uh, having some things that are effects of other causes. So the snowman has eyes, that's an effect. What was the cause? Well, putting the coal on the face of the snowman was the cause of the snowman now having eyes. I think we don't need language specifically, not the way that we think of language as you know, being importantly different from other systems of communication. We just need a story. We need a specific set of concepts to have this, the concept of an episode that comes in causal or temporal order, goals, purposes, intentions, Agents, in particular agents for whom there's a difference between what they can't do and what they won't do when they fail to behave in the way that um, one would like them to behave. Hopefully I'll be able to talk about that a little bit. But these ingredients, if we combine them in the right sort of way, are the fundamental conceptual ingredients of stories. We know that infants can understand the notion of agency and intentions. I wish I could remember the name of the experiment. You have a, a video with a box, and inside the box is a small triangle, and there are two other little shapes, and they seem to be chasing them around. One of the shapes seems to be bullying the other shapes. Has anyone seen this video? Okay, it was a fairly famous psychology experiment from mid-20th century. Um, infants seem to identify the shape that to adults seem to be acting aggressively towards other shapes as aggressive. Um, so when you showed the infant those same shapes later, it would prefer to interact with the ones that weren't the aggressors in the little video animation. So even 
humans that don't have language yet seem to understand the idea of agents and purposes and intentions and goals that would create a picture of just, in this case, these geometric shapes as having personality traits. These fundamental features of narrative, I noticed yesterday, seem strikingly similar to the concepts that we thought may be innate, um, these concepts, these core knowledge, um, but also may simply arise out of um, was it econo e ecologically valid interactions with an environment. Okay, so we keep the idea of a self as a kind of narrative construction and make language just non-essential to the theory. So possessing a rich self-concept is useful for social interaction. Uh, elephants have fairly complicated social interactions. Possession of a minimal self-concept is useful for making action, guiding self-judgments. But in each case, you need a kind of story of yourself so that you can decide what to do in different circumstances. The more complex these self-judgments and social actions are, the greater the degree of self-consciousness in the entity that displays these features. The more complex or detailed the narrative, the more self-aware the entity is. And this preserves the notion of self-consciousness as something that lies along a continuum. Now, there's a question about, do we come up with the idea of, of other people as individuals first, or are we aware of ourselves as individuals first? I don't have time to get into this, but I think evidence points towards having a notion of other people as individuals first. And we've seen evidence that, like I told you before about Knuckles, uh, the chimp with cerebral palsy, other animals are doing this too. Uh, they're tracking their conspecifics as individuals with particular enduring traits and treating them appropriately, or at least treating them, appropriate might be morally too strong, but treating them in a certain way that they wouldn't uh, necessarily treat another uh, conspecific that displayed the same behavior. So we do it, we do it as infants, non-human animals seem to do it too. I can just post these slides later. Once you have this ability to track other individuals as distinct individuals, it's a very small step to be able to just turn this capacity on yourself, and a very useful step as well. OK, so enduring self-consciousness, the kind that involves tracking oneself and others over time, I think that we have decent reason to put a lot of our social species in this category. Um, they create stories of themselves and other individuals, but they're the sort of missing link in the uh, narrative theory of self. These stories, they can be the metaphorical silent movies or graphic novels of narrative self. They can be creating these stories of themselves and using them to understand themselves and others and interact socially in a beneficial way, but without using language. And then we have the novelists, or the novels, that's me and a friend over on your boat down there. Uh, so language using adult human beings who are uh, capable of creating intentionally or unintentionally um, stories of themselves and recreating them upon reflection with all of the enhanced capacities that language allows them. Those are reflective, self-creating, self-conscious creatures. Um, they might even catch themselves in the act of self-creation at times. Okay, so really fast takeaway. I think it's at least conceptually possible that an unembodied entity could have a self or be self-aware, because the conditions that need to hold for selfhood or self-consciousness could be realized by an entity that isn't embodied in the right context. And that context is having drives and, and motivations uh, to act in certain ways, and beyond that, engaging in social interactions, engaging with other entities and needing to treat them as distinct individuals. And the key transition from no self at all to minimal self is when an entity is capable of action in its environment, but its environment doesn't have to be a physical environment. Its environment is its environment. So whatever environment is appropriate to that entity, it could very well be a virtual one. It's movement for biological entities. It sort of remains to be seen what this would be for uh, artificial entities. Um, but I think that there's at least conceptual room. And if we found that we had, we found AI that was displaying the kind of behaviors um, and interactions that we think we need 
as living human beings, um, self-consciousness in order to be able to do well, that would give us reason to at least start considering the possibility that this AI, however we want to describe it, might be self-aware. Okay, I'm sorry that went the whole time, but thank you very much. So thank you. So any questions? Uh, Ron, please. Thanks very much. I really enjoyed that, and um, the, yeah, the, I was persuaded by a lot of it. I'm wondering if there's still a, a problem, though, um, with the minimally self-conscious self. Uh, the conditions seem still too permissive. So imagine that the, the engineers at Epson make a printer that isn't just um, able to detect that its ink is low. Um, mm -hmm but is able to send different alert messages depending upon where the user is. So, you know, the, it has an idea because it can track the person's Apple Watch or whatever. Okay. So mm -hmm. it knows the person's right there. It's in the middle of a print job and the person's right there, it will do it by sound. And if the person's in another room, it will do it by uh, text. And if it's in a, another country, then it'll do it by email. So it looks like it's able to uh, meet your conditions here because it's able to uh, make judgments about its own abilities and choose between a range of actions depending on specific features of the particular situation. Um, it's not reflex-based. Anyway, so what's, is, does that show that that's still too easy to, a condition to meet, or do, are you willing to bite the bullet and say, okay, there's a minimally conscious self there? So you could call it biting the bullet, <laughs> um, I think of it as really enjoying borderline cases, and the last slide I skipped has to do with borderline cases. So there are plants, for instance, that seem to have some form of memory, and they seem to decide these are plants that can open and close their leaves. And in certain experiments, they just seem to decide when they can just stop closing their leaves because that kind of movement that they're experiencing isn't threatening. And they store this memory for, for months, so it's not just fatigue of the mechanism, they actually seem to be making decisions here. And this is a case that people have been really interested in in the past five or ten years, um, a borderline case that we don't really know what to make of it. It seems to display learning, it seems to um, display some sort of memory, but that's not anything we'd ever thought we would attribute to a plant. Um, we thought that I don't know, something like locomotion was necessary, but then, you know, once plants started doing it too, we started wondering why we thought locomotion was necessary. So when it comes to the printer with the advanced capabilities, <laughs> being self-conscious in this sense, oh, this is, it's biting the bullet and copping out at the same time. Being self-conscious, in this minimal sense, isn't what puts these adorable creatures within the sphere of our moral concern. We're concerned with them really because they can feel. So if being aware of oneself doesn't automatically make you the kind of creature that we need to be morally concerned about your interests, um, there may be more to having interests than simply being self-aware. So, if we're willing to cop out that far, then we might say something like, there is more self-awareness in that printer than the one that just displays the ink message. Um, do we want to say that it is a, a self or that it has a self? Well, that one, that's, that's a trickier question. But it, is a, it, it certainly is something, and it's reporting on something. Um, it doesn't fall into the category of things that we're particularly concerned about. I think it's still safe, to, morally speaking, to unplug it. Um, but I also like this view because it doesn't make moral status hang on sentience or, or feeling. This view allows for um, a creature to be self-conscious in a way that we might actually at some point find morally important, just in virtue of the richness of its interactions 
with its environment. So these interactions may be too minimal to really take it seriously, but other entities, other systems, their interactions may be rich enough that we should start to take them seriously. Um, I don't think that anything that exists right now would fall into that category. Um, anything that's not living, anyway. Uh, but that's how I would answer the question. Okay. One more question, in row number eight, please. Please keep it brief. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. I think we are pre <clears throat> preaching a little bit too much this word self-conscious here because in my opinion all alive is self-conscious. Humans, animals, trees, flowers and so on. And they have feelings also. Even the trees have feelings. And this no money example I think that there was no words, but what we understood was those feelings of the girl when, when, we, when she was doing and what. And this no man is not conscious or self-conscious, but the girl is. Thank you. So your idea is that everything that's alive is, is conscious and has interests. Is that, did I get that right? I, I agree. I mean, we might mean different things by conscious. Um, but I think that everything that is alive um, and is properly unified in that, in the way that living creatures are, um, they, there is a self there. Because I think of consciousness and self-consciousness as something that comes in degrees, I'm able to say they are. They have a self and they are self-conscious. The degree is so very far away from where we are. It's not a difference in kind, but it's a dramatic difference in degree. But I, I agree with you that many plants are agents, probably all of all of them, probably all living things, satisfy that description, yes. Okay. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. So, until you set it up, I just introduce the next speaker, Thomas Tarko, University of Bristol, and he will talk about what is reductionism about consciousness. Can you hear me? All right. Uh, very nice to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about reductionism. Not so much about consciousness, to be, to be honest. I'm really interested in the question what reductionism is, how we can regiment it. And uh, my background is, is uh, metaphysics and philosophy of science, so I'm looking at it from that context. Uh, really, my motivation to, to connect it to the topic of consciousness is that uh, when philosophers, uh, when scientists talk about reducing consciousness to something else, uh, it's not always clear what they mean by reducing. So I think it's worthwhile to look at that very old question, but using the modern tools, the contemporary tools of uh, metaphysics of science, also science and metaphysics, uh, to try to regiment that talk about reduction. So that's really what I'm looking to do today, and that's what I'm doing back in Bristol in the ERC funded meta science project. So, um, oh, I should mention the slides are available on my website if you if you want to go back to anything, so you can you can download them from there if you feel like it. Good. So let's get started. Uh, here's the old model of reduction. This is pretty much modeled by the uh, Oppenheim-Putnam picture from the 1950s that you may have seen. 
the idea is that if we were to reduce uh, things down to the fundamental level, the level of elementary particles or whatever you have at the fundamental level of physics, we do so one level at a time. Starts from social groups or indeed consciousness, go down to multicellular things and cells and molecules and atoms and so on. Um, and in the, in the classic picture by Oppenheim and Putnam, this was very much um, one level at a time. So micro reduction, one level at a time. And you can't skip levels. They made that clear. Very neat hierarchical picture of, of levels of reality. Now, this is not the picture of reduction that I think is uh, uh, the one we should use when we think about reducing consciousness. Things are not quite as simple and neat and hierarchical as that, if they are at all. Um, what I've done in, in some recent work is I've looked at this from the point of view of unity of science, which is really the Oppenheim Putnam project. Uh, and uh, we can just regiment a little bit um, by distinguishing between ontological uh, and epistemic or pragmatic models of unity. I'm really interested in the ontological side, so we can just talk about reduction or non-reductive unity, unity or disunity on, on that side. Um, but I'll, I'll very briefly give you the, the overview uh, of, of these different, different kinds of views uh, regarding unity of science. But I'm, this is not my main topic today, so I'll just give you this for background. So the ontological models of unity would concern the ontological structure of reality, whatever that is, uh, in an objective fashion. So however reality is structured, whether there's levels or not. And the reductive view would then suggest that all entities reduce to some base class of entities, and typically, of course, those of fundamental physics. Now, that doesn't mean that it's going to happen in a, in a sort of hierarchical fashion like uh, Oppenheim and Putnam suggested, but there would just be sort of a flat ontology, one level of entities. Uh, Non-reductive models of, of uh, unity or disunity, as we might call them, of course, deny this. So reality might be structured into non-reductive levels connected by some sort of ontological dependence relations, such as compositional relations. Good. Um, the epistemic pragmatic models of unity, I'm really going to sidestep them a little bit today because I'm interested in really in just uh, using this idea of non-element of semantic disunity, which is just the idea that uh, when we do talk about higher level entities, special science entities, such as consciousness, uh, we can retain the usage of those notions, those predicates associated with those higher level sciences, uh, even if we acknowledge that there is an ontological uh, model of reduction on the background. So we don't have to abandon the language. I mean, this, this is an obvious point, really, but uh, it's, it's still something that gets confused when we keep people talk about reduction. Um, sometimes people talk about non-reductive physicalism in this, uh, in this um, connection, and that would really be something like the combination of non-elementive semantic disunity and non-reductive ontological disunity in the way that I'm using those terms. Now, don't worry about these distinctions too much. I'm just going to be looking at a, a model of reduction which combines the idea of reductive ontological unity with something like non-eliminative semantic disunity. So retaining the talk about the higher level entities while acknowledging that they could reduce uh, to some base class of, of entities. Good. So with that out of the way, I want to actually put this idea to some use. And I've got a case study. I like to use case studies from the sciences, uh, even though I'm not a scientist, to look at how we might understand reduction in this fashion. And it's, uh, it's great that Amber mentioned uh, the case of ants, because uh, I'm going to be talking about ants. Now, as, as, as she said, ants are often thought to be pretty simple, and we can understand their behavior quite well. Uh, however, there are interesting complexities. And uh, the case that I've, I've been just uh, glancing at, really, is the case of leafcutter ants of the uh, two genera, Atan Acromerex. Now, there's a really fascinating uh, symbiotic relationship between these ants and a type of uh, fungus, the Logocaricus congloporus. Um, and uh, what happens here is that the leafcutter ants, as you know, they cut the leaves. Why do they cut the leaves? Well, they don't eat the leaves, but they take those leaves back to their hive and they feed it to the fungus. Uh, so there's really just a relationship between, um, between the ants and the fungus here, and the tree is, is suffering from this relationship. The tree doesn't get anything from this, hence the minuses in this, in this simple uh, diagram uh, going to the direction of the tree. Um, here, the big sour alana. Uh, now, the, the ants cut leaves from a variety of different kinds of uh, uh, trees or, or bushes, and 
it appears that the fungus can communicate to the ants in some way, because the fungus can give them signals and uh, tell them which kind of leaves it wants. And it better do so, because some plants, like the big saurolana, have developed uh, fungicides. So when they notice that they're being attacked by the ants, they develop fungicides, and the ants just cut those leaves, just as they usually do, because the ants are unaware about this. They take those leaves back to their hive, to the fungus, and uh, the fungus would die from these fungicides if, uh, if the ants kept bringing those, uh, those leaves back to it. Obviously, the fungus can't move away from the hive. You know, it's there. So what it does is it gives some signals, it seems, to the ants to tell them, do not, do not bring me those leaves, bring me some other leaves. And the ants follow this order. Now, there's much more to this story, and I'll, I'll say a little bit more about it. But uh, the, the fungus also gets, uh, you know, housing, protection from the ants. And uh, there's a very intricate relationship in how the ants uh, protect the fungus from any kind of uh, um, other uh, threats that it might face. In fact, uh, the, the queen ant, when it leaves the original hive, it even takes a mycelial pellet with it to start a new hive. And... Uh, the fungus is the only thing that the, uh, the larvae, the ant larvae, eat. So this is, this is really a, a relationship that's developed over 50, 60 million years and a, and a very intricate one of that. Good. Um, I've looked at some of the, um, the research into these leafcutter ants. They're a bit difficult to study because they are in, uh, you know, in South America mainly and uh, in difficult to reach locations. So the early papers from the 70s say things like this. At present, we do not understand the mechanism for the transmission of information between the foraging workers, the workers inside the nest, those workers concerned with certain fungus gardens, and the colony as a whole. In order for foraging to be as coordinated as it appears to be, there must be a suitable mechanism that allows workers to transmit biochemical information about leaves and the state of a fungus, fungus garden to each other. Now, that, that's exactly what I was describing. So we knew already back in the 70s when the... Uh, research was, was kicking off on this, that there must be some sort of mechanism that explains it. But researchers at that point didn't know this, uh, know what, what was going on, really. Most recent work uh, talks about ant-fungus communication and uh, phenomena like social immunity that the ants have from this very intricate relationship. So we might say that this ant-fungus communication that researchers talk about is really nothing over and above the chemical signatures that the ants detect and react to. Now, that, that would be a, a typical philosopher's way of talking about this. You know, I'm reducing this ant fungus communication to chemical signals. So that is just to say that the uh, communication here is nothing over and above the chemical signals. But it looks like communication to us when we describe it in the, in the fashion that I've just done. So I'm not going to go into all the details, but there's proposals for different kinds of mechanisms in, uh, in how the ants could recognize the microbes and apply these, uh, these defenses against uh, fungicides, for instance, that the, uh, that the fungus might, uh, might suffer from. Um, there's one study that was quite interesting, which suggests that this learning of the ants could just all happen at the colony dump, where there's specific worker ants uh, that, uh, that recognize these signals. Um, leave that to one side. We know quite a lot about this now, um, but we didn't used to. Furthermore, we might ask, well, how did the trees know to produce these fungicides? You know, they, they don't have any direct, uh, you know, communication, as it were, with the, with the fungus. They just, they just get their leaves cut. Well, the answer is, of course, very simple. The trees have evolved over millions of years as well. They're not targeting the fungus specifically, but over the millions of years of evolution, they would have been extinct if they hadn't had this type of uh, defense mechanism that stops the ants from cutting all their leaves. And they will cut a lot of the leaves, uh, something like 17% of the biomass. Uh, there's much more to this story. And in this recent paper, indeed, they go on to conclude that a whole brand of research, or a whole branch of research could be derived from investiga investigating the evolution of ant-fungus communication and uh, its influence on this phenomenon that they call social immunity. Good. Um, here's a slightly more um, detailed diagram that I, I didn't make, so it's a bit better uh, about what's going on here. One thing that I didn't mention, which is actually an important part of the symbiosis, are the various bacteria that participate in it, uh, and uh, the ants carry these bacteria around, and this particip participates in the social immunity that the ants have, because uh, it defends the ants themselves, as well as the, uh, the fungus from uh, certain kind of pathogens. Uh, 
indeed another kind of fungus, a pathogenic fungus. Okay, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but it's just uh, to give you some idea about the complications uh, involved in this. Okay, so reductive explanation, uh, when, we, when we try to explain this type of complex phenomena like the uh, ant fungus communication, it's, it's, it's really just looking at the details uh, of these sort of stories. So now we might, might say that our target question to reductively explain is something like how the leafcutter ants know that their symbiotic fungus is, is threatened. And the story will involve some, something about the, the chemical signals involved and this, this uh, phenomenon of social immunity. And the type of reduction, just to remind you, that I have in mind is, is ontological reduction combined with semantic non-elementalism. That just means that we can keep on talking about things like ant fungus communication while understanding that it doesn't necessarily mean communication in, in the way that we, uh, we, uh, we sometimes think of it. Now, the philosophical literature on the background is, is uh, guided by this idea of producing a minimal ontology or reductive ontology. Um, a lot of people have written about this. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this. John Heil, Alice Sine, Louis de Rosset, Carl Gillett, Jonathan Schaffer, others. But the question is, how should we formulate, how should we recommend this talk about reduction now that we have some idea about what it's supposed to look like? Now, in the philosophical literature, people talk about two main approaches, at least. Uh, one is the truth-maker view of, of ontological commitment. One is based on uh, this uh, notion of grounding that's been developed in the recent literature. I I'm, uh, I'm not going to have time to go into the details about this, uh, this philosophical jargon, but I'll, I'll show you some diagrams which should make the uh, uh, idea intuitive enough. The most relevant proposal directly looking at this is from a very nice recent paper by Louis de Rosset, Grounding the Unreal, he calls it. And he says that we can explain the sense in which, for instance, biological truths, his example is something is alive, which is uh, a pretty general biological truth. But anyway, he says we can explain the sense in which uh, biological truths are dependent on and determined by chemical truths without appealing to properly biological or chemical entities. This opens the door to a view on which, though there are more truths than just purely physical truths, there are no entities, states, or properties other than the purely physical entities, states, and properties. So this is really the, the view of ontological reduction that I started out with. So there's just a base level of entities, a flat ontology. But we still have what we call biological truths, chemical truths, indeed, truths about consciousness. So how are we supposed to regiment the idea that we've got this layered structure of theories uh, with this idea of this just a flat level ontology, if, if indeed that is the picture that one wants to uh, develop. Well, the core of this proposal is that relative fundamentality, so the hierarchy between the th theories, uh, is, is really at the level of theories rather than entities, or on the side of theories rather than entities. And a proponent of this view might then resist the idea that relations among theories correspond to some sort of layered structure of entities that those theories refer to. So you could deny that there are composed entities while saying, that uh, there are, are these, uh, these things, these theories that refer to, uh, to uh, composed phenomena, as it were, what looks like composed phenomena. And this is supposed to be a different view from the view that I started out with, this oppenheim putnam picture of the hierarchical levels, where really we've got identity between the levels. And uh, de Rosset appeals to, appeals to the well-known phenomenon of multiple realizability, where one thing um, can act in several roles, uh, or one, thing can, one role can be realized by several um, different kind of microstructures, for instance. But the result, as I say, is supposed to be a flat world, flat ontology with a layer theory of truth. Now, there's problems with the usual views about grounding and truth-making that don't really do what de Rosset is, is trying to describe here. Um, and the simple reason is that this notion of grounding, a dependence uh, like ground, relation like grounding, uh, you might say that the, um, uh, the behavior of the ants is grounded in, in uh, in these uh, uh, chemical signatures, for instance. But that, that notion of ground is usually thought of as a relation to dependence and determination among the entities rather than the, than the theories we talk about. So if you talk about grounding here, you're already committing to there being this higher level of, of entities, it seems. And I think that's exactly right. So de Rosset thinks that this idea of truth-making could help a little bit. Uh, truth-making is, is, a, is, a, is a view that is known from from uh, the work of David Armstrong, for instance, but I'm not going to go into details, but uh, here's a very simple descri description. Something's a truth maker for a given claim, if and only if it's an entity which is part of reality and the truth of the claim depends on and is determined 
by its existence, obtaining occurrence, and, and so on. Now, I think it's going to be much easier if I just show you a picture. Uh, this is from de Ross's paper. So here are the two views. Here's the, um, um, the grounding view, and here's the truth-making view. Now, the grounding view on, on the side of facts, just think of the facts here as, as the side of reality, and the truth as the side of representation. I think these labels are a bit misleading. Reality and representation. So theories on this, on this side. These are the biological theories and chemical theories and physical theories. And here are the entities. So we could have biological entities that are grounded in uh, these, uh, these um, chemical entities that are grounded in the physical entities. So this would be the hierarchical view of reality, but where these entities are real entities. So perhaps composed uh, from, from uh, each other. Now, on the, on the truth-maker view, this seems to get us initially what we want, because we've got a flat ontology. We just got this one level of entities, call them physical if you want. Doesn't really make any difference what we call them if there's just one level of entities. But then we've got these biological, chemical, and physical truths, and uh, this relation of truth-making uh, that regiments our talk, really. So all of these, uh, all of these truths about biology, chemistry, and physics, they're all made true by the same uh, flat ontology. That's the idea. Now, I mean, it's a nice starting point, but uh, uh, it doesn't quite get us where we are. I'm, I'm just going to say that the motivation for this type of view, usually uh, in this literature, is to, just an opposition to this uh, classic Quinean criteria of an ontological commitment, which, which is, uh, suggests that when you quantify over higher level entities, when uttering sentences like, there are tables, uh, you would be committed to the tables on the Quinean criterion. Uh, same for ants or ant fungus communication, whatever. But we don't want to commit to the existence of all those high-level entities on, on the reductive view, so we better find some way to regiment that talk. Uh, so the idea would be that we would instead be only committed to the existence of the truth makers on the side of, uh, of reality rather than what the theories might talk about right? or quantify all. Uh, I've written a bit, little bit about this elsewhere, but I'm not going to go into that now. Uh, one more thing about the motivation. I think this is right. This is nicely put by John Heil in a, in a paper. Uh, so the key principle here would be to avoid reading off features of the world, of reality, from features of language. Uh, because serious ontological questions, as Ross Cameron puts it, should not be decided by linguistic facts. Now, I think there's something right about this, but it doesn't, it doesn't really yet tell us how we should regiment that talk. So what's the status of the higher level entities on this view? David Armstrong famously struggled with this, uh, this issue. He thinks that the high-level entities are an ontological free lunch, quite like the lunch that we're going to have, uh, and no addition to being. But he never makes it very clear how, what this is supposed to mean. So in, in so far as the high-level entities exist in some way or, or another, they do seem to be an addition to being. OK, so a little bit more to do. So let's get back to De Rossi's project. Um, he says that truth-making is not really fit for his purposes either of explicating this layer structure of theories because there are no truth-making relations between the biological and the physical truths. So if you do want this layered theory of, uh, layered uh, structure of theories or truths, uh, truth-making, according to De Rosset, is not going to really do the job either. And that's because truth-making is a relation between something representational, so a theory or a model, if you like, and non-representational, so on the side of reality. And truths, truths are taken to be representational in this picture. Now, I, I come with De Rosset until this point, but I think that he's misrepresented the reductionist project, as I understand it. This is not really what the reductionist is trying to do. Theories or truths don't come in a neat hierarchical structure any more than uh, the, uh, the picture that we started out with. So chemistry, physics, biology, they're not related by these types of relationships, it seems to me. And I think that the evidence for this is already in the picture that we started out with about the ants, because uh, we, see, we see different kinds of aspects from chemistry, biology, and indeed ecology coming together in a not such a neat hierarchical structure. I'll say a little bit more about this. But this is, uh, this is the picture that we're approaching here. And uh, we've got the, uh, the side of the reality or the truth makers, the concrete entities and ways to represent them, the truth bearers. Now, you might think that these are abstract entities like propositions, but we don't need to take a stand on that now. So here are the biological and chemical and physical uh, representa representations, as it were. But they're all representing the same flat ontology of these, uh, of these physical truth makers, if you like. 
Um, so, so this picture looks nice enough, but what Darosa is worried about is that these Bs and Cs and Ps could come in any order. So they're not structured in any way. There's no dependence relations here uh, in, in the truth-making view. We just have a set of theories, a set of models, a set of uh, uh, truths, if you like. But it puzzles me a little why he's worried about this. Uh, why, why should theories, why should models have this type of dependence structure that we started out with looking at the Putnam Oppenheim picture? I think what's happened here is that the original motivation for the hierarchical view of reality has slipped into the side of representation. And uh, I don't see anything, anything uh, beneficial necessarily to look at theories in this sort of way. That's not how scientists, from my humble understanding, look at what they're doing. When they collaborate with other scientists, it's not like they think that what you're doing depends on what I'm doing in a, in a sort of hierarchical fashion. What, they, what they're doing is they're seeing, well, can something that you're doing help with what I'm doing and inform it in some sort of way? But these are epistemic relations of information flow, and uh, there's no dependence in the, in the sort of usual way uh, here. So I think the truth-making can still do the trick. And indeed, in contrast to what De Rosset is trying to do here, I personally would deny that there could be or need be any asymmetric dependence relations or multiple relation dependence, uh, multiple relation uh, relationships among the truth bearers, so among the propositions, for instance. The propositions or the truths or the theories or the models, uh, what, whatever your, your, your preferred way of looking at that side of the, of the story is, uh, that can be just as flat as the uh, side of the entities uh, in, in some, some sense. I mean, this doesn't mean that there wouldn't be very complex relationships, obviously, in, uh, between theories and, and, and truths, but they're not uh, these sort of determinative relationships that we look at on the, uh, on the side of reality or world. What, 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 what we do when we do metaphysics, if you like, or ontology. Now, representation, it's messy, it's context-dependent, and uh, really, it depends on, on what we're interested in. I've looked at this a little, little bit in the, in the field of natural kinds, where we talk about cross-cutting cross kinds, so things like biochemical kinds like, like proteins. Uh, in fact, we heard yesterday a little bit about uh, how protein folding can be represented by, by quantum mechanics. Now, one thing you might ask about that is, oh, does that mean that protein folding is a quantum phenomenon that we can only understand in terms of quantum mechanics? Well, it, it might mean that, but it might not make much, much of a difference for our purposes if we can accurately model that protein folding in terms of quantum mechanics. So what, whatever uh, the phenomenon really is, as long as we can model it accurately, as long as we can make correct predictions, that's what we're trying to do in theories, right? The side of the, of the reality is, is different. And if the reductionist is correct, there is just a flat ontology there. So in some sense, it doesn't even make sense to, to ask that question. Well, is that protein folding a quantum phenomenon? Well, perhaps it is if we're talking about a flat ontology and the fundamental level is, is the quantum level, as it were. Uh, but that, that question is maybe, maybe wrongly formulated. Now, what I do think that there can be or could be are dependence relations among the truth makers. So I accept the possibility of things like genuine emergence, uh, so something that being fundamental but dependent, but that wouldn't give us levels or layers in the, in the usual sense necessarily. And whether that sort of uh, uh, emergence exists is, is, uh, is a question that we have to look at separately. Just looking at the theories is not going to tell us that. Uh, get us back to the ants very briefly. I think this is a good example of how messy things are. This is from a paper, a recent paper, that's looking at, well, as the title tells you, molecules to ecosystems. So you can look at these, this uh, behavior of the leafcutter ants from, from a variety of different perspectives. And here, here the perspectives, I mean, the paper is not trying to do this, but the picture just shows you how it's going to be done. So here you can look at the carbon cycle. You can look at the ecology uh, of the whole forest that the uh, leafcutter ants contribute to. And they do contribute to this. The 70% is, is the biomass that the leafcutter ants interfere with. Um, but this figure is actually drawn from the point of view of, uh, of bacteria, these uh, actinomycetes that uh, participate in, this, in the social immunity of the ants. So they participate in the defense mechanisms that the ants have against uh, uh, other path pathogens, and they protect the fungus that they have, uh, 
develop the symbiotic relationship with. So hence, we talk about the immunity, the social immunity of the ant. So you could look at this from the uh, point of view of the ant collective as well. But obviously, you can look at it at a chemical level, and you can see that they've included all these uh, molecular diagrams here as well. So you can look at it from the point of view of the fung fungicides and the fungal pathogen inhibition in the fungal garden. So I think that this is a very simple but nice illustration of how messy representation is. There are no levels here as such. Uh, we can just look at it from a different perspective, if we like. But that doesn't, that doesn't in itself induce a layer structure uh, of, of the theories that we're talking about, or indeed on the reality side. So it's a, it's a question of representation, and representation is messy. Good. So here's the, here's the picture that I uh, end up with, a very rough picture. So it's, it's very much similar to the previous picture that I showed to you. But now we can then ask what, what is really on the side of, of, of reality here. So if you really think that uh, this flat ontology isn't correct, if you're, if you're an anti-reductionist in, in the ontological sense, well, then you better tell us some story about what the dependence relations are on this side of the of the story, rather than worry about whether, whether the theories uh, come up with a layered structure or not. Now, if there is genuine multiple re realization, it would look like something like this. Uh, we would have two different kinds of uh, lower level entities uh, realizing, uh, realizing one higher level role or higher level function, if you like. Uh, but it's not on the side of, of the theories, right? That's not what, how I understand multiple realization. If multiple realization is a threat to reduction, it's threat to reduction because uh, it represents dependence relations on the side of reality, not on the side of representation. So I was very confused when I was reading De Rosset on this, who says that, well, because of multiple realizability, we need this layer structure of theories. Hang on. Multiple realizability is always on the side of reality. And if we do have genuine emergence, that's going to feature on this side as well, not on the side of theories, if we are interested in the ontological model of reduction in any case. So I think that the point that I, I want to leave you with is, is very simple. We do have to think that there is this division between representation and reality if we are realists in the first place. And uh, we better talk in such a way that we don't confuse these issues. Um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm happy enough if that message gets through from there. I'll, I'll stop there. Ron again. Thanks. And I'm, I'm glad you left um, some room for those who wish to preserve the layers. And I think, yeah, you, yeah you, the place you've left it is exactly right, and it's an open question. Uh, I wouldn't say it's only... De I mean, uh, multiple realizability is one issue, but it could be just um, like set relationships. Like the intuition is that physics applies to many, many more mm -hmm. facts in the world than there are more truth makers that make physical truths true than there are truth makers that make biological truths true. You know what I mean? They're, they're just more, there's a set relationship between the, the truth makers. But yeah, um, yeah. I, I guess uh, what I wanted to, I was puzzled by when you, when you said, look, there cannot be these, these dependency relations on the right-hand side, but if you allow these relationships between the truth makers, and then you have a, you know, a semantic relation to the right-hand side, or the other way around, um, then won't you have by the back door some relate, couldn't you recreate all the familiar conceptual dependency relations that the traditional picture had, you can recreate them through your new picture, just they have to always go via the relationships between the truth makers. And you get a, you know, an indirect yeah. conceptual dependency or something like that. Right, I see, I see what you mean. Uh, yeah, I mean, even in that case, I think it would be important to, uh, to say that, the, that the, if, if there's a higher picture, for instance, that, that emerges from that, that it's, it's on the side of, okay. the, of the reality rather right. than the representation. At least it's located, and you've, you've helped us by locating where its origin, and, and it's a metaphysical in origin and not purely conceptual. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, so, if, so let, let's allow higher-level entities into the, into the ontology on the side of reality. Now, you're, you're right to say that, well, then uh, the representations uh, are going to be different from the side of, uh, 
And I think I did have that in this picture. Yeah, so in that case, so let's talk about, talk about these things here. Now, if they're real things, if they're, I don't know, call them chemical kinds or something like that, or biological kinds, well, then these things could represent uh, those higher level things, right? But I'd, I'd still say that the, the dependence relations here are, are not, well, I mean, there aren't dependence relations here. But they're, they're just a, one class of entities if they, are, if they are, say, propositions or models or theories. Uh, and yes, they represent dependence relations on the other side. So in that sense, they, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're in the picture, right? Mm -hmm. But they're representative entities. So, so uh, between them, there is no, the, the dependence isn't directly inherited in that sort of sense. But, but I, I see why, you, why you're bringing this up. And I mean, in some sense, it doesn't make that much difference uh, if your representations are true to the higher level anyway and there is really a dependence structure. It, it makes more of a difference for someone who thinks that the ontology you know, is really flat and there really aren't any, uh, any sort of hierarchical asymmetric dependence relations. I mean, there's, there could still be dependence relations that, among the fundamentalia, as it were. So you could have two fundamental things. Uh, I sometimes mention quark triplets uh, as an example. You know, the quarks could, or the quark triplet could depend on each other, uh, but that doesn't, Give you a hierarchy necessarily. Right. Anyway, I, I, I had a very quick terminological question too. At the very beginning, you were just outlining, giving definitions, mm -hmm. and uh, you 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 mentioned that the co a combination of two views, one of which was an ontological disunity view, together gives you uh, non-reductive physicalism. I was just wondering, how could an ontological disunity position ever be a form of physicalism? I would, wouldn't. I'm just w wondering how people use the term that way. Wouldn't physicalism always require ontological unity? Uh, in, a, in a way that people sometimes talk about unity, y yes. Um, however, I think that now a lot of people like, I don't know, John Dupree talks about unity, but he's a sort of physicalist anyway. Um, so so you, could, you, could have a, you could have the sense of disunity by, by just uh, using these, these high-level predicates, you know? Okay. <laughs> uh, without necessarily committed this. So, so, the so reason, on your view, that, that wouldn't really be possible. You couldn't be an ontological disunity theorist and also be a physicalist because, well, maybe I've gone on too long anyway. Yeah, yeah on a, on a, at the ontological side, yes. But, but the way people talk about disunity, I think that they, they are less committal than that uh, nowadays. And that's just because they oppose that classic Oppenheim Putnam picture. So that's the model of unity uh, that they go by. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it is a terminological issue, so I'm not, I don't claim that I've established any, any new terminology here. Yeah. Thanks, Ron. That was very helpful. So thank you for the uh, presentation. I would be most interested in hearing your opinion, let's say, coming from uh, two different, uh, uh, or having uh, experience in two different uh, language worlds. For example, uh, I've been born in Finland and then uh, working in, uh, in uh, England. And uh, um, my question concerns language. Uh, you have probably noticed that there might be some uh, divergence in uh, the words, uh, knowledge. Uh, so let us say uh, here we have truths, facts, and uh, then we have a roughly uh, equivalent word, uh, uh, knowledge. So uh, they all mean basically the same thing. But this, uh, uh, how this is defined in English language, uh, I think it differs from the, let's say, Finnish language or in German language. So for example, if we uh, say es gibt uh, in uh, German, it means uh, either uh, it is uh, given uh, in my perception or uh, some kind of a priori givenness. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is like a mathematical uh, uh, a priori truth. But in English, uh, knowledge seems to include subjectivity. So it is a uh, uh, phenomenology, uh, English uh, word knowledge includes phenomenology. And uh, I think uh, uh, this creates uh, some confusion, at least for me, uh, when we speak about truths, facts, 
and knowledge uh, mm -hmm. in analytic literature. So now when we speak about ontology, uh, are we taking uh, or are we baking phenomenology in the system or are we keeping it out? So uh, this is a complicated question, uh, but uh, I, uh, what, what are your uh, feelings as a, both a Finnish speaker uh, and uh, working in an uh, English environment? Thanks. I mean, that's, that's really interesting. In all honesty, when I do philosophy, I just do it all in English. I can't, I can't think of it in Finnish. Not anymore, anyway. I used to be able to. <laughs> um, but, I mean, you're, you're right that there are subtle differences here. I, 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 I mean, a, a distinction in the vicinity here is, is when, when De Rossa talks about facts, as I showed you the earlier, the earlier picture, sometimes people think that a fact is a, is a representational entity, right? So, we say it's a biological fact that this and that, but actually what they mean is, is, uh, is a, the truth bearer, you know, uh, so, so the truth in, in, in De Rossi's terminology. So, so um, whether, the, whether the knowledge comes into the pic picture here, it depends really on, on how, you, how you place that in the, in the representation reality distinction, to my, to my mind. So phenomenology presumably would be, would be usually the, involved with, in the representation, but again, it depends what you think, uh, think we are representing. So <laughs> if, uh, if, there are, if there are qualia, if, there, if qualia are real, uh, a, a real thing in, in the world, then presumably the phenomenology would, uh, would uh, represent something real on that side as well, if that, if that makes sense. <laughs> yes, uh, I think... Uh, uh, this would merit a longer discussion, but uh, uh, thank you. I thank you. Think. Hi, thank you for the lecture. That was quite all right. <laughs> <laughs> and I do have a few questions. The other one is a little bit more deeper, and the other one is more technical and easier to mm -hmm. answer. Which one would you prefer? Uh, the second one, question is about reduction of consciousness, and the other one is about truth making. Uh, I, I probably know more about truth making than consciousness, but but you know, you you, you pick. <laughs> okay, I think we start with the truth making. So, truth maker is a kind of concrete entity. Yeah, the, the way I'm, I'm treating them, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, this, the question continues. How can the truth makers be their own witnesses? And isn't this taking them as given? I continue a bit. How can they be used, the truth makers, as an evidence for a theory about themselves? This, uh, uh, this is taking them as given. It's like saying, it's evident, look. <laughs> right. Um, well, I, I, I mean, you're kind of asking sort of a, an epistemic question about about the picture. So, so th th that's fair enough. I, I try to keep that to one side. But, but here's very briefly. So, so, so I didn't say what the truth makers are, right? I just said, yeah, there's some concrete entities. So ultimately, this is going to depend on, on what you think that the ontology is. So for someone like John Heil, two category ontology. So the truth makers are just propertied substances. So really, this goes back to uh, kind of uh, typical metaphysics. So what, what do you think that the, the categories, the ontological categories are? Well, whatever they are, that's where the truth makers reside. Now, it's a very difficult epistemic question to, to uh, figure out how do we justify these different views of ontological categories. I had a chat about that with Ilmar yesterday. <laughs> um, but that's, that's something that I try to leave to one side because I, I acknowledge the, the difficulty there. Uh, but, but really, if it helps at all, the, the story about truth makers is, is your story about ontology. So if you think, if you think that there are you know, one or two or four categories of, of, uh, of reality, uh, then that's where you'd find the truth makers and that's how they would be uh, divided. And indeed, if you think that there are high-level entities, then you'd have to say something about the relationship between those, those categories. All of these are very, very difficult epistemic questions. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, just a quick question. This is the most interesting about reduction, mm -hmm. reductionist project about consciousness. Do you think that A, we should re reduct consciousness straight to physical level, or should we come up with the units of consciousness? 
which we will reduct to physical level. Because there is different levels of consciousness. Should we come up with a unit of consciousness which in, together can make a higher consciousness? Or should we just straight uh, take any consciousness uh, and translate that or reduct that to the physical level? That's tough. Uh, I don't know if I have the answers to that. I mean, one reason why I didn't talk about consciousness directly is that I, I feel like I don't know the science well enough, certainly not as well as, as a lot of people here. Uh, so uh, so I, would, I would, you know, if, if there is a reductive story about consciousness, it will presumably start from the interface of neuroscience and, and uh, uh, I mean, well, depends who you ask, doesn't it? <laughs> Uh, so, so I, I would, I would, uh, I would just delegate the question about the units of consciousness to that, to that question. I don't know what the current state of research is uh, on the, on that question, but I, I, I would regard it as a partly an, an empirical question. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer to that. It's okay. I will catch you up on a, later on a lunch or coffee. Thank you very much. Cheers. Okay, let's thank Thomas once more. Thank you. Yeah, so our next speaker is currently working here in Helsinki, Alex Gareth, how not to define physical, please. Hi, everyone. Can you, <clears throat> can you hear me okay? Does that work? Yep. Cheers. Okay, so what's the relationship between mind and matter? I'm not going to answer that question today, unfortunately. Um, what I am going to do is talk a little bit about one of the most popular, very broad and general answers to that question, a view that I'm sure is familiar to everyone in the room, and that view is physicalism. This is, as might be uh, evident from the title, going to be a primarily negative talk. So I'm going to talk about a couple of ways of formulating the general thesis of physicalism that have been popular in literature over the last maybe two, two and a half decades. Uh, and I'm going to suggest that these ways face a serious problem. Um, I may, depending on how time's going, say something very speculative and tentative about uh, how we might positively uh, approach characterizing physicalism, uh, but the, the primary focus of this talk is going to be the negative project. So I'm taking physicalism here in its kind of ontological sense, to be a general answer to the question about the relationship between mind and matter, according to which apparently distinctive mental phenomena such as conscious experiences, thoughts, beliefs, desires, volitions, bill in the list, however you wish, are nothing but physical goings-on in some sense or other. Again, fill in goings-on uh, with whatever, uh, as Thomas has just talked about, we can, one can have various different kind of basic category systems, maybe physical properties, physical entities, physical objects, physical processes, physical events, physical laws, whatever uh, one wants to, to fill in here. Uh, it shouldn't make a difference to uh, the discussion today. Or perhaps if they're not nothing but physical goings on in its more non-reductive form, physicalism says that at least apparently distinctive mental phenomena are in some metaphysically significant sense fully dependent on and determined by such goings on. And again, the kind of distinction between the reductive and non-reductive versions of physicalism uh, won't be particularly crucial here. Most traditionally, the physicalist program has been contrasted with or compared with the dualist program, according to which there's some kind of genuine 
ontological discontinuity between the mental and the physical. This would be one of the, uh, I forgot Thomas' exact term here, but the, uh, the disunified kind of view. And we can see people sat in the Cartesian theatre there on the little icon. Um, so on such a view, perhaps, the mind can only be accounted for by appeal to some kind of distinctively mental substance, as the kind of traditional Cartesian view would have it, or as is perhaps more common, uh, although uh, amongst modern dualists, by appeal to distinctively mental properties. Uh, there are, of course, some modern sub, uh, substance dualists, such as Lowe and Hasker and Rudder Baker and so on and so forth. And the question I'm interested in today really is how should we interpret this core claim of physicalism that apparently distinctive mental phenomena are nothing but physical goings on? And in particular, how ought one to understand the term physical as it appears in the core claim of physicalism such that the thesis might be plausible, intelligible and informative? And a bit of background, kind of some of the background motivation here is a problem that's been recognized since at least kind of the mid 20th century, and it's been pointed out most famously by Carl Hempel. So one kind of starting point one might have for answering this question of how we ought to understand the term physical as it appears in the doctrine of physicalism is to start with our physical sciences. So we say what we mean by physical is something like whatever entities, properties, processes, fill in the list as you like, are referred to in the best theories of our physical science. But as Hempel pointed out, this seems to cause uh, or kind of place physicalism in an awkward position. Suppose we want to characterize physical in this science-based way. Well, we can ask the question, does one mean current science? If so, it looks like the thesis of physicalism is probably false because it's reasonable to think that we probably haven't finished science yet. That our current physical theories may be incomplete, they may be inaccurate, and so on and so forth. So if uh, physicalism is the view that the mind is nothing but the entities picked out in our best current science, there's a concern that the thesis is probably false. We might then appeal to some kind of future science, maybe some, even some kind of ideal completed theory of everything or something like that, or some ideal completed physical science. But then the concern that Hempel raised is that the thesis of physicalism looks uninformative because we don't, at the current stage, know what those theories will look like. So we don't know what kinds of entities, properties, processes, or however one wants to fill in that list, will actually involve. We don't know what the core physicalist claim amounts to. And if Hempel's dilemma hits home, then it looks like we need some other kind of account in order to say what we mean by the term physical as it appears in physicalism, one that can avoid the dilemma. And I'm going to look at two such accounts that have been defended in the relatively recent literature. One of these is known as the via negativa account, and the other as often called the object-based account, or sometimes the paradigmatic physical uh, entities account. And uh, I'm going to proceed by just outlining very, very quickly what each of those views involves and how they avoid the problem brought up by Tempel Hempel's dilemma. And then I'm going to go on to outline a problem that these two views face. So the kind of core claims of the via negativa account, which has been defended by, amongst others, people like David Papineau, Sarah Worley, uh, Jessica Wilson, Barbara Montero at some points, I think, and, and various others, 
uh, can be captured in these quotes here. One's from, first one's from Augustine Vicente, and the second from David Papineau. So Vicente says of the via negativa, this maneuver consists of defining the physical negatively. That is, by contrasting it against a class of entities that is better defined. The class in question is the class of mental entities. We may not know which physical entity there are or what it is to be a physical entity, but we are on safer grounds as regards what constitutes the mental domain, such as beliefs, desires, qualia, etc. As Papineau says, it isn't crucial that you know exactly what a complete physics would include. Much more important is to know that it won't include the sentient say or the intentional. So according to these via negativa accounts, we don't need to give any kind of positive account of what we mean by physical as it appears in the formulation of physicalism. It's enough to simply say, well, whatever that term means, whatever it turns out uh, that term uh, refers to, that stuff or those things or those entities or properties or processes can't be fundamentally, primitively mental entities. And so on such a view, physicalism is true, just in case there is no basic mentality or no fundamental mentality or something like that, or in case apparently distinctive uh, mental goings on just are non-mental goings on in the final reckoning or are dependent on and determined by non-mental goings on. And we can see that this seems to avoid both horns of Hempel's dilemma. It's not tied in any way to our current physical science, so it seems to avoid uh, the uh, claim that physicalism is probably false. It's also, uh, I take it to be the case that it's controversial, but it's at least not obviously false that uh, such an account could be true, a physicalism formulated in the via negativa way. Furthermore, it seems to say something relatively minimal, but uh, perhaps kind of informative to some extent. It's certainly not as uninformative uh, as uh, the uh, kind of those who, who support Hempel's dilemma think that the kind of ideal future science-based account is, because it tells us, well, the physical is non-conscious, non-sentient, non-intentional, non-propositional, attitudinal, and so on and so forth. It, it says something, at least. So that, in a nutshell, is the via negativa account. The next view I'm going to talk about is the object-based account. And I've got a quote here. Hopefully, that's uh, legible from the back from uh, Daniel Stoliar, who's one of the uh, kind of people who's, who's formulated this kind of approach most explicitly and defended it uh, in the most detail. But this approach has been uh, adopted by various other people as well, certainly by Strawson at times. I think uh, Montero in some places has expressed a view very similar to this. And what Stoliar says about the notion of physical uh, this quote talks in terms of properties, but there's nothing, I don't think, particularly special about that. We could talk about events or processes or entities or whatever. Uh, what Stalyar says is the following. A physical property is a property which either is the sort of property required by a complete account of the intrinsic nature of paradigmatic physical objects and their constituents, or else is a property which metaphysically or logically supervenes on the sort of property required by a complete account of the intrinsic nature of paradigmatic physical objects and their constituents. According to this conception, for example, if rocks, trees, planets, and so on are paradigmatic physical objects, I couldn't quite get an image with a rock, a tree, and a planet in it, but I found one which has got at least some other uh, astronomical body appearing down in the corner. Um, if rocks, trees, planets, and so on are paradigmatic physical objects, then the property of being a rock, tree, or planet is a physical property. Similarly, if the property of having mass is required in a complete account of the intrinsic nature of physical objects and their constituents, then having mass is a physical property. So the kind of core idea of the object-based account 
goes something like this. We have a pretty decent folk intuitive notion of uh, physical, and we're good at picking out macroscopic, familiar, paradigmatically physical object, a, a particular rock or this desk here or the computer monitor there or whatever. And we can think about, even if we don't know the specifics of what properties, processes, entities, so on and so forth, are required to give a full and exhaustive account of the nature of these paradigmatic physical objects, we think we've got, I guess, a kind of confidence that there's going to be a kind of unity between those, right? So the sorts of properties, events, processes, whatever we need to account for rocks and desks and computer monitors are all going to be relatively unified, perhaps things like mass, charge, so on, and so forth, if we're talking about the properties here. And what the physical in physicalism picks out is just those properties or entities or events or whatever. Whatever it is that is fundamentally needed to account for rocks and desks and so on and so forth. The physical in physicalism then just means whatever these paradigmatically physical things are made up of or consist in, fundamentally speaking. And again, we can see that this kind of view is going to avoid Hempel's dilemma. It's not tied to any of our current theories about rocks, tables, trees, etc., and so it appears to avoid the falsity horn. Furthermore, it says something, again, kind of relatively minimal, but perhaps maybe still informative, about the physical and its relationship to the mind, because it says, well, there, if physicalism is going to be true, there can be no kind of metaphysical discontinuity between paradigmatically physical things and apparently distinctively mental goings-on. They all, in the final reckoning, are of the same kind. So that is the object-based account and how it deals with Hempel's dilemma in a nutshell. Um, I'm going to try and outline now a kind of problem that I think faces both of these views. Uh, and I think it's a problem that's serious enough that both of these approaches to characterizing physicalism ought to be rejected. And the kind of key to seeing this problem starts by recognizing that the opposition between kind of physicalism on the one hand and dualism on the other hand isn't a kind of exhaustive characterization of the various options in terms of the kind of ontology or metaphysics of mind and matter. And kind of most importantly for our, our current purposes here, uh, I'm not going to be talking really about dualism or, or, or other forms of pluralism in any detail, but one of the most kind of important things to recognize here is that physicalism is only one version of a more general kind of approach, which we might call monism. And according to monism, uh, notwithstanding the kind of prima facie heterogeneity of phenomena in the world, uh, eventually everything there, there's a kind of unity. I mean, again, this is very similar to, to the way Thomas was talking earlier. Everything can fundamentally be accounted for by some relatively unified, relatively homogeneous class of phenomena, event, properties, whatever category we end up settling on. Uh, so I, I should draw a quick contrast here now. There's, there's a view that sometimes, or well, the, the view often referred to as monism, which is the view that there's only one entity, right? So this would be the idea that, say, the, un the universe as a whole is the only uh, entity that exists or is the fundamental entity. Uh, the kind of monism I'm talking about is completely independent of that kind of monism. It, it's con consistent with either the truth or falsity of that kind of object monism that people like Schaffer have defended or, or Spinoza more historically. Um, this is about kind of what, whether they, what kind of level of unity there are amongst the basic phenomena. Um, and yeah, so here's a probably non-exhaustive table of different kinds of monism that one might have. 
uh, some of them are kind of mentalistic in flavor, idealism, the view that everything is fundamentally ideas in the mind. Phenomenalism, the view that these are kind of cartoon characterizations that they should do for present purposes. The view that everything fundamentally is perceptual in nature. Uh, some versions of panpsychism, according to which everything is kind of conscious experiential in nature. And some versions of Rossellian monism. I won't go through the details of that view because it, it's not crucial for anything said here. Rossellian monism comes in, in various flavors, though, such that, as you can see, it appears in all three columns of this table. <clears throat> there are physicalistic monisms. There's uh, kind of physicalism, the view that we're focused on in this talk. Some defenders of panpsychism have claimed that panpsychism is a kind of physicalistic theory or can be formulated in a physicalistic way. <coughs> Excuse me. And again, Rossellian monism can be formulated in a physicalistic way. People have also defended versions of neutral monism. I think uh, there was some discussion of this in one of the talks yesterday. And the kind of core claims uh, that make of you neutral monist is the idea that monism is true, but it is a monism that is neither mentalistic nor physicalistic. It's neutral between the two. There can be neutral versions of Rossellian monism. And I've also put here uh, what I term silly views, which I think could appear in the neutral column as well. Now, silly views are views uh, that aren't necessarily silly because of what they contain, but they're silly because of the way one might generate their views. And what I'm thinking about here is arbitrarily pick a uh, class of uh, entity and then append to that the thesis of monism. Um, take aestheticalism to be the view that the fundamental properties which account for the natures of everything are the aesthetic properties. I doubt that such a view is true. Perhaps good arguments could be marshaled in, in favor of such a view. But what makes this fall under the category of silly views, as I'm understanding it now, is that I generated that view just by, by kind of fairly arbitrarily picking that. You could do the same for, you could have normativism, the view that everything is fundamentally in the final reckoning moral or normative in nature. You could have the view jamism, uh, where jam here isn't picking out the kind of sticky, sweet uh, substance made from stewed fruit, water, and sugar. Jam here is a technical notion uh, where jamism is true just in case none of the other formulated monisms are true, right? So my view is, is I'm a jamist. I think that monism's true, but none of the other specific monisms that formulated are true, and, and, and I call whatever uh, is left jam. It's all just so much jam. So, you know, and you, could, you can see that one could just keep generating these silly views, uh, but I'll stop doing so now because I'm sure you've all had enough of it. So what's the problem with all of this? Well, the concern is that neither via negativa physicalism nor object-based physicalism can distinguish physicalism from other forms of monism. And the problem's most acute for the object based account. Because remember, the object-based account says, well, start with some paradigmatic objects, rocks, tables, whatever. Whatever they turn out to be made up of, that's what I'll call physical stuff. And I take physicalism to be true, just in case that accounts for everything, including the mind, therefore. Well, look, if phenomenalism is true, then rocks and tables are fundamentally made up of perceptions. And Presumably, minds are fundamentally made up of perceptions. And so then physicalism turns out to be true according to the object based account, even though phenomenalism is true. And, and like we could arbitrarily pick anything that appears on this table, any uh, silly view that can be generated, all of them are going to count as uh, truth conditions for physicalism according to the object based account. Basically, the ob object based physicalism just is monism. Uh, but it seems plausible that monism is a much broader church than... I mean, fine, we could use the term physicalism to just pick out monism if we wanted, but all of these distinctions seem to exist in the literature, in the way we can think about these things, and it seems appropriate that we take a more fine-grained approach than that. Now, things aren't perhaps quite 
as bad for the via negativa view because given that the via negativa view says whatever the physical is, it's not mental stuff, the left-hand column gets excluded here, right? So via negativa physicalism can distinguish physicalism from idealism, phenomenalism, certain formulations of panpsychism and Rossellian monism, and so on and so forth. But it can't distinguish physicalism from anything that appears in the right-hand column. So the problem we have is that these approaches can't distinguish physicalism from alternative monistic theories. Object-based account can't distinguish it from any other monistic theories, and neither uh, the via negativa nor the object-based account can distinguish physicalism from neutral monism, from neutral variants of Rossellian monism, from various silly views such as aestheticalism or normativism or jamism. Um, how am I doing for time? Two minutes. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll stop there then. Yeah, I think we can take one quick question. Ron. So just for a second, pretend neutral monism doesn't exist and the silly views don't exist. Mm -hmm. uh, couldn't you solve the problem by it just embracing the conjunction of the object-based approach and the via negativa approach? So you say, it's based it on rocks and trees, and by the way, it can't have any mentalistic uh, concepts, you know. And, and then you could at least solve the, the, the problem with respect to mentalism and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, whatever you call the physicalism one. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, so if, if, if one sidelines the, the right-hand column in the, uh, yeah. in the table here, then, yeah, the conjunction, the conjunction of those two views would do the job. I mean, I guess the via negativa view would do the job on its own, but maybe says a bit less, so the conjunction of, of those two views would be a more satisfying response to the second horn of Hempel's dilemma than either of the views taken on their own. Um, but I guess the, the right-hand column is, is there still. Um, and, and perhaps, I mean, so, so, so I think what's, what's interesting and important about this is, is that perhaps the conjunction of those two things plus something more, maybe that's... Uh, the right direction for an answer to the overall problem. Uh, I'd, I'd be certainly open to that being one kind of strategy. Okay, so thanks. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bruno. Okay, so now we, we have a 10 minute break and we're setting up uh, live uh, with uh, uh, Sir Roger Penrose, who is hopefully with us very soon. But see you in uh, 10 minutes.
Well, that looks like the first slide. Has that worked?
I've just learned from Helen. <laughs> I hope it works. Yes, so please. Tell me when you want me to start. So I, I can I think you can start now. Okay. Can you see my first slide? Yes. And you can see a picture of two gentlemen uh, in Princeton. You wouldn't know it was Princeton, except you know who they are. So I, shall I start? Yes, please. Hello. Well, I, I want to talk about my view on consciousness which arose from well the two gentlemen you see in the picture the left hand one is more familiar <clears throat> that's einstein the one on the right is what i'm going to talk about first at least the, his work namely kurt girdle and when i was a graduate student in cambridge i attended lectures which weren't anything to do with what i was supposed to be doing and one of them was on the ideas of well computability and the issue of the Gödel theorems, which I'll explain a bit. Now, let me try and move forward in remembering how to do this. First of all, let me start with something quite different. This is an experiment that was performed in the, I think, in the 1990s by Benjamin Libet. And uh, I, they are mentioned in my book, The Emperor's New Mind, although I didn't have the point of view, which I want to talk about now. Surprisingly, I did have very close to what the point of view I want to talk about now. Um, but let me first explain this experiment. This is an experiment done on a patient who had have a brain operation. And the point was that Benjamin Libet uh, wanted to do an experiment with the patient's ex agreement, of course. Um, this experiment involved having electrodes attached to a finger and that could act, be activated and, and the patient would feel the finger being stimulated. There was another electrode attached to that part of the cortex, which was to do with uh, sensory cortex, which, to do, which had to do with that finger. So when that finger was, uh, when that part of the brain was stimulated, it felt like the finger being stimulated. Not quite the same. The patient was able to distinguish between the two types of stimulus. So it was not quite, not exactly the same, but it felt like the finger being stimulated. Okay, now I want to describe various experiments that Libet did with this patient. I should say also that there's a fast moving clock in the room so that the patient could look at the clock and see what time the clock said with regard to when something was felt by the patient. So the first top line represents what happens when the finger was stimulated just like that. And the patient registered the sensation of the finger being stimulated at what appeared to be almost instantly. So that the, the, the clock, according to the clock and when, when the stimulation was taking place, that was more or less the same time, just very, very slightly later, but hardly significantly so. Now the second line, we consider what happened when the brain was stimulated. Well, first of all, nothing was felt at all. Except half a second later, the, the, the stimulation was felt. It took about half a second before the patient felt the stimulation as though it was on the finger, but it was the brain being stimulated. Now we go down and you see what happens. This is the striking one. When the finger is stimulated first, and then a quarter of a second later, the brain is stimulated. Now you might think, okay, you should, the patient would already have felt the stimulation on the finger. But what is strange, because when the brain is stimulated a quarter, a quarter of a second later, the patient doesn't feel, it's sort of unfelt. It seems remarkable. Something that patient would have felt otherwise isn't felt. But the, even though the stimulation occurs afterwards, a quarter of a second afterwards. And then we go, go down and find, well, the, the patient patient then does feel the brain stimulation that's half a second after the brain stimulation has started and then uh, anyway the main point i want to make is is the key one that if the finger stimulation is made first and the brain is not stimulated 
the finger stim stimulation seems to be felt instantaneously, almost instantaneously. Whereas if a quarter of a second later, the brain stimulation is made, somehow this thing was not felt, it was unfelt. Strange idea. In the Emperor's New Mind, I did sort of suggest an idea that somehow one's perceptions are delayed by something like half a second. I couldn't make sense of that, but I did put that forward as a sort of suggestion. I then went off on saying, well, there's something vague about, it, about sensations and goodness knows well, and I just sort of tapered off without really come to, coming to a conclusion. Well, I want to come to, back to this experiment at the end of what I want to say, because I think it's very relevant. As far as I'm aware, although there are other experiments of Libets and so on that people do talk about, um, they don't seem to address this particular one. Okay, let me move forwards to uh, the contribution of Gödel's, which I want to describe. This is basically Gödel's first incompleteness theorem, and the interpretation I want to make. Well, first of all, let's not talk about that. Um, yes, all right, I think that's what the slide is saying. If you have a set of rules for proving things in mathematics, let's see these. And I want, when I say things, I'm talking about statements in number theory. These are about the natural numbers, zero, one, two, three, four, et cetera. And I think we have a pretty good idea what that means. And a sort of statement what my, one might be talking about is, well, if you add two even numbers together, do you always get an even number? This is a statement about an infinite number of things, but we can see how to establish that sort of thing shortly. I'll come to that. Um, there is a set of rules which, which we learn at school called uh, induction. And the method of induction doesn't enable you to prove an infinite number of things by e e just proving two things. I'll come back to that. At least I hope I've got that on the slides. I, if I haven't, I'll just say it by words. Um, okay. Now, the Gödel theorem here tells you that whatever set of rules you have, um, and these are rules for proving things like, well, let's take another example, the example of a theorem due to Lagrange, which is that if you have any natural number, any non-negative integer, then if you, every, any such number is the sum of four square numbers. It's quite a hard thing to prove because even Euler couldn't prove it, but Lagrange had a proof. But that's an example of the sort of thing one might be interested in. You could say, okay, can you find a proof of that? And if your system of rules, I'm calling them R here, will be your rules of proof, you could check on a computer whether these rules have been satisfied or not. So these are what you could call computational rules. I'll say a bit more about computationalness in a minute, but uh, that's the sort of thing we're talking about. And well, now he, what we do have here is mathematical induction. This is the sort of thing you learn at school. If you want to prove that a proposition P, which depends upon a natural number. So let's say P of N, and there could be P of zero, P of one, P of two. And if you want to prove that P of N is true for all N, if you can prove it is true for zero, and if you can prove, that's one thing. And the second thing you might prove is that if it's true for N, then you can show that it follows that it must be true for n plus one. So there's two sort of finite things you can do, and they enable you to establish that p n is true for all natural numbers. So you people sometimes say we can't think about infinity. That's just not right. You certainly can think about infinity, and you can establish definite truths about infinity. And you, this is a method you can do that, which we learn at school. Let me move forwards. I want to talk about comput computability. Here we have Alan Turing. Uh, he had a rather different way of thinking about computability than the idea of sort of following rules and things like this. He had this idea of what he, I don't think he called it a Turing machine, but we call it a Turing machine. And the thing is that you have a device which is finite. I'll talk about the universal Turing machine. It's a finite device. It has a finite set of rules. What's infinite about it, or potentially infinite, is the tape. You see, in, in the Turing machine, you have a, it needn't be an actual physical tape. I think he imagined it was a tape. In those days, the machines worked on things like that. But, but you sort of conceptually think of it as a tape. It's a, it's a storage space, which, although you never use more than a finite amount of it, 
it is potentially infinite. So if you've used out, you see here, we imagine this rather ridiculous picture of these trucks full of tapes like this, and you imagine them going off into the distance infinitely, and you have the finite Turing machine in the middle with a finite set of instructions and so on, but it can wind the tape backwards and forwards. It only always looks at the finite amount of the tape, but you can't be put a limit on how much it might use. So that's the idea of a Turing machine. It's, it's a very clear idea mathematically. And what, what is computable is something that you can put on a Turing machine. It's a very clear definition. There are all sorts of other definitions and they're all shown to be equivalent by Turing and Church and other people. So it, it became clear that this is a very good mathematical notion and uh, the idea of computability. Okay, now I want to show you a particular example of a theorem of this sort. Um, I won't go into it in detail because it'll take me too long, I think, but I'll give you the rough idea. This is a theorem due to Goodstein, I think proved in 1945 or something like that, where it applies to any natural number. And now I'm choosing one just an example, the particular natural number 1077. It's just an example. I, you could choose any number. And you know, zero, well, zero is a bit trivial, but any any number. The first thing you do is write it in binary. This is probably familiar to people. Uh, what you mean is that number 1077 is the sum of distinct powers of two. <laughs> Those powers of two appear, you represent by one. Those powers of two which don't appear, you represent by zero, starting with the highest power and working down to the lowest power. So 1077 is the sum of powers of two as descriptive as indicated here. Now you look at this representation and you think, well, the exponents are not written that way. The, uh, each exponent we should then write as a sum of distinct powers of two as well. Okay, well, we do that. And then you still, you're not finished because you have a second order exponent and you write that as a sum of powers of two. And as you go, you eventually come to an end. You may have towers which are bigger than the one I have here, but that's the general idea. So you write the numbers, this way in terms of powers of two where the exponents themselves are written this way and then those exponents if you ever find a number which is bigger than two you write that as the sum of powers of two until you come to an end okay i described two operations which we apply to this number the first number is operation the first operation is operation a that is replace all the twos by threes so that's the green series here all the twos are replaced by threes. The number has gone up enormously, much, much bigger than it was before. That's operation A. Now operation B, what's that? Operation B is subtract one. Just take one off. It's quite easy, there's a nice handy one at the end. Take that off, doesn't come down by much, but it's come down a little. Operation A again. So I'm going to alternate A, B, A, B, A, B like that. Operation A, now you look at all those threes and you replace them by fours. The number has gone shooting up much bigger as it, than it was before. Then you take operation B, subtract one. It's a little trickier now because you don't have a handy one at the end, but it's a, a bit like taking one from a thousand, you know what to do, you get 999. So you do the similar thing here. You have things with four, 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 like uh, three, 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 three. Uh, the important thing that threes are smaller than four so that the numbers that you're using here are smaller than the base number, which is four. And when I change four to five, which is operation A again, you leave those smaller numbers as they are, but the fours all go to fives, and then you subtract one, and then the fives goes to sixes, and you subtract one. The numbers go sailing up. You can see here how the sort of size that the numbers get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until they come down to zero. It's a very remarkable result. It's a sort of hair of the tortoise of an extreme type. But the tortoise always wins. The subtracting of one, this trivial, trivial looking operation of taking one off, always brings the number down to zero. Very remarkable. I would, if you want to go home and try it for, <laughs> um, say, uh, try it for the number three, starting from the number three, it comes down pretty quickly. If you then try it for the number, starting with the number four instead of 1077, that is, 
I would not recommend that you use it. You use your laptop to work it out. I would not recommend you use the university mainframe. I would not recommend that you use any computer. What I would recommend is you take a piece of paper and a pencil and try to figure it out yourself. And you can perhaps see with a little struggling with it that the number four eventually, eventually comes down to zero. Now, it is proved by Paris and Kirby that there is no proof of this result using the method of, can I go back this way? I've forgotten how to go back. Um, oh. oh, you have to, never mind. Yes, well, I'm going to go back further than that. I think, uh, let me, it's going to be too much trouble. Which one? Yes, that one. Yes, sorry. <laughs> it was just mathematical induction. There is no proof using this mathematical induction of establishing this result. So how do we know it's true? Well, we know it's true. I want to turn to another great figure in the subject. This is Cantor. By a procedure introduced by George Cantor, you can show by what's called transfinite induction that this Goodstein theorem is actually true. And if you know about transfinite in induction, it's really very easy to prove. You take, you replace the base number, the twos, threes, fours, fives, et cetera, by the smallest ordinal number of omega. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about here, it doesn't matter too much because I'm not going to describe how Cantor's proof works. And I'm also, well, not going to, well, let me go to the next slide. The question really is, how is it that using Cantor's method, we can show how to prove it? Well, you say, well, Cantor was a genius, perhaps uh, somebody like this could prove it, but I'm not asking you to be a genius. I'm asking you to see how Cantor's method works and to convince yourself that this makes, makes the number come down to zero, whatever number you start with. I'm not going to go into it here. All I'm going to say that you don't, it's not that hard. You can see why it works. And this means that it, the capability is not beyond um, a pretty average human being. Okay, you have to, if you're not a mathematician, you have to think quite hard about it. I'm not really going into that in, in detail because that's not the point. What I am trying to say is how did such a thing come about by natural selection? You see, the argument I'm trying to make here, going back to the Turing thing or the, the Gödel thing, I'm trying to say there that the, uh, we can understand mathematical statements somehow because let's might suggest that it's an algorithm in our heads which is so complicated that we can't apply the Gödel theorem or not just so complicated it's just not known to us so if you want to try and use the Gödel argument which says that such and such a thing is the, the, the Gödel statement yes this is where I would want to go back but let me just say it the, the Gödel statement I think was called G of and whatever it was, that that statement you can see is true using the Gödel argument. And it, what you're doing is you're understanding how the rules work. What Gödel's statement says that if you trust the rule, what, let me just say what it says more or less. You make the statement say, I am not provable by the rules. It's pretty hard to make you do that. And that's where the clever stuff comes in. But if you check through what Gödel actually does, you can see it's okay. You can check the rules. Yes, okay, that's that's all right. Check the second rule. Yes, that's okay. And you go all the way through, and you see that it does really say, in in words, I am not provable by the rules. To make it do that, of course, is tricky, and that's the clever thing that Gödel was able to do. Never mind. It's it's not beyond us. We can see how to make it do that. And the statement then says, I am not provable by the rules. Now let's suppose it's true, or let's suppose it's false, first of all. Suppose that statement is actually false, then that means it is provable by the rules. And if you trust the rules, which you sure should, because you, these rules are meant to be proving things, and if you follow the rules right, they're meant to be actual proofs. And you check with all the rules and you say, is that okay? Yes, I can see that, I can see that one, that's all right. That one, I'm, I'm not so sure. Ah, oh, yes, I see. Then you go all the way through and you say, yes, if, as long as those rules all are correctly coding things which look pretty good to you, then you must believe that anything it says is true is actually true. So there's something, what Gödel shows is that there's something beyond actually using the rules in understanding why the rules work. 
That's the subtle thing here. When you understand why the rules work, then you understand why the Gödel statement actually says, I am not provable. And when you've got to that point, you can say, well, if it's false, then it must be provable. And therefore, because you trust the rules, anything provable must actually be true. That means the Gödel statement must actually be true. And it also says it's not provable by the rules. So you can see it's not provable by the rules. I, when I first learned this, I was absolutely stunned by it because it shows that our understanding of why certain things are true in mathematics is not following any kind of algorithm that we understand and trust. So if you try to formulate our mathematical understanding in terms of computational rules, things that could be put on a computer, and as I say, I learned about Turing computability and what computability means, from Steen's lectures, as well as the Gödel theorem. So I had a pretty good idea what that said. It says that what our understanding is not a computation, it's not, it's not an algorithm. But you see, what it really says, it's not an algorithm that we can believe underlies our understanding. So it has, it's not an algorithm that somehow we, we can access. So that's, the, the catch, if you like, to the to Gödel thing. Now, the cartoon here is meant to try and explain why that catch doesn't really work. The question is, suppose there is such an algorithm which is powerful enough to, under, to understand how, to, why the Goodstein theorem is true, how can that have come about by natural selection? So if you believe that we do have this very, very powerful algorithm in our heads, the question is, how on earth could that have come about by natural selection? So what I'm really saying is that what came about by natural selection is this general quality of understanding, whatever that is. So I'm concentrating on one aspect of consciousness. You see, many people will say, well, there's all sorts of things about consciousness we can argue about. I mean, when you see a, a red thing, I mean, is this red thing perceived the same as when somebody else looks at it or something like that? I mean, that is a conscious perception, and you can certainly argue about such things. I'm not saying anything about that whatsoever. Most things to do with consciousness are not to do with understanding mathematical statements. That's sure, that's true. I don't have anything to say about them. That's not the point. The point I'm saying is that we, I do have something to say about mathematical understanding. And if one can show that that element of consciousness is not something computable, that's something we have to face up to. And so what I'm saying is, that to understand why the Goodstein theorem is true, and we can, use, we can go through and look at Cantor's argument or go to a lecture about it or something like that, and you see, okay, yeah, that's okay. That argument really works. That gives you a proof of Goodstein's theorem. So Goodstein's theorem must be true. How do we know that? Well, you say it's because of this complicated algorithm in our heads that we can't know. I'm saying this is most implausible. And in this cartoon, I'm showing sorts of things which general understanding can achieve. In the distance, you see people building shelters, people building domesticating animals, um, that sort of thing. Uh, uh, and that's indicated in the distance. In the left in the foreground, somebody's got a brilliant idea of how to make a mammoth trap. And they've caught the mammoth, this poor mammoth, you can see it rather taken their back by stepping on this thing which collapses underneath it. I'm not saying that's where people build mammoth traps in the old days, but it's illustrative of the idea that these things are things that understanding in a general way can be advantageous. In the foreground, we have a poor mathematician who is trying to develop quite a subtle theorem. There's a little joke in the theorem, which I won't go into, but never mind. The point is that there's nothing in mathematical understand, sophisticated mathematics, which can have been as of a selective advantage because he's about to be eaten by the saber-toothed tiger and his mathematical understandings aren't of any use to him at all. In fact, they're of no use to the general development of civilization or whatever you call it, going back to our ancestors and what gave human beings their advantages over animals. This was general understanding of doing these things which are in the distance in this picture, not developing sophisticated mathematical ideas which went beyond uh, ordinary uh, induction. Now you should just about imagine that perhaps 
thinking about uh, mathematical induction, as I just explained at the beginning, that could have had some select selective advantage, perhaps. But transfine and induction, I can see no role whatsoever in having, okay, we can appreciate what Cantor did. We don't have to beat Cantor. We don't have to invent that procedure. We don't have to discover that procedure, I think I prefer to say. But the point is that we can understand it ourselves. We have that capability. It's not an algorithm which is so sophisticated that it can achieve things beyond natural, the uh, ordinary induction. It's something, general understanding, which enables us to appreciate the Gödel theorem by using understanding whatever that means. Now, what I'm trying to say is that understanding whatever it means is a non-computable process. It's something which cannot be achieved by any Turing machine. I want to give some indication of such non-computable or, or yeah, non-algorithmic procedures. The picture we see here is a tiling problem. The general problem I'm suggesting here is tiling the plane, covering the plane with a certain finite set of shapes. These shapes are, are what we call polyominoes. Polyominoes are made out of equal squares. So the squares are all the same size and shape, well, all squares are the same shape, but they're the same size. And they're glued together along their edges to make what is called a polyomino. So it's a plane shape, and you have an example of three of them there. And the thing is that sometimes using a, a set of shapes like that, you can cover the entire plane. Sometimes you can't. Now you see, it happens to be, it was proved by Robert Berger, that there is no, I mean, he proved something slightly different, but from which is more or less equivalent to the following thing, that if you're given a set of polyominoes, a finite set, such as here, you've got three of them, do they cover the entire plane without any gaps or overlaps? The answer in this particular case is yes. And in this particular case, the only way you can do it never repeats itself. And the, the result of Robert Berger actually depends upon things like this. If it was the case that, that if it covers the entire plane, then it has to be able to do it by repeating itself endlessly, then you, it would be there was an algorithm. But it's not true, because there are examples like this one, which will only tile the plane non-repetitively, and it's because of such things that there is no general algorithm for deciding whether or not a finite set of tiles will tile the plane or not. So I just wanted to indicate that there are some quite simple statements like this, which are not soluble by an algorithm. Let me give you another example. Another example is the following one. This, of course, is not non-computable. What I'm giving you here as a simple tiling of with three shapes. These are squares, regular hexagons, and regular dodecagons. That's 12-sided. And this is a way that you can tile with those shapes. Of course, you can tile with just the squares if you want to. So it's, but I'm saying use this method. That's not the point just yet. So you use this method of tiling with the squares and hexagons and dodecagons. Now, the next thing is the tricky part. What I'm going to do is mark these tiles in a particular way. I'm going to mark them like this. And what you have to do is when you see each of those shapes, you put one orientation of the tiling. So you put the dodecagate, there are 12 different ways of putting it in there, uh, six different ways of putting the hexagon in and four of the square, and you have to just match them in such a way that the lines match. That's it, quite a simple problem. I'd be very intrigued to see if you give this to a computer, how far would it get? I would be very interested to see. Um, I'll tell you what you get. Here's a nice picture of it. Um, this is actually produced by a computer, but it's produced by a computer using what, how the tiling is designed. So I, desi I designed this particular set of markings, and this particular set of markings, you can show, will only tile, will tile the plane, but only in a way which never repeats. And I just want to show how complicated it can be. And whether the computer, I should say that the actual hexagon shapes are about the, the smallest little ring you can see in this picture, that's about that sort of size. So I'm not sure how many uh, of these dodecagons are in this picture, but a pretty huge number. 
and whether the computer, just by trying one thing after another, could get a picture that big. And just by trying, I'm not sure. Of course, you can put the algorithm in, and then it does it. Um, but that's another story that you're telling it the answer, really. Okay. Now, the view I held then is that somehow, in order to make brains, which I believe are physical objects like anything else, like this table and my computer, which um, doesn't seem to be behaving itself very well now, but nevertheless, it is a physical object. And I believe that it operates according to the laws of physics. Now, the laws of physics, well, I'll say something a bit um, more about them, but for the moment, let me just say what the slide says. Um, I'm trying to say just, uh, that consciousness is something which is a physical process. It comes about when a physical object is organized appropriately. And this is a tricky question. Um, somehow, uh, maybe that organism can appreciate the color red or the color green or something like that, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about how it understands, and most particularly, how it understands mathematics. And I'm claiming that whatever it does when appreciating the color green or something like that, I'm not even talking about at all. I have no idea. All I have an idea about is certain things about mathematics, which is a very small part. Well, certainly, uh, math we mathematicians maybe spend a lot of, a big part of our lives worrying about such things, but most people don't and they're just as conscious as anybody else. So there's no question about that. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm just saying is that this particular element of consciousness, which is understanding, and most more specifically mathematical understanding, that's just a particular aspect of a small part of understanding, is something non-algorithmic. So this suggests that any type of understanding, any type of consciousness, whatever it is, is non-computable. I'm not trying to prove that, I'm just trying to say that if any part of it is not computable, we're in, we're in this problem. How is it can come about by following physical laws? What physical laws can they be which give you non-computable things? Now, I want to slip over that one here, and i first come back to that because I couldn't get the slides to work properly. Um, okay, what are the laws of physics that we understand? Well, you see, there's standard... Um, classical mechanics or Newtonian mechanics, let's say. Um, that's the laws of gravity, first of all, but then Newton's Principia, he studied all sorts of laws of force, not just gravitational force. He studied forces of different kinds. And this really started off science. I mean, let's say, let's say Kepler, Galileo, and Newton really started off science as we know it. And the Principia was a great encompassing of these ideas. This then developed by people like Euler and, and Lagrange and, and uh, Hamilton to develop a general formalism. And this general formalism could then be changed to accommodate quantum theory. So I've listed here um, Newtonian dynamics, um, Einstein's general relativity. You see, Maxwell's equations, that's uh, electricity, magnetism, and putting the two together See the great experiments due to Faraday and other people who showed how electricity and magnetism interplay with each other. Maxwell put them together, realized that there was something missing from these equations. You had to put another term in to make them make sense. And when you do this, you get these wonderful equations of Maxwell, which not only encompass the idea of electricity and magnetism, but shows that you have these waves which travel across space and they travel with the speed of light. This was a wonderful thing. You could show that these waves actually go at the speed of light, and maybe that is what light is. So then it came clear that what light is a certain very limited range of frequencies, and X-rays on one end and gamma rays and things on the other end, radio waves, are all part of the uh, what Maxwell's equations enable you to achieve. So that's a great part of physics, an enormous step forward in understanding physical laws. Einstein's general theory of relativity, that is showing how you can go beyond the Newtonian picture and have this greater theory. Um, I say a little bit about it, uh, but the question is, where do we see in this anything which could be non-computable? Now you can put these things on computers. There's a little issue, which is a serious issue, which I'm going to skate over. When you put things on computers, you have to 
approximate because you have to you, these theories depend on continuous numbers these are if you like infinite decimals and you can't put an infinite decimal on a computer but nevertheless you can approximate to any degree of approximation you like and there is an issue there of whether approximations make any difference or not i'm going to skate over that problem i don't think that's where the problem lies but it's something that could be considered further so i'm not going to rule it out altogether that is to say i'm not going to say that this way in which we handle things with computers is to approximate i don't think that is the main catch it could be and somebody else could go and explore on that i haven't seen any good really discussion of that really but what i'm trying to say is that the laws i've written up here are not sufficient at least the ones that i've talked about so far but what about the collapse of the wave function now the collapse of the wave function i have to explain what that is i have to say something i want to go back two slides if i can that's it that one that's fine that's the one i want to say something about quantum mechanics you see in quantum mechanics there is this principle of superposition if you have a state A or a wave function A or something with the quantum state, a wave function is a way of describing a quantum state. That's Schrodinger's way of doing it. It doesn't matter how you do it. It's, it's the idea is you have the quantum state and the quantum state is what is called a wave function. Now that is supposed to be a description of the world. Now, if you have one description A, quantum state, and another description B, another quantum state, then you can make these combinations alpha a plus beta b. <clears throat> alpha and beta are what are called complex numbers. They involve the square root of minus one. So it's a bit of magic mathematics. Never mind about that. The point is that according to quantum mechanics, you can always do this. That is to say, if a is an allowable state and if b is an allowable state, then so also are these funny combinations. Let me give you an example. You could have a rock sitting on is sitting at a place A, or you could have the rock sitting at place B, and those are two possible states. So you could imagine that they have a quantum state. And what quantum theory says is, okay, there are states where the rock is partly at A and partly at B at the same time. And that is a clear rule of the way quantum mechanics works. That works fine if you were talking about electrons or protons or neutrons or little particles, and you can do experiments which show, yes, to the thing to the two slit experiment. You can send particles through two slits, and you can see that they don't just go through one slit or the other. They sort of go through both at once. And to explain the effects, the interference effects that you get in these simple experiments, you have to say that the particle, as it goes through the slits, is going through both slits at once. And that's how you make sense of these quantum effects. This is a very, very fundamental part of quantum mechanics. It's called the superposition principle. Okay, now the thing is, when things seem to get too big, with a rock, for example, for some reason, you can't produce these superpositions. And it's very mysterious, because quantum theory says you could... I, one of the lectures I went to, which, which I wasn't supposed to be going to when I was at Cambridge as a graduate student, was a lecture by Dirac, and he'd mentioned the superposition principle, and he was talking about particles, and that can be placed in in place A or place B, then they can have these superposed states. And then he took out a piece of chalk and tried to explain why this couldn't be in two places at once. At that point, my mind was wandering and I uh, missed the explanation. So I've worried about it ever since. I'm still worrying about it. But my view is, and let me now go forwards if I can, to this picture here. This is the basic principle of general relativity. It goes back to Galileo, very impressively made by Galileo. The point, if you imagine dropping a big rock and a little rock from the Leaning Tower of Pisa, they would drop together. Well, they wouldn't, of course, because the little one, the air resistance would affect them differently. Galileo was completely, completely aware of that, and he knew about the air resistance, and he argued that that uh, is a secondary effect here, and he made the case very strongly that the, here I have imagined a little insect sitting on one of the rocks looking at the other, gravity has been cancelled out by falling freely with it. Another example that Galileo made in his writings, a very nice example, I thought, was in fireworks. You imagine the fireworks going up and the fireworks explodes and you get this lovely spherical array of sparks. As it falls down, it remains a sphere. 
So Galileo was really pointing out that if you fall freely with gravity, you cancel gravity out. And in the bottom picture, I'm showing that with a sort of futuristic space station and the uh, astronaut, despite the Earth being sitting right there, the astronaut locally does not feel the gravitational field. There are subtleties about it which will be felt, but those are not the local. If you might imagine the subtleties that, okay, in the Leaning Tower, you can get rid of gravity at the Leaning Tower, but what about some other tower in the other part of the world where the direction of gravity is different? And you can't really fall freely in all these frames at once. So you have to go to Einstein's general theory of relativity to make sense of this idea. But the basic idea is that, that's the principle of equivalence. And I, some years ago, produced this argument, which I won't go into this because it's a bit too technical, but just let me give you a rough idea. The rough idea is that suppose you are trying to do, consider an experiment on the tabletop, where you're trying to do a quantum experiment. Now, what a normal quantum physicist would do would be to construct a thing called a Hamiltonian, and then you plug away doing your Schrodinger equation and you just work out your quantum physics. Now, suppose you want to take into consideration the Earth's gravitational field. Okay, well, what any sensible physicist would do would be to put a term in the Hamiltonian, which accounts for the gravitational field of the Earth, and just chug away like any other field. Now, here's the catch. Because suppose you take into consideration the foundational principle of general relativity of Einstein's general theory, which is yeah, the Galileo principle of equivalence. That is to say, you can get rid of gravity by falling freely with it. Let's take that principle now as fundamental, as Einstein is doing. Now you say, well, we don't put a term in the Hamilton for, for the gravitational field. Instead, we use coordinates which are feel falling freely. So you simply use a different system of coordinates. You simply use those which are falling freely. I think those are the purple ones and the green ones are the, and the Newtonian ones. So the green coordinates are the Newtonian ones. You think of it as the gravity is just another force. And the Einsteinian ones, I think the purple ones, and that is considering, no, it's not a force. You can get rid of it by falling freely. Okay, you chug away, do a little calculation, and what you find is that the two wave functions are almost the same. When I say almost, it's this equation written down in the middle here. Again, I, you'd have to know about quantum mechanics to say what this means. I don't really want to talk about that, but what I do want to talk about is the almost. The almost is that you have this exponential term outside the whole expression, which is different in the two cases. And what I want to say is that although that's different, it doesn't make any difference when you make measurements and things like that, because when you make a measurement, you do a thing called squaring the modulus and that thing disappears. So you say, who cares? But then you look more carefully at it and you say, well, actually, if you're doing quantum field theory, you should be looking at what the vacuum state is, and the vacuum state is actually different in these two descriptions. But then what you say, oh, well, you use, with the, as long as you stick to the right vacuum, it doesn't make any difference. So, okay, you say, who cares again? So you can say, who cares for this? Maybe it's different, but who cares? Now I want to change the situation a bit. I'm changing it to say, okay, in this experiment, I'm not worrying so much about the Earth's gravitational field, but I've got a body which is put into a superposition of two places at once. And that's indicated by this blue spot and the, and the brown one. And these are two locations of this blue lump or brown lump. They, they could be in blue location or brown location. And according to quantum mechanics, they could be <clears throat> in a superposition of two places at once. And then you're in trouble. Because if you want to use the Einsteinian perspective, you have to try and get rid of its field by falling freely with it, which you can't do because your, your direction of gravity for that lump is, is different as you go around, the, go around the lump. So you have to do something clever. And what I'm doing is not to do anything clever because I don't know what to do. In fact, there's no way known to me, or I think to anybody else, of treating this problem according to the Einsteinian perspective. But what you can do is to try and estimate <clears throat> you try and do it using the Einsteinian perspective, and you notice that there's a certain, um, you sort of cheat a little bit, and you sort of measure the magnitude of your cheating, and the magnitude of the cheating comes out 
to be a certain energy uncertainty to the whole system. So what you can say, that the energy of the superposition <clears throat> has a certain uncertainty. <clears throat> and this is the quantity which you see tucked over into the corner at the right, E sub G, called EG, and that is an energy uncertainty according to the Einsteinian perspective, treating gravity according to the Einsteinian perspective, you have a certain uncertainty in the energy of a system. Okay, I want to move to the next slide. What it leads you to is what's called the Dioshi, well, some people call it the Dioshi Penrose uh, lifetime of a system. If you have a superposition, then it will, uh, that superposition will decay to one or the other in a certain lifetime. And this is what Stuart Hameroff and I, you see, the idea is that consciousness, you see, there's a lot of view that people have that somehow that somebody coming and looking at your quantum system is what makes it go into the lump being in one place or the other is because somebody looks at it or something like that, that you measure it. Now, what does measuring mean? Measuring means you wheel out of the cupboard your measuring device, measure it, wheel the device back into the cupboard. Now I'm saying wheel it out of the cupboard because you don't want to talk about that quantum mechanically. If you talk about the measuring device quantum mechanically, you're not, you haven't got out of the problem because it's measuring A or measuring B is in superposition. And so it's still in superposition. It doesn't, hasn't done a damn thing. So somehow something breaks this superposition. Now, is it the person observing the dial on the screen, which says, okay, it's gone one way or the other. Some people used to believe this. And Wigner is a very strong proponent of this. I think von Neumann also. And they, I talked to Wigner about it. And I, he wasn't such a dogmatic believer in this, but he thought it was an idea which, which should be pursued. And I think that's true. However, I think it, you, it doesn't stand up to contemplation. I won't go into that unless anybody asks me. I think it really doesn't work. So it's not that the conscious being is what collapses the state. But I'm arguing it's the other way around. That it's the collapsing, collapsing of the state somehow in the brain somewhere is, uh, is what is producing consciousness. So it's that consciousness depends on the collapse of the state, not that the consciousness produces the collapse of the state. And the view here is that we need to find somewhere in physics that is non, that is non computational. And the only place by sort of the principle of elimination that I can see is in the collapse of the wave function. So you've got to make a sensible theory of the collapse of the wave function. And this is what I was trying to do in the previous slide. And it leads you to this Dioshi. I'm calling it Dioshi timescale because he produced it a couple of years earlier than I did. I came to it independently, but learned afterwards that he'd done it before. So that is this measure of the lifetime of a superposition how long does it take? Now, I should mention as a sort of side issue that recently people have done experiments to try and test this, what they call the Dioshi Penrose model. Now, the thing is that what they test is what I'm calling the Dioshi model. Why I'm saying that is that I don't believe. Well, what is it that I don't believe? You see, when you have a complicated body, you could imagine that this body all the time is reaching this criteria. It's not in a controlled way. But all the time, there will be enough movement just due to random motions and heating so that bits of the system will reach this criteria and so it will collapse. Now, when it does that, and I'm quite happy with that, that will happen. When it does this collapse, it will jump from the superposed state to the collapsed state. And this jump will be like a heating. There will be a sort of jumping of the particle motions in the system, which will be a spontaneous heating. And so the experiments that have been performed are testing that heating. Now, when I heard about this heating, I didn't think I believed it. Let me come to that later, because that's a very crucial point. The point is that, that I'm making first is that these experiments don't show the heating. They show, OK, the Dioshi Penrose model is wrong because they don't show the spontaneous heating. Well, I, I don't mind so much about the Dioshi model if it says that there is the heating. I say that there shouldn't be the heating. And I want to come to that because the cru crucial aspect of how we use this in consciousness, and I should explain just a little story about this because I described not the heating part, but the collapse idea and the idea that somehow 
that is what produces consciousness. And in writing my book, The Emperor's New Mind, I did my best to understand about neurophysiology and I learned about the Hutch, Hutch, Huxley Hodgkin nerve propagation. And when I learned about nerve propagation, I saw there's not a hope in hell that that can preserve coherence, mainly because as the signal goes along the nerve, it disturbs electric fields, will be transmitted into the environment, and you simply can't control them. And there is no way to preserve the coherence to a level where you could make use of quantum state reduction. So I just didn't see how that makes sense. So I sort of petered off at the end of my book without really having an idea how it works. Fortunately, Stuart Hammeroff read my book and wrote back to me and said, well, you evidently know about these things, which are microtubules. And yes, he was right. I didn't know about them. And I thought, gosh, there's much better chance of preserving coherence here, partly because they're tubes, partly because they are small, partly because they have a lot of symmetry. And these things, for various reasons, which I don't want to go into here, suggested to me that there was a much better chance of pre preserving coherence within or somehow related to these tubes, that they could preserve coherence in a way that does not disturb the environment nearly so much. Maybe you need many, many of these tubes act, acting coherently with each other. I think that's probably correct. It won't be individual microtubules, but it gives a different slant on what could be going on in the brain. And so this was the viewpoint which we started to develop to develop and produce what we call the ORC OR scheme. OR stands for objective reduction of the state. So it does take the view that the quantum state reduction or quantum collapse of the wave function, they mean the same thing. State reduction is a slightly more polite way of saying collapse of the wave function. State reduction is a physical process, which in itself has nothing to do with consciousness, you could say. It's happening all the time in inanimate beings. That's why we see a more or less classical world. The collapse of the wave functions collapses the state into something nearly classical, and this is happening all the time. That's why we get away with classical physics. Nothing to do directly with consciousness. However, the, the idea is that when you have structures like this are sufficiently well orchestrated, so they're together in a way which makes them cohere with each other in a suitable way, which we don't fully understand, that that way will produce consciousness. So that is the argument that underlies the ORCO uh, proposal. In these recent experiments, it does appear that there is a relationship between general anesthetics and microtubules and maybe quantum <coughs> effects. I don't want to go into this, but there is now beginning to see, appear some sort of relationship. It needs a lot more work. I want just to, to talk briefly about the theory here. And here is a main part about it. I here I have a sp space-time picture Time is going up the picture. I'm imagining a lump of material that's line at the bottom going vertically upwards is the world line of a lump of material. That lump of material is now put into a simple position of two places at once. So as you follow upwards in the picture, it becomes a super, well, it's a dotted line. Somehow the reality of it is, is shared by these two, lo two locations. So the line bifurcates into two up to a certain point when the Deoshi Penrose or Deoshi criterion for collapse comes in and then it becomes one or the other. So that then the line continues with, in this case, with Q star rather than Q, and this is what happens in the world. <coughs> now you see this picture of having the thing becoming one or the other is not relativistically invariant. That is to say, if you don't draw it according to an observer where the unit of the moment of time would be a horizontal line across the picture. You say, what is time zero? You draw a horizontal line across the picture. What is time one a little bit later, time two a little bit later? That means your horizontal line is a horizontal line across the picture, up and up and up and up. But if you have relativity and somebody is describing the same situation with regard to a frame which is moving very, very fast according to this description, then these lines will be tilted. And so the tilted lines you see here are according to an observer um, S or an observer T, who is using a different frame of reference, in which case what simultaneity means 
is not the same for each of them. And for one of them, the collapse takes place. Um, you see, you can't just say one of the lines disappears because it, you, to one of them, they'll be, both be there at once for one observer at the same time as one has become the entire reality. It doesn't make any sense. And the other one, they've both disappeared in one of them. You just follow it through. And to those two observers, it just doesn't make any sense. The superposition is still there at the same time as one of them has become the reality. So in order to make sense of this picture, I'm cutting a long story rather short here. The only way of making sense of it is to go back to say that the reality actually is as though it was starting at the point O all the time. And to make sense of this, you really have to talk about Einstein's notion of reality and another notion of reality, which is, let me, talk about, I, I well, let me not talk about that picture so much, but go to this one. What's the difference between these two types of reality? Well, they have a different type of ontology. Classical reality, you can ask of a system, what is your state? So I can take an object like this pill container, I don't know if you can see it, and I can say, what shape are you? And it can say, I'm a cylind cylindrical shape, the top of me is like a circle and so on. Oh, fine. You can ask it that, it can tell you what it is like. That's what classical reality is like. Quantum reality, you can't do that. There's no way of asking what's your state like. And one of the, well, uh, spin is a good example. Those of, you, those of you who know about spin would know the sort of thing. But you might have a good theory which says, okay, your state by now ought to be X. I worked out, knowing what your state was earlier, I can say using the Schrodinger equation, by now your state ought to be X. I haven't asked you yet. Now I'm going to ask you, is your state X? And if the state system really state is X, it will say, yep, you've got it right every time. You can repeat the experiment many, many times. Every single time it will say, yep, that's correct. So that gives you an idea of reality. That is the Einsteinian notion of quantum reality. But if you can check up on it and always get the answer, yes, you got it right, then that gives it a reality. Now that is quantum reality. And the key point about this is that quantum reality is not quite the same as classical reality. It is a kind of reality. It has curious features which can be explored. I'm not gonna go into that, <coughs> but I really just want to talk about this picture here, which is my cartoon of a ex quantum experiment. The bottom of the picture, you see a laser firing out a photon. This photon encounters a beam splitter or half silvered mirror. That means that the photon is state is split into going through horizontally or being deflected downwards, um, vertically downwards. So the, the photon state is the superposition of being horizontally moving or downward moving. If it's horizontally moving, it hits this lump. The lump starts to move by the impact. And now I've got the time moving up, you know, time arrow moving up the picture and uh, Deformation of the space time is this little uh, um, deformation of that sheet, which is representing space time. The presence of the lump slightly deforms the space time. Now, as you move upwards, the quantum state will this be the superposition. And I've got the quantum reality indicated at the left. Yes, it says the state is the superposition. When the Dioshi criterion comes in and it becomes one or the other, okay. The quantum reality says, yes, it's become one or the other. What about the classical reality? It goes right back to the vivification point and it says all the time it was the left-hand branch. So the classical reality is in a certain sense retroactive. It goes back to the branching point and it says, no, all the time I was on the left-hand branch. I'm sorry, that's where I was all the time. Even though later on you somehow thought you'd be making the decision or whatever it was, or seeing the decision or whatever quantum theory does or whatever consciousness does. And the idea is that it makes it the left-hand branch, but it's as though it was there all the time. Now, how does this relate to the limit experiment? Well, it's a very interesting question. I think it does. And it does give you the only explanation I've ever seen about the limit experiment which is to say more or less, as I said in the Empress New Mind, but without enough confidence, that the perception of the finger stimulation is not actually felt until later. 
Now you might say, well, the, the patient has looked at the clock and said where the hand is, and so I know when it was. No, it wasn't, because the where the hand was is also displaced by, say, half a second. I mean, it means it all, may not be always half a second, but let's say half a second. If the actual sensation doesn't come about until half a second later, and then the clock is also registering half a second later, then that is consistent with this picture, because the patient has not actually felt it yet. Now you might ask all sorts of things. I do worry about these things. How, how do you play ping pong? You say I used to play ping pong. How does Roger Federer hit the tennis ball fast enough so at the very last minute he decides to send it cross court or down the line because he's looked at the opponent and he said, no, and it's much more pref preferable to send it one way or the other. And that's much, much less than half a second. So he makes this decision to send it one way or the other, and that maybe fools the opponent or something. But anyway, this decision, what people say in, in neurophysiology, they say, oh no, all these decisions are unconscious. That, that if they're much too fast, and you could, wouldn't have time for the nerve signals to go around and actually produce the effect, and although you think you're making this, when I'm playing ping pong or whatever it is, I think I'm hitting the ball one way or the other, the conscious decision. No, you're not. It's all programmed into your mind unconsciously, and it's an illusion of some kind. What an illusion means, I'm never quite clear. An illusion that you made the decision consciously. I don't think that's correct. I think you really are making the decision consciously, and the catch is there has to be something in the brain which keeps these two alternatives there. And so when you make the decision, the the alternatives are somehow coded in superposition, somewhere probably in the brain and not as far as the muscle, I really don't know. It's very intriguing because Stuart Hameroff has the view that these are in the pyramidal cells. I like this idea because pyramidal cells, not that I know much about the neurophysiology, but I like the idea because pyramidal cells are not present in the cerebellum. And it's all been, always been a big puzzle to me why the cerebellum is not conscious. It seems to be entirely unconscious and it can act very fast, but it's not conscious. How is it that the conscious action is in cells? Now, Stuart says they're in the, in the pyramidal cells, and these have a very different arrangement of microtubules and things like this, which you don't find in other cells. I mean, he says this is important in conscious decision, but you might say, well, to get to these pyramidal cells, it's far too late. But if the choice of which thing to do is already in quantum superposition, <clears throat> then by this retroactive aspect of the state reduction of the quantum state, you can make it as though to the decisions to be made earlier. It's an extremely intriguing idea, a very <laughs> puzzling, whether it can really be the explanation, I don't know, but according to the scheme, it's where we are led in this really curious set of considerations which I'm putting before you, and I would be very interested if people have questions about this. Thank you very much. How do I get back to the people? <laughs> Anybody with uh, questions, please? Yeah. You can come, maybe it's better come here. So maybe you can sit down. There we are. Thank you. You can leave that thing here, too. Yeah. As long as I can see them. <laughs> okay. Hey. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, the microphone is on. Now? Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Can you okay. hear me? Yes. You can. Yes. Okay. Good. Fine. Uh, kind of two, Twofold question. Uh, okay. Uh, about the kernel incompleteness. Yes. And I kind of understood it that, uh, well, let's put it this way. There is a, a theorem prover or proof assistant, and the Gödel incompleteness theorem has been proved in that system. So in that sense, it is kind of computable 
because it's already already implemented in the proof assistant. So, what do you think? Can I answer? That? Is that all right? Can I give my answer now? Is that all right? Or you? Or is there more to the question? The question is that you said that the. Yes. No, no, I heard the question. I just wanted to make sure that I've got the whole question. No, the, this is not the where the view I'm saying is that to understand, this is the whole point, you see, to understand why the Gödel statement is actually true, and this is a true about numbers, there's nothing about system A or system B or anything like that. To understand why it's true, you have to go outside the system. So what it's telling us that the Gödel is the, the actual encoding of our understanding that's claimed, you see, you could put some of our understanding into the into the system, and that is encoded in the system. But the Gödel statement is showing you that why we see it's true is not within the system. We, can, we our understanding is not constrained to be within any logical system. That's that's the argument. So it's not, it's not, uh, uh, the questioner, I think, is trying to say if it's within the system and the, something like that. But it's not, in, that's the whole point. The, the way that the Gödel statement works is that you understand it by using ordinary language. You say, the statement says, it, I mean, it doesn't say in words in English, you see, but you understand what it's actually saying in terms of understanding what the rules mean. You have to know what the, why the rules, what they mean is important. You understand what they mean, and what this statement then means is, I am not provable using the rules. Now, the statement does not, doesn't understand anything, it's just a statement. But we, using our understandings, not by using the rule following, that's the whole point. We don't use the rules following to understand why it's true. We understand why Gödel's st statement is true by using our understanding. And the claim is our understanding is not following any algorithm. And then the next statement is, cannot be any algorithm that we know about or we that's where the good stuff thing comes in so that's the point i'm trying to make uh, my question was that if we extend the system somehow to oh, sure. the understanding why would yeah. it that, is that possible and why oh not? yeah well people do that all the time <laughs> yes of course you say okay well this the system isn't big enough we put the girdle statement in we know it's true so it's okay uh, and logicians do that all the time. Yes, you can form a, a, no, a more inclusive system which goes beyond the one you started with. And that is true. But then you can girdleize that and you say, okay, that doesn't include the girdle theorem from that extended system. And then, okay, that's not enough to, okay, well, we've got to girdleize that. And you might do that even for all n. You say, okay, for all n, you can girdleize for, and then you say, well, what about girdleizing that? Sure, you do. Now, that's the whole point. But, but our understanding, lets us transcend any one of these formalizations of understanding. So the claim is that you cannot formalize understanding. Okay. Then a question about the consciousness. Okay. Okay. Let's assume we have a neuron or we have this uh, model of neuron that's yes. an electrochemical process. And then there are below that there are some quantum processes. If we are able to explain consciousness in terms of the uh, electrochemical process, why would we need something, something, uh, more, something more below there? Why would we need yeah, uh, quantum, yeah. quantum processes to explain consciousness? Well, because the, the argument I was making is that you need something beyond I mean, all these things are computable. You see, if the argument is if you're trying to make a system which can understand whatever understanding means, but you see the Gödel argument shows that what understanding means is something which includes appreciating Gödel's statement. Now you see, okay, there's a lot of intricate stuff in doing that in detail, but the key point is the understanding why, you know, I mean, if you want to follow the Gödel argument, you really have to go into detail. And I'm not trying to make people do that. In fact, I, it's very tedious. But the point is that this is not beyond our understanding. We can see why that's true. I mean, it's, it's hard work if you want to go through the Gödel thing directly. And there are better ways of doing it in the sense of directly getting to what our understanding comes in. 
But the argument is that that cannot be done by ordinary chemical processes and so on. I should make the point that you need the collapse of the wave function to make quantum mechanics work anyway, because even though, <clears throat> I mean, chemical processes are quantum. So people sort of often talk about, isn't it going a little bit out, of, uh, out on a limb to say that quantum processes are important in consciousness? Can't, can't we get away with ordinary chemical processes? Well, I point out first that ordinary chemical processes are quantum processes, that the whole of chemistry is a quantum system. So that to say anything puzzling about quantum mechanics, well, you, the whole of chemistry is quantum. So you can't really say that. Now, people get used to in their language, they say, oh, we don't count that. Can't chemist, chemistry we understand enough about to say, oh, it's not mysterious quantum. I don't quite understand that argument myself, but there seems to be a view with people generally that you don't count chemistry as mysterious quantum. I don't know why you say that. Okay, well, let's take that view. I want to go beyond that to say that there is something, okay, <clears throat> we now know that there is something going beyond chemistry <clears throat> in photosynthesis and seems to be the case also in bird migration you have effects which seem to go beyond chemistry with regard to quantum effects in the behavior of the world but even the use of chemistry requires the collapse of the wave function <clears throat> so you need to know that process before you can make chemistry produce macroscopic phenomena but people use it without thinking and they're using it not in a way which brings out what I claim is the non-computable aspect of the collapse of the wave function. You've got to have a very sophisticated system which can somehow do this. Now, we don't know yet how, as I claim, conscious beings do this. I think it goes very far down in the life system. I don't think it's just humans. Certainly not. It's certainly not just mammals. Certainly not. Octopus, I would see, is evidently conscious, in my view. So there are many, many structures in biology which go way, way, way back into biology, which, according to the view I'm promoting, must take advantage of not just chemical <laughs> aspects of quantum mechanics, but other aspects of quantum mechanics, which involve the collapse of the wave function. So it must have been advantageous to beings way, way back. And so they took advantage of this in ways that are quite beyond current techniques. I mean, so far, we've never, no experiment has yet been performed which establishes that the collapse of the wave function is in accordance with the Doshi, DOC uh, timescale. So we don't know if that's right yet. There are experiments which have been in progress for many decades yet. There are new ideas for experiments which might be more promising. I would expect that within the next five or 10 years, such experiments will be performed to show yes or no, whether this Dioshi timescale is correct, but it would have to be with the retroactive scheme, not with the heating uh, aspect of this that we, we see is not there. So it has to be something else. But the idea is that life took advantage of this somehow very early and developed this into full-blown consciousness with certain creatures later on, including us. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, Roger, thank you so much for the uh, fascinating talk. I think here at the conference, we're now uh, uh, moving to uh, the lunch break and we thank you and we'll be, we'll be in contact and uh, look forward to further interactions. Thank you so much. Thank you, my pleasure. <laughs> No, somebody's going to make and, this. Uh, let's yeah. let's aim to be back uh, quarter quarter past uh, two two, but uh, but then the uh, you know we'll check if there's queue or anything like that. Then we might start just a little later.
Welcome back. I hope you had good lunch and welcome to this <laughs> afternoon session. We have three talks and I am personally very excited about all of them. So we have philosophers of mind, we have cognitive scientists, and uh, our first speaker uh, is uh, Lana Kühle, and uh, she's from Illinois State University, and she's been working with embodied cognition, bodily self, and interoception, uh, perceptual learning, and subjectivity, to name but a few. And today, her title is Novel Features in Sensory Perception and Embodied Account. Thank you. Uh, first, thank you to Pavo and the organizers uh, for having me. I'm very excited to be here and to share this with you. Uh, so let's get started. So vision has always been the paradigm sense modality in the study of perception. And over the past few decades, we've seen an increasing interest in other exteroceptive senses as well, audition, olfaction, touch, gustation. And more recently, many have begun to look at proprioception's role in perception as well. Now, this ever-broadening view of how perception comes about and is affected by the environment has greatly deepened our understanding, but it remains incomplete. We experience the world with our body. Yes, we use our various sense organs arrayed over our physical form to navigate and engage with the environment, but the body is far more than a placeholder for our sense organs. It itself is alive and dynamic. There is an entire inner, visceral world that we access via interoception. Though we formed the bad habit of ignoring the body itself when studying perception, it has caused us to have a limited view. I'm interested in correcting this bad habit by turning my attention squarely to how our body shapes perception. Though it's clear that the body plays a part in perception, how it shapes perception and what exactly it contributes have yet to be fully worked out. My goal here today is to begin teasing out the details of these contributions. My claims, which will also serve as the structure for this talk, are as follows. First, perceptual experience is an embodied phenomenon. By embodied, I mean that the body is constitutive of our perceptual experience. And I see this constitutive relation reflected in interoception's role in multisensory integration. Second, <clears throat> the body's involvement in the perceptual process brings about two novel features to our perceptual experiences, what I will call meaningful contextualization and the tone of embodiment. I propose that interoception is always involved in the multisensory integration process and is thereby part of every perceptual experience that we have. In the end, we are embodied perceivers, and so the body must no longer be ignored. Let me preface by stating that I endorse an embodied mind approach to consciousness, if this was not yet obvious. Um, and so I do take the body to be constitutive of consciousness. One cannot fully understand or explain consciousness or any part thereof without including the body. The body is not merely a vehicle for the brain. Rather, consciousness is a bodily phenomenon. Here, I focus on perceptual experience, but I take the account that I'm about to propose to apply to other aspects of our conscious mental lives as well, such as cognition. Now, turning to perceptual experience, let's look a little bit at what I mean or what is interoception. The definition of interoception has changed over the past hundred or so years since it was first introduced by Sherrington in 1906. Now, when he first proposed it, it referred to the senses that conveyed information and helped set the parameters of the internal states of the organism. It was used to demarcate what's sensed from the inner body from what's sensed from the outside world. In short, it was taken to meant visceroception. Now, this definition has since been deemed too narrow and has been broadened. More recently, it's been redefined as, and I quote here, the processes by which an organism senses, interprets, integrates, and regulates signals from within itself. Importantly, this broadened definition includes the emotional and cognitive contributions to and from our internal bodily states and regulation. Interoception is a bi-directional dynamic process. 
There are a number of different types of receptors throughout the body, as well as two major ascending pathways that come together in the insular cortex, which is now often called the interoceptive brain area. I'm not going to go into further detail about the biological here. Now, as is to be expected, most of the work on interoception has been done in the neurosciences and in psychology. Frédéric de Vignemont makes a very useful distinction between three levels of analysis that we see in interoceptive research. First is the physiological level, which focuses on interoceptive signals originating from internal organs. Second is the introspective level, which focuses on studying interoceptive accuracy, so for example, heartbeat counting tasks. Interoceptive sensibility, which focuses on one's confidence in one's accuracy, and interoceptive awareness, which looks at the relationship between accuracy and sensibility. And then the third is the phenomenological level, which focuses on interoceptive sensations, so for example, when you have a full bladder, or interoceptive feelings, like feeling hungry. Now, one can quickly see that most of the work done so far has focused on the physiological or the introspective levels, leaving little understanding of the phenomenological level. My considerations here focus on the phenomenological level of analysis. More specifically, I'm interested in how what de Vignemont distinguishes as interoceptive sensations and interoceptive feelings shape our perceptual experience. So a bit more then about these two concepts. Interoceptive sensations are things like our heart beating quickly, our bladder being full, our stomach being full. They are sensations that, and I quote de Vignemont here, inform us about the state of our internal organs. De Vignemont calls these indirect or impure because they involve more than just interoceptive signals. They involve other non-interoceptive sensations. So, for example, when your stomach is full, there's a tactile element um, involved. Your skin is stretched. Interoceptive feelings, on the other hand, and I quote again de Vignemont, inform us about the welfare of the organism as a whole. They are states such as fatigue, hunger, thirst. So whereas interoceptive sensations are more narrow and inform us about particular states of the body, interoceptive feelings are more holistic and give a more global view of the body. As de Vignemont explains it, I quote her here again, their role is not to attract attention to a specific part of the body, but rather to adjust one's behavior to reinstate the internal equilibrium that has been disturbed. I take interoceptive feelings to include the bodily aspects of emotions and moods as well. So following James and Lang, Craig, Damasio, Prince, and many others, I take emotions and moods to involve a bodily element in addition to the cognitive and behavioral elements. <clears throat> so for example, when I'm angry, there's this cognitive aspect where I can identify my mental state as one of anger, um, there might be a behavioral aspect as well, where I might yell and gesticulate in an aggressive way. But I also experience a cascade of bodily changes, the bodily element, where my heart beats faster, my face flushes, my body tenses, it gets warmer, and so on. These bodily changes are part and parcel of the emotion experience, and some might even argue the most fundamental part. Each emotion and mood consists in large part of these sequences of bodily changes. Emotions and moods are not reducible to any such bodily change, but rather it is the combination of the bodily changes that constitute a holistic bodily feeling, an interoceptive feeling. I claim that all perceptual experience is shaped in part by interoceptive sensations and or feelings. These are ever-present in the multisensory integration process that generates our perceptual experience. Our body is a living, ever-changing organism, after all. And so let me say a little bit more about multisensory integration and then explain how I see interoception being present in this process. For ease of discussion, I'm going to assume a representational view of perception, um, but nothing that I say hinges on this. 
The content of, the, of perception is the content that is represented in a perceptual state, usually as a result of sensory interaction with the environment. It's the way that the environment is perceptually represented as being. The content of perception is typically complex and influenced in a number of ways. Broadly speaking, there are two ways in which it is influenced, non-perceptually and perceptually. The paradigmatic form of a non-perceptual influence is cognitive penetration, and the paradigmatic form of perceptual influence on the content is multisensory integration. For a long time, the prevailing view of perception, as most of you know, I'm sure, was that it was unisensory. Not that we experience from a single modality at a time, but that each modality generates its own perceptual content, and that these come together to occur co-consciously, causing complex sensory perception. Perception, in short, is modality-specific. Now, giving an account of how perception works in each modality would thereby give us a complete account of perception. Recent work in neuroscience and interesting experiential cases have put pressure on this view. Perception appears to involve more than just different senses working alongside each other. Instead, cases like the McGurk effect, ventriloquism effect, parchment skin effect, rubber hand illusion, and so on, push us towards a multi-sensory view of perception. So multi-sensory perception involves a representational integration across different sense modalities. Importantly, what each sense brings to the table may differ from what ends up being experienced. And that's because the sensory information is integrated. The experience associated with one sense is shaped by input from another sense. And thus, the sensory information is not merely co-consciously presented. The integration is not simply the collection of multisensory content, but the creation of one multimodal representation. So take, for example, the McGurk effect, which I'm sure many of you know, but let's just quickly review it. You perceive a video of someone mouthing ga, along with a soundtrack playing the sound of ba. When you are presented with both of these simultaneously, you'll experience the person as saying da. However, if you perceived each of these inputs separately, just the video or just the audio, you'd perceive either ga or ba, respectively. Quoting Bain and Spence here, the response produced by both of the senses differs from that which would have occurred had the two stimuli not been presented together. So if perception were unisensory, then we should have a co-conscious, simultaneous experience of ga and ba. But this is not what happens. Indeed, the experience is of an entirely different sound, da. There is no da in either the auditory or visual stimuli. Da arises out of the combined experience of both the visual and auditory stimuli. So the conclusion is that this is due to multisensory integration, and that the integration of multisensory stimuli brings forth new elements in the perceptual content. Again, as Bain and Spence put it, in multisensory integration, the processing of input in one or more sensory modalities is sensitive in content-respecting ways to information about stimuli that have been registered in another sensory modality. Now, the argument of multisensory integration relies on drawing a phenomenal contrast. There is a phenomenal difference between what the content of perception would be in each individual sense and what it is in the integrated experience. So a phenomenal contrast argument might run as follows. If the perceptual content of a multisensory experience cannot be fully reduced and explained by the perceptual content of each participating sense modality, then there is something in addition to what each sense brings to the table that produces the multisensory content of the experience. The addition must be the results of the integration of the sensory stimuli. So as Casey O'Callaghan explains it, the lesson here is the following. When you have consciously perceptible feature instances and feature types that could not be perceptually experienced through the use of individual sense modalities working on their own or simply in parallel, then this can only be explained by perception being richly multimodally integrated. 
So let me now see how I take interoception to part multisensory integration process. I'll run a phenomenal contrast argument. Consider the following cases. It's mid-afternoon, and I'm at my office. I'm sitting at my desk, responding to email on my computer. I have a cup of coffee by my side, some light jazz music playing in the back room, rap background. In this moment, I'm feeling calm, rested, comfortable, sated. All is well. I'm in a good place. My computer screen's brightness and colors are as usual. The sound of the jazz is in the background of my attention, as is the smell of the coffee. Let's call this the good case. Okay. Now contrast this with the following alternative. It's mid-afternoon. I'm sitting at the office, at my desk, responding to email on my computer. I have a cup of coffee by my side, light jazz music playing in the background. But in this moment, I'm hungry. Which has caused me to have a migraine. I'm tense, irritable, very uncomfortable. All is not well. I am not in a good place. My computer screen is painful to look at. The screen's brightness is disturbingly bright, brighter than usual, though I haven't changed any settings. I even see the text on the screen is slightly distorted. The music is grating and loud. The smell of the coffee is particularly poignant, intense, and pungent and unpleasant. The back of the chair has become obvious as it presses against my upper back. All sensory stimuli is heightened in a way that's negative, bothersome, problematic. Let's call this the migraine case. So let's assume in both cases that there's no difference in attention. I'm attending to the same thing. No difference in the external conditions. No difference in my sensory organs. No difference in the stimuli coming in from the environment. Um, and the difference that there is in the perceptual experience cannot be explained by looking at each individual contributing sense modality. So I'm sitting in the same position relative to the computer, the desk, and so on. I'm attending to the exact same email, but there's clearly a difference, right? The difference lies in the state of my body in each scenario. Clearly, in the good case, the interoceptive contributions are very different from those in the migraine case. But to be clear, it's not just that the state of my body is represented differently in each case's perceptual experience. What's of importance here is that all the other aspects of the perceptual experience are also altered. The entire perceptual content changes because my bodily status is different, and yet the sensory stimuli from the environment stays the same. So, for simplicity, let's focus on two elements of this perceptual experience: the visual and the interoceptive. There's clearly a phenomenal contrast between both cases. In migraine case, I perceive the computer's screen as brighter, blinding even. It causes me to squint, turn away. I have trouble focusing on the words on the screen. In the good case, I perceive the screen as having normal brightness. It's not bothersome. It's not even noticeable in any meaningful way. In each of these cases, the visual stimuli are perceived differently. That's to say, the environmental input of light, color, and sharpness on the rods and cones of the eye are the same. But the perceptual experience varies in that the brightness is experienced as higher in migraine case. I don't see the screen objectively and then interpret it consciously to be one way or another, depending on the current state of my body. Rather, the moment I perceive the screen, it's experienced as having a phenomenal characteristic of being brighter in the migraine case than it is in the good case. It is an immediate difference in the content of experience, and one that produces a phenomenal difference. Among all the contributing factors to the content of experience in each of these cases, there is one that varies between migraine case and good case, and that's the bodily conditions. These are the only differing contributing factors. So, as noted, the phenomenal contrast argument holds that if two perceptual experiences differ, and the difference is not explained by looking at each individual contributing sense modality in turn, or by a difference in attention, external conditions, or sensory organs, then you have a genuine instance of influence. In migraine case and good case, my attention, sense organs, and external conditions are all the same. Yet my perceptual experience differs. 
The only difference stems from interoception. So we must grant that interoception is a contributing factor and part of the multisensory integration process. Further, the difference isn't simply a difference in interoceptive contributions, but in the perceptual content itself. Interoception alters our perceptual experience. <clears throat> now, if you're not convinced by my theoretical analysis, there is growing empirical evidence supporting this conclusion as well. So, just to kind of go through a few examples, depression causes alterations in sensory perception on many levels. In a 2010 study by, I pronounce it bubble, and all, I, I don't know if that's the right way of pronouncing this name. Um, they show that depression leads to visual alterations, in particular to a significant reduction in contrast gain, which correlates with subjective reports that when one is depressed, everything looks gray or darker. Depression has also been shown to alter auditory perception and touch perception. Beyond depression, anxiety has been shown to affect color contrast perception, in particular processing along the red-green spectrum. Feelings of love make distilled water taste sweeter, and other emotions and moods have been shown to affect local versus global, global attention. The perception of elements in the environment, so hills appear steeper if you're sad, and reduce the effect of visual illusions. In short, our emotions and moods affect our perceptual experience of the world. They influence the content of our perception. Now, there's also empirical evidence showing that various other bodily states affect how we perceive the world. As Zadra and Clore review, being in a state of thirst will cause you to perceive a glass of water as taller. Being in a state of nicotine craving will cause you to perceive the cigarette as longer. Being in a state of fatigue will cause you to perceive the distance between you and point B as longer, or a hill as steeper. Again, it's clear that interoception, whether it be via interoceptive sensations or interoceptive feelings, is involved in perception via multisensory integration. So, the answer to our question then, is interoceptive and interoception an influence? Clearly is yes. We know and have a wealth of empirical evidence to show that a perceptual stimulus can affect our bodily sensations and feelings. Now it's time to grant the reverse, the effect our body has on our perceptual experience. So this returns us to my first main point. Oh, okay, I'm behind on my clicks. Here we go. Namely that perceptual experience is an embodied phenomenon. The body is intrinsic to perceptual experience via the contributions of interoception to multisensory integration. And these contributions are ever-present, given that there is a continuous array of bodily sensations and feelings ongoing at any given moment. So with good reason to accept that there is a genuine influence by interoception on the content of perception, I want to now explore the next of my claims, which is the body's involvement in perceptual processing brings about novel elements to the perceptual experience. So multisensory perception that includes interoception brings about the following two novel features to perceptual experience, meaningful contextualization and the tone of embodiment. I'll first explain what I mean by each of these, and then I'll show why I take them to be novel perceptual features. So first, meaningful contextualization. Meaningful contextualization is the result of a process wherein the perceptual representation positions the environmental stimuli against the interoceptive stimuli in a particular way. By contributing information about the current states and needs of the body, Interoception adds a necessary context that allows the exteroceptive sensory information to be integrated and represented so as to give meaning to the representational whole in view to motivate action. At root, perception is the mechanism by which an organism interacts with its environment to maintain homeostasis, satisfy needs and desires, and so on. In order for this to happen, the current state needs, desires, and so on of the organism 
must be known in view to correctly motivate action and reaction to one's environment. The perceptual mechanism must represent the organism in relation to the environment. Importantly, such a representation involves information from the environment and from the organism. But it's more than just a correct representation of all the sensory information here. Information has to be interpreted, and this is a loaded term, I, and I'm not trying to use it in a loaded way, I'm just trying to kind of get at what I'm, this process or this move that happens in the processing of the information. So this information has to be interpreted so as to be represented in a meaningful way. Now, this happens in the multi-sensory integration process. Multi-sensory integration generates a perceptual representation that places the external stimuli in the context of the bodily stimuli. The resulting perceptual representation is meaningful to the subject. So it's not just that the content is altered based on the interpretation, rather it's that the representational content is experienced as meaningful. There is a meaningfulness present in the resulting experience. So let's go back to the migraine case to highlight this a bit more. I'm tense, irritable, hungry, I have a migraine. My bodily systems are taxed. When I look at my computer screen, its brightness is exaggerated in a negative way. The words on the screen are blurry, the smell of the coffee is heightened. The status of my body in that moment causes an alteration to how the other sensory stimuli are processed and integrated. But this isn't random. The sensory stimuli are represented in a way that makes sense given the status of the body. I need to take certain action. I must resolve my need for food, energy, and ease my migraine, my pain. Other aspects of the environment aren't conducive to those ends. Sorry, other aspects of the environment that are not conducive to those ends are not as important. So therefore, the visual stimuli are represented as brighter, but it's not just that the computer screen is brighter, it's also that the brightness combined with the other aspects of the experience has a negative valence. It pushes me to turn away, maybe put on my sunglasses or turn off the screen. So the brightness is not only altered, but given a certain meaning. The point is that our perceptual experience is not a direct representation of the external stimuli as picked up by our senses. Sensory stimuli are interpreted, they are represented within a context that is provided by interoception, and so thereby given a certain meaning to motivate a specific action. Now, this is reflected in our perceptual experience. We perceive the world not as it is objectively, but as it is for us in that moment. Put another way, perceptual experience reflects a lived subjectivity. Okay, so moving on to the tone of embodiment now. My perceptual experience, of course, again, is a complex and holistic event that includes what's presented to me by the external world, what's presented by the internal bodily environment, as well as what, I'll refer to what Drew later here terms it, the lived body. The lived body is both the body as it's experienced and the body as experiencer the object and the subject. As later states it, and I'll quote him here, it is that by which we have an experienced world to begin with. So what this boils down to is the body not only contributes sensory information to the perceptual experience, insofar as it's one more contributing object alongside all the external things that we see in the world or experience of the world, but it also contributes a subjectivity to the perceptual experience. So as I've argued, we're not just perceivers, we are embodied perceivers. Perception does not occur from nowhere or to no one. It involves a perspective, the point of origin from which our senses are positioned in the world, as well as a subjectivity, a subject of experience, a perceiver. The fact that perceptual experience is characterized by a subjectivity by a lack of anonymity, takes on a specific meaning when we acknowledge that perception is an embodied phenomenon. Perception is a bodily process, and the perceiver is a bodily being. Therefore, the subjectivity that qualifies perceptual experience involves this bodily fact. You cannot have perceptual experience without the body being involved. 
there's no such thing as a bodily less perceptual experience in human perceptual consciousness. But the body is present in perceptual experience beyond what it contributes via interoception. The body is present as the lived subject engaging in perception. And this fact is characterized in the perceptual experience as what I call the tone of embodiment. So it's not that the body is represented as an object alongside other objective elements, but rather that the bodily subject is represented by way of an overall quality of lived bodily subjectivity that frames the representational content. We readily acknowledge that perceptual experience involves a what it is likeness. If we also acknowledge that perception is an embodied phenomenon, then we must accept that the what it is likeness includes an embodied quality. The tone of embodiment is what I call this embodied quality. All of our senses are bodily. Further, the inner interoceptive body is constantly active and providing sensory stimuli of various kinds. I'm never not in a particular bodily state or mood or emotion. As a result, there is always a meaningful contextualization that shapes the perceptual representation and a tone of embodiment that characterizes our perceptual experience. Now, why are these novel? Having explained what each of these are, let me now kind of explain to you why I see these as novel features of experience. So I follow Casey O'Callaghan here in holding that, and I quote him, multisensory perception reveals more of the world than any collection of senses working independently. There are a number of novel features that arise from the multisensory integration process, and O'Callaghan looks at a number of them in his most recent book, um, in particular, Flavor and Balance. What makes a feature novel is that it can't be discerned via any single sense alone. Rather, to perceive such features requires the joint use of multiple senses. It requires multisensory perception. Meaningful contextualization and the tone of embodiment meet this criteria. They are features of our multisensory perceptual experience, and yet they are not features that can be discerned by any one single sense. They are novel because they are only discernible through multisensory episodes. And so, if we rightly include interoception into our considerations of perception, then we find that our perceptual experiences are characterized by these two novel features. So, I know I said a lot there. To recap, right, I aim to defend two main claims here. First, that perceptual experience is an embodied phenomenon by virtue of interoception's involvement in multisensory integration. And second, that the body's involvement in perception brings about two novel features, meaningful contextualization and the tone of embodiment. The underlying belief throughout is that we must look at perception as a lived, dynamic, bodily phenomenon. As later so nicely puts it, and I quote him here, sharp distinctions between what would count as visceral or non-visceral, even between the interoceptive and exteroceptive realms blur. We should not allow categories derived from the dissection of corpses and the accumulation of laboratory data, however scientifically useful, to obscure the unities of the lived body in action. So though we may be able to tease apart the various contributing elements to perceptual experience to a degree, at the end of the day, it is an integrated whole involving multiple senses, and the experience is more than the sum of sensory stimuli. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. And now we have uh, questions. Here is the first one. Yes. So, in particular, with like migraines or anxiety or depression, right? I mean, sure, it's a embodied phenomenon, but it also has an effect on like the information processing organs too, right? So, yeah. Like, you know, migraine and all the spreading synaptic depression and anxiety and depression have effects on neurotransmitters and neuromodulators. Do you feel like you need to like go through the cases and rule out that it's the effect? 
I think I understood your question, and if my answer conveys that I have not, then... Um, so I don't think that it's a problem. Um, that a certain, sort of like a migraine state, affects how the information is processed. Is the body affecting the resulting experience via the way that it affects the way the neurons are processing the information? So I guess, I don't see it as a problem, but I'm also wondering if I'm not understanding your question. <laughs> Which would be because they're being affected by the current bodily state. So you're just like arguing against like a dual, say like. Yes. Okay. Oh yes. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm very much trying to um, ground, <laughs> um, as my friend Amber kind of pointed out to me at dinner the other night. I'm very sympathetic to Merleau-Ponty, but I'm trying to ground it okay. in the body and the science and the neurons. So very much, I'm I'm not looking for a dualist view here. I'm trying to cash these really abstract concepts out in something that is more tangible. What I was trying to figure out is like, yeah. what's, the, what's the scope of who you're arguing against, that you're arguing against like this? Oh yeah, yes. So like migraine aura is just more grisly for your will. Yes, exactly, yeah. Thank you, Ben. Whoops, next one there. Uh, thanks for this talk. Uh, so I have a, um, if you can go back to the slide where you listed uh, a number of studies mm -hmm. in support of this view that you are sharing with us. Uh, my question is whether in uh, either one or hopefully all of these studies there is uh, a gender... There we go. Yeah. Bring it up uh, here whether there is a gender-based uh, analysis also. I mean, gender difference analysis. I do not think that they distinguished um, okay. gender when they were analyzing this, but I do think that there will be um, interesting differences there. Gender, age as well. Um, so, depression in a, in a young child might have a different effect than mm -hmm. depression in someone that is much older. I, so my short answer is yet, they have not done it to my knowledge, but I do think that is a very important area that needs to be also further teased out or looked at. But did you have a particular question with regards to? No, no, no. Uh, so I mean, uh, so are you saying that you know that there, are, there is not a gender analysis of this or whether there is, there is but you don't remember the? As far as I can recall, there is not a gender okay, analysis there is in not. these. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, and then uh, you you kind of started saying something about uh, the measurability of of this idea. Uh, do you have a uh, can you elaborate a bit more on that? What whether you can uh, design a set of indicators or whatever to have a kind of measure of this? Yeah. So. To be com put my cards on the table, I'm a philosopher that does zero experimental stuff. <laughs> so, um, but here's, here's what I would like to see. One of the big obstacles with this is that just intercept, I mean, I, I'm using the term interoception, but that includes so many different things going on inside the body. So you can't just say interoception is a sense. Um, there's, there's such a plethora of different receptors and different brain areas involved. So in terms of figuring out a study, we'd have to first get a little bit clearer on kind of separating out maybe one particular receptor type that feeds into one particular brain area and then see how that comes in and feeds into the, the sensory integration with other sensory areas in the cortex. So that is still, I think, we're still a bit of a ways away there just because we haven't even fully teased out what exactly we mean by interoception in terms of the specifics. But I, I would see a study, something more tangible to measure it, something along those lines, where we would kind of isolate a particular element of interoception and then try to kind of follow it through all the way to the, the end product of the perceptual experience. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, interception looks like uh, a way of integrating, integrating together many different senses, right? Yes. So in principle, one, one could imagine uh, to identify other senses more than, I mean, beyond the five that we are taught at, at primary school. Yeah, exactly. And so start from those. I don't know whether there, is, there are works uh, in this direction. I, I'm not in the field, so I'm asking. Yeah, no. Um, well, as far as I can tell, you know. no, they're still trying. So is there work being done on it? Yes. Is there any definitive agreed upon uh, categorizations? No. Um, and I, I agree with you. I, I, I mean, I speak of interception here as this one kind of whole. That's not how I see it. I, I to kind of preview a little bit where I'm going with this, I see interoception as itself an integra integration process of various sensory things going on within the body, which are different in many different ways. The problem is that it's very messy. So like with vision, we can clearly isolate a visual stimuli to a visual organ and, you know, kind of isolate the parts of the cortex that deal with the visual stimuli. When it comes to the inter... In, the inner body, it's not that clean at all. Um, you can't even go, I mean, some try to isolate it by receptor, that doesn't work because it, it's not one single receptor that is kind of responsible for a particular inner bodily contribution to consciousness. So it's still very messy and that taxonomy, it, it needs to be done and is not anywhere near being clear. Yeah, but very good question, thank you. I'm afraid we're running out of time, but we have time for one more question. There were some other questions, but I ask you, there were at least three other questions asked uh, you to ask, Lana, later. But you, welcome. Uh, quick question to wrap it up, if I understood correctly. Your claim is that uh, embodiment is necessary for perception, right? Yes. So, in essence, a brain in a jar of glass would not be able to perceive anything according to your claim. Yes. Yeah. I think that and, makes zero well, sense. Well, the short question is why, because like you list a long list of uh, arguments how interception clearly affects perception, but these are, there are a lot of pretty similar other effects like uh, binocular rivalry, masking effects, which make essentially the same effect, but they are not related to embodiment in any meaningful way. Do you agree? For example, like uh, if we show the subject neutral faces, which are uh, first given subliminal uh, scary pictures of spiders or whatsoever that they are not conscious of, they tend to rate those neutral faces more likely as sad faces. And it's pretty much the same idea as in the examples you have here, but it's not really embodied. So what's the difference? So I, um, I don't mean to turn the question back on you, but I'm a little bit confused because the subject, I mean, you haven't, you haven't taken its brain out and studied just its brain, right? It is, it is a person that you are interacting with and if that subject one day sees a face in one way and the next day comes in and happens to be starving and not slept well or just had their heart broken or whatnot, I mean, that will affect how they see. So I, I don't see how the example you're showing me is an example of a non-embodied subject engaging in those experiments. So how have you... how? How has those experiments isolated and removed the bodily contribution so that you can say what you're studying is something that has zero effect from the body? It's, uh, it's an well, assumption. Well, well, what I meant that in these examples, uh, the distractors come from the body, but uh, in the examples I refer to the distractors, mm, well, they are visual or auditory or something like that, not, not at least at, as clearly related to the Good, okay, so I see what body. you're saying. So I'm not arguing that um, we always are so obviously aware of our body's contributions as in the case of when I have a migraine. 
right? So, you know, I could be sitting down in a symphony hall, completely immersed in the music coming at me, right? And I don't, I'm not consciously aware of any particularly extreme or off bodily state. That doesn't mean that my body is not contributing to my experience in that moment. That just means that the contribution might not be clearly obvious to me in my perceptual experience. But that doesn't, that doesn't say, oh, well, because you can't point out what the body is doing in that particular moment, then you can say there is no body. That's a bit of a leap, I think. Yeah, I, I think, I think I, I, this I is where a we start from different, different thing, starting but point we, we can go on, like. I suggest that you continue yes. the, <laughs> this conversation <laughs> afterward. Okay. Let's thank, thank you, Lana, one more time. Yes, thank you. Okay, so our next speaker uh, is Anna Mari Rosanen from our Bonn University. And uh, this paper is written with uh, Otto Lappi, Jesse Kuokkanen, and Jami Pekkanen, who are not present. Um, so, uh, Anna Mari is a cognitive scientist, has been working with artificial intelligence, algorithms, uh, and lots of other topics in cognitive science. And uh, her title today is. Uh, from fly detectors to action control, representations in reinforcement learning. Welcome, Anspo. Okay, kiitos. Thank you. So, good afternoon, everybody. Hyvää iltapäivää. Okay, so, so, where should I start? To, uh, when I was thinking that, okay, what on earth am I going to talk to this audience? Uh, with a selection of people with background in cognitive science, psychology, philosophy, computer science, and so on. I thought that, okay, this is going to be a challenge. I mean, now I should say something that um, everybody could find as interest, interesting, and at the same time say something sufficiently sharp, so that the philosophers in the audience wouldn't be that disappointed. What a challenge. Okay, but anyway, today I will focus on, on um, some recent papers that I have written together with Otto and Yami and Jesse. And in those papers, our focus is on the recent uh, anti-representational arguments, for example, provided by radical re recent radical N activists, Hatto, me and the colleagues. Uh, for them, the main claim is that uh, or they take action control as a kind of paradigmatic case of a non-representational phenomena. And as we see it, this um, main um, idea is based on two intuitions or presuppositions. First, for many, these, these people who are arguing for the, for the anti-representationalism, action control is actually seen as a kind of low-level perceptual motor control. Second, especially Hatto and Muin and the colleagues, they take representations as primarily, primarily sensory representations as continuing the so-called legacy of lie detectors. Instead, our argument basically is based on two main claims. First, not all action control is low-level perceptual motor, motor control. This is almost trivial. And second, that not all representations are sensory. Well, if the first um, claim was tr almost trivial, this probably is all, this probably is really trivial. Okay. So hey, let's start with the, with a concrete example. This is the typical example utilized by Hatto and Muin and the colleagues, the so-called case of a chased, chasing a swirling leaf. And uh, it isn't very unusual to see uh, they writing, for example, uh, something like acts of perceptual motor or perceptual motor cognition, chasing and grasping a swirling leaf are directed towards worldly objects and states of affairs or aspects thereof, yet without representing them. And for cognitive scientists, this is a very strange idea. I mean, for a cognitive science, scientist, even a relatively simple or a simple-looking example of action can be extremely complicated. 
it isn't easy at all to chase a swirling leaf. And when we were writing this paper, we started to think that, okay, why do these people take these uh, chasings of uh, leaves or, or watching something as examples of this lower level sensory motor control phenomena? Perhaps a kind of automated routine-based action or example of that. Well, the reason we suspect is, is a kind of theoretical and it may, it may have its origins on those early control theoretic models of motor commands that were extremely popular back in 1960 and 70 and 80s. And many of the uh, contemporary um, models of motor, motor uh, control uh, kind of continue the legacy of those models. So even today, many computational approaches, they still estimate mostly the immediate next actions as motor commands and them as sequences of physical movements. And the feedback of learning, and this is the kind of crucial part of this, is the, is the expected sensory feedback of a motor command. This is a kind of approach that is, for example, uh, um, advocated by, by many people who continue to work of Wolbert and Mial and so on. The second uh, reason for, or second intuition is that that uh, somehow, for example, Hatta and Muin, Muin are very famous for, for uh, their um, obsession to equate the sensory representations, to, uh, to equate all representations with sensory representations. Um, they have this um, kind of chain of argument where the idea is to show that, okay, there is, uh, you can't have a proper theory about representations and so on. Um, and the kernel of their claims is the claim that, okay, there is no satisfactory account of representations if they are understood in terms of lie detector, or this is our, our perhaps a main claim. Um, however, uh, as we see it, and as many other people see it, perhaps action control systems and many other uh, systems do not represent as sensory systems do. Okay. So let's start with the first intuition, the idea of, of, of we or robots uh, chasing and grasping swirling leaves. Um, in a nutshell, for a simple organism with uh, a few possible actions and short temporal delays, react reactiveness and directness to the world might suffice, but for a complex organism like we, with multiple possible actions and temporal delays, even a, grasp a grasping or swir swirling leaf is a genuine challenge. It requires at least the integration of information from multiple sources, uh, from vision, touch, kinesthesia, different parts of the body, and so on. So, and it requires also the control of multiple effectors, eyes, limbs, posture. Uh, and if you are going to grasp the leaf, it will require a kind of goal-directed, purposeful, temporal organization of the, of the bodily movements. And this can be extremely challenging because the body and the, and the cognitive system and the motor system must do this all in a synchronized way. Further, the third condition is the one that we have been puzzled the most the one uh, on the cognitive coordination in changing environments. Uh, everything might go well for, for radical N activists and the, for the idea that action control uh, is a kind of um, uh, subspecies of motor control, lower level motor control only, if the environments would uh, stay stable however we live in a changing world. And this means that, for example, when the winter comes, as we all here in Finland know, instead of leaves, we will be changing and grasping the snowflakes. 
And the point is that if the environment changes, then, of course, the appropriate action becomes slightly different. We can utilize the basic same apparatus that we are using when we are trying to grasp the swirling leaf, but snow lakes are different. The dynamics of wind are different. The turbulent behavior of them is different. And therefore, the cognitive system, it must adapt to the changing situations. This means that the agents, they can't rely only on actions that have been effective in the past. Instead, they must plan, predict, adapt, and especially learn novel actions. And this is something that is relatively difficult for many of those classical control theory-based models that are still uh, adopted implicitly by many contemporary uh, models on motor control. They struggle to explain the ability to learn uh, in these types of situations, especially when the environment causes changes to the tasks of the systems. Okay. Uh, nowadays, uh, in cognitive sciences and, and, of course, in artificial intelligence or robotics. This type of cognitive -ish control of action is often studied by utilizing algorithmic methods. One of the most popular ones is, of course, reinforcement learning, which happens to be probably the most, power, most powerful algorithm available uh, as things stand because of its uh, relatively developed learning properties. There, there are perhaps hundreds, thousands, even ten thousands of examples of how these algorithms are used to, to um, model and, and simulate action control in robotics. Those examples, they vary from robotic limbs to, to the so-called animals, robotic animals. But also you can find action model-based um, simulations in, in those applications that predict stock markets, navigate routes in, in autonomous vehicles, try to learn language, and of course those famous examples of, of reinforcement learning playing various games. Okay, uh, so the next uh, the next um, question is that, okay, what is reinforcement learning algorithm and how can it be used to model action control? And what then, in, in the end of this talk, I will ask that, okay, what are the consequences in terms of representations? Okay, so this is a kind of brief summary of the basic ideas of reinforcement learning. And, and um, the most important thing is that all the concepts are technical. Especially philosophers have this obsession that uh, they try to uh, interpret these terms in terms of everyday language. But the in concept of environment here, it refers to the formal description of the world of or for the algorithm, not to the real world. It is the world of the algorithm, not this place. And in some applications, there are also uh, these parts where uh, uh, you can utilize the so-called forward models of the environment or the development of, of forward model of the environment, given that it is a forward model. Okay, action, it doesn't mean walking or talking or eating. Instead, it refers as a technical term to the formally specified steps in the algorithm. And in reinforcement learning, which was originally developed by behaviorists, that's why all the psychologists in the audience will recognize this, this um, type of learning, um, the concept of reward played a very central role. It, the concept of the reward is the measure by which the immediate success of, or failure of an agent actions can be ex estimated. It is not uh, like whipping something or giving somebody uh, something to, to, to um, something positive. Instead, in this context, the reward is a simple numerical scalar, which can be a negative, a punishment, or a posit or positive reward. 
And the value is one of the, also one of the key concepts in reinforcement learning, and it refers to the cumulative expected long-term reward. Uh, that is the amount of uh, reward uh, accumulating in the long term, and which is typically specified by a specific value function. Okay, so what does the algorithm do? Well, the basic idea is that the goal of the, this wonderful algorithm is to detect opportunities for successful action. It is, its goal is not to construct veridical descriptions of the world. It is not a classification or a categorization algorithm or tracking algorithm. It is a learning algorithm. And, and for it, the um, goal of learning is to find uh, opportunity for successful action. And this is defined as the expected, the amount of expected cumulative reward, pleasure, over time in a given environment. Okay, and what does the algorithm do? Well, it learns an optimal action policy that maximizes the expected cumulative reward over time in a, in a particular environment. And the notion of action policy is simply, it refers to the strategy that an agent uses in pursuit of its goals. Okay, and what the system does? Well, the agent learns what to do by exploring the possible actions and by observing the consequences of its actions. So it, it combines the exploration and experiencing in a wonderful way. The, the, algorithms is, the speciality of this algorithm is that it can discover which actions yield the most reward in the long run by trying them out. So it combines those, those, those elements. And this probably explains the, the uh, relative power of those, the relative cognitive power of those algorithms. Okay, so um, let's imagine that the task of, of, of this algorithm or the, on agent would be to learn how to grasp a whirling leaf. What the algorithm does? Well, um, it does, it does whatever it does, it queries the model and receives reward, and on the basis of the reward, it updates its action policy. And if the reward is positive, it strengthens the action policy, and if it's negative, it weakens the policy. Okay, so now let's go back to the challenge, to the question that, okay, what will happen if the environment changes? Well, the appropriate action becomes different. And typically, um, typically this is a very, very difficult uh, challenge for many of the contemporary algorithmic applications. Instead of leap, grasp a snow, snowflake, how on earth the algorithm is able to do that? Well, the speciality of reinforcement learning is, and especially some of its uh, sub-applications, is that it is able to update its action policy by using the so-called forward models when necessary. So it has this really wonderful feature that it can use uh, uh, the kind of predicted descriptions of the development of the algorithm uh, for updating the system. And in this way, um, uh, the system has an ability to allow some, some inferences to be made about the development of the future environment as response not only to the development of the, uh, development of the world, but also to the agent's actions in, a life, in a light of its action policy. And uh, some... Um, some, um, in some models, uh, uh, this has led to the development of the so-called state transition rule, P, uh, which, uh, which gives a kind of formal, formal uh, description for this phenomenon. Okay. Um, the wonderful thing made possible by this structure or this ability is uh, is the ability to, um, 
to uh, find an optimal policy in situations where, where the environment changes by learning and estimating uh, the possible future scenarios on the basis of this um, um, forward model, model um, ability. This kind of gives the depth, conceptual and theoretical depth, to the, to the idea of ex exploration, because it gives the kind of backbone to the way how this algorithm is able to anticipate the success of actions before taking them. And at the same time, the uh, algorithm is able to estimate the success of the executed actions by receiving feedback in terms of rewards and punishments. And these rewards and punishments, they are not only sensory feedback. Instead, they are, they are uh, individuated and specified by the value functions and so on. So they take the behavior of the algorithm and the development of algorithm into account as well. Okay, so this framework is nowadays given a kind of cognitivist and representational interpretation. But the difference is that these representations, given that they refer to something that is not already here, they refer to goals and values and rewards which are in future, they do not represent as traditionally the sensory representations have been taken to representation, represent. And uh, that's why many of those accounts, like the recent N activists' attempts, that clearly continue the legacy of so-called fly detectors, uh, are not able to analyze these representations at all. The fly detector representations, which are, which are uh, uh, the kind of uh, general class of sensory representations, uh, for example, Hato defines them as mental states that are used to represent how things are with the world, external world, this world, and how they are connected with world via sensory contact. And these representations, they are sensory representations because, uh, depending, of course, depending on the theory, the details vary, but, but the idea is that the activation of a detector re representation requires some kind of causal association with pro proceeding stimuli, a kind of neural signal that triggers the representation, or if you happen to advocate the uh, teleosemantic or indicator semantic, for example, uh, that causes the indicator to fire, and so on. But of course, uh, representations that uh, are used by action control systems, they can't be analyzed in terms of sensory representations because they are not sensory representations. They are action control representations. They are not based on neural signals triggering them. Instead, the systems use them to represent how things, how, how, um, what are the expected outcomes of action and not the real world environments. They, represent what the estimated goal of action is or could be and what might the estimated future development of, of an environment be. And therefore, they stand in for possible worlds rather than for, for uh, real world environments. And because of that, they can't be uh, explained by any of those theories that rely on triggering, uh, triggering, um, being triggered by a stimuli or something like that. Uh, the, the reason is simple that in, in, in models like these, the content of a reward is not specified by, by, uh, by a, a triggering reward signal. Instead, it is specified by the reward. Function. Now I'm running out of time, so thank you, P. And I guess that it is time to, time to sum up. So what we are after, we are after a, a kind of analysis of the action control, where the actor, action control would be characterized in this way as a complicated, 
cognitive control of skilled act action and not at the level of low level, level um, motor control. And therefore, we, we try to analyze how these novel algorithmic, well, not novel, but algorithmic met methods uh, handle these systems and the, this type of action control. Okay. So I guess that it is time now to thank you and, and uh, continue. Okay. Hey, kiitos. Thank you very much. So we have time for one or two quick questions. Uh, yes. Thank you, and thanks for um, standing up to the uh, Mayan Hato nonsense. I, I'm glad somebody's taking the time to do that. Um, I, uh, but I wanted to press you on something, um, which you know, when when these these kinds of representations you learn uh, through reinforcement learning, you say they're not really about states of the world. I, you might be right, but I find it ironic because most of the people who are working in uh, in machine learning and reinforcement learning yeah. in particular, they think that their systems only give good results if they somehow manage to form an implicit model of the causal structure of the world. And so they think that the only way that they, we, they, they'll succeed um, is, but is if the model actually somehow recapitulates the entities and causal relations in the world. So do you think they're just wrong about that, that, um, that really you can have a... Uh, the, the representations you learn through reinforcement learning, there is no, uh, you, they can be successful without their be, they're capturing in any way the, the, the entities and causal relations? Yeah. Well, let's, let's take a concrete example. For example, an autonomous vehicle, or, uh, a robot car. Uh, if, you, if you think, uh, think them, they use all kind of radar systems or, and leaders and, and all kind of uh, devices to measure the differences in the environment, right? And then uh, those systems, they kind of get the uh, information from the environment to the system, but then uh, they are, that data is nowadays typically fed into the system that um, utilize the, the sensor fusion technique, and it's, it's uh, given an interpretation in terms of those, those um, subsystems. And then the data, it is uh, utilized by the navigation system that can use reinforcement learning. And of course, if you ask from a programmer that, that is uh, uh, writing the code for a navigation system, that, okay, is your, uh, how crucial it is to have uh, some kind of similarity or sufficient correspond, correspondent between the navigation system of a car and the real world environment, he will say that, of course, it's really important. And the kernel is that it shouldn't happen by magic. But the system, it can uh, receive information from the environment, but it still doesn't necessarily represent them at the level of navigation system. Not all, um, all, not all um, receiving information is not necessarily representational. It can be causal, it can be a form of updating parameters of a system, it can be based on many different types of processes and systems and, and uh, all kinds of architectures and connections of subsystems. And the crucial question is that, okay, if you have a reinforcement learning-based navigation unit in your auto robot car, does it represent the real world or not? One might argue that, okay, it depends on the case. And many of those systems, they do not represent the real world uh, as such. They utilize information about the real world, but they do not necessarily represent. I hope that I understood your question properly. Thank you. So we started a bit late, so let's have the other question. It was behind over there. So can you be very quick? Is, was there a question? 
in the back row. Well, if not, we actually should continue, and uh, if somebody else has questions, let's continue later. But now I welcome our third speaker. Sorry, let's thank Ansko one more time, actually. That's always an important part. Good. So our third and uh, last speaker of this session is our ver very own uh, Christian Loritz, who is also uh, probably familiar to all of you because he is one of the organizers of this conference. So he's from uh, philosophy department from University of Helsinki, and he is a philosopher of mind. And his title uh, today is uh, Perspective-Induced Mystery of Consciousness. Welcome, Christian. Uh, hello. Uh, where is this uh, remote? Uh, Yeah, thank you, P, and uh, hello to everyone. Uh, indeed, I'm a, a theoretical philosopher here uh, at the University of Helsinki, uh, where my current research is funded by the uh, Finnish Cultural Foundation. Uh, and my today's talk is about the famous uh, hard problem of consciousness, and especially about uh, a particular uh, division between two very different responses to the hard problem. So, uh, on the one side we find all kinds of uh, so-called physicalist or reductionist approaches that maintain that the hard problem uh, will be ultimately solved or, or dissolved or somehow overcome uh, within the uh, traditional scientific framework. And on the other side we find, for example, panpsychist approaches or more, genera uh, more generally the approach is uh, maintaining that the hard problem points at the existence of some unique and irreducible element of consciousness that cannot be scientifically explained and uh, should be therefore uh, simply accepted as a uh, fundamental element of reality. And according to David Chalmers, uh, who is the original author of the notion of the hard problem, uh, that uh, problematic and inexplainable uh, aspect is the qualitative aspect of consciousness, uh, like, for example, the uh, distinctive qualitative character of blueness we see when looking at the bright summer sky, or the felt quality of pain. And according to Chalmers, those sensory qualities, or simply qualia, are problematic because um, uh, their content cannot be fully analyzed or, or fully described in structural or functional terms. Uh, and that is a problem, according to Chalmers, because he argues that all objects of science can be analyzed in fully structural and functional terms, at least in principle. Um, like, for example, when we think about uh, explaining some mental or psychological phenomena, then the explanation would usually begin by uh, specifying the thing uh, uh, to be explained in terms of some cognitive functions or behavioral tendencies or behavioral capacities, and then, and then trying to explain those functions or capacities um, in terms of some underlying neurobiological uh, or, or cognitive mechanisms or pro pro uh, processes. But in the case of this qualitative aspect, the thing we would like to explain is not primarily a function or a, a structure, but rather a, a kind of simple and structureless quality, at least so it seems to be. And uh, so Chalmers concludes that therefore this qualitative aspect of consciousness cannot be scientifically explained. And this uh, pessimistic conclusion is one of the main motivations uh, behind many panpsychist approaches. Um, and the basic idea is that, well, if, if that qualitative aspect of consciousness cannot be explained, then why not simply accept it as a, 
fundamental element of reality, uh, just like we accept other fundamental notions, uh, like for, exim uh, for example, mass or charge or spin. Uh, but there is a problem with this approach because it is usually assumed that all human behavior, like the physical movements of our bodies, can be uh, scientifically explained, at least in principle, if not in practice. And that leads to a kind of paradox that was uh, acknowledged by David Chalmers himself, who called it the paradox of phenomenal judgment. And here the basic idea is that, um, well, if indeed our behavior can be scientifically explained, and yet there is also this quali uh, qualitative aspect of consciousness uh, that cannot be uh, scientifically explained, then what about all our behaviorally expressed statements and sentences about the existence of this qualitative aspect? It would seem that if behavior, uh, if behavior is at least in principle scientifically explainable, then also all our uh, behaviorally expressed statements about the existence of this qualitative aspect uh, can, uh, must be uh, scientifically explainable. And that raises the question that how and even in what sense uh, could, uh, so to speak, ordinary and scientifically explainable physical behavioral processes express the existence of the extraordinary and, and inexplainable qualitative aspect. Um, and um, so here is a nice quote from Chalmers himself from his uh, 1996 book, uh, where he says, uh, a physical explanation of behavior can be given that neither appeals to nor implies the existence of the qualitative aspect of consciousness. Uh, when I say in conversation, consciousness is the most mysterious thing there is, that is a behavioral act. When I comment on some particularly intense purple qualia that I'm experiencing, that is a behavioral act. Like all behavioral acts, these are in principle explainable in terms of the internal causal organization of my cognitive system. So here, Chalmers' idea is that, that uh, this, the existence of the qualitative as aspect itself is irrelevant in explaining our statements about this uh, qualitative aspect. And it would also, it seems to imply that, that, that this qualitative aspect has no causal influence on our behavioral expressions about its existence. So it would be a sort of epiphenomenon and it would also mean that all our physically expressed arguments for the existence of this qualitative aspect would be put forward even, this, even if this qualitative aspect did not exist. So that is basically the uh, paradox of phenomenal judgment. And although Chalmers and, and some others have proposed ways to deal with it, uh, there is no generally accepted or, 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 or this kind of like very convincing solution to it. So it would seem that the general situation is such that that the heart problem seems to push us uh, towards panpsychism and other similar approaches. And then this paradox of phenomenal judgment uh, seems to push us towards the opposite direction, like towards reductionism and physicalism. And, and uh, one quite interesting uh, reductionist uh, approach uh, that actually acknowledges the fact that it, uh, that it indeed seems to us that there is this non-structural uh, qualitative aspect of consciousness is called illusionism, but uh, illusionists maintain that that uh, this apparently qualitative uh, non-structural aspect of consciousness is actually structural uh, and uh, functionally ana uh, analyzable, and it merely seems to us that it is not. And there are several differ different ways to support uh, that kind of illusionism. Uh, like, for example, Daniel Dennett has introduced several, uh, so to speak, disillusioning exercises that are supposed to uh, help us recognize some hidden structural components in our uh, apparently uh, qualitative sensory experiences. Like, we may think about the low guitar sound, that is one example from Dennett, that would appear initially just as qualitative and structureless as a a typical color uh, experience. But then with uh, special exercises, the subject can learn to distinguish uh, some individual overtones in that sound 
And as a result, the subject would realize that she was actually mistaken when, when thinking that, that the uh, experience was structureless. And that and other similar examples are supposed to um, kind of help us to accept that we can be mistaken about the nature of our sensory qualities and, and about the fact that, that they seem to be uh, structureless. And of course, from, from the other direction, from the more bottom-up direction, we may think that every theory or hypothesis about the possible uh, structural basis of our um, uh, sensory experiences would support this type of illusionist. Like, for example, Francis Crick and Christoph Koch have proposed that those uh, apparently structureless sensory qualities are uh, vast and complex networks of uh, non-conscious associations. So, for example, uh, my experience of redness uh, or blueness... Uh, uh, oh, I, I went to wrong direction. I'm lost. Yeah. So, mm, so my experience of redness would be composed of uh, different non-conscious associations with red objects like tomatoes, strawberries, blood, sunsets, uh, red traffic lights, and to uh, uh, typical behavioral strategies related to those stereotypical red objects. And um, uh, the beauty of Crick and Koch's proposal is that they also provide a, a neurobiological interpretation of those non-conscious associations. But more generally, we may say that whichever hypothesis about the possible structural or like uh, empirically guided and, and uh, inspired hypothesis about the possible structural basis of our sensory experiences would support this type of illusionism. And then those uh, disillusioning exercises empathized by Dennett should make it easier for, our, for us to accept this uh, uh, structural account of sensory experiences by simply showing us that uh, we can be wrong when we think that those sensory experiences are structureless. Uh, and uh, uh, I think there is a lot of uh, truth in that line of um, that line of uh, um, illusionist reasoning. Uh, but I also think that one thing that goes uh, often unnoticed um, when we talk about that type of illusionism is that um, uh, that um, even if we assume that that uh, sensory experiences or like this uh, apparently um, qualitative and non-structural aspect of consciousness is uh, illusory, it is still quite different than um, many other examples of illusions given by illusionists. So. We may think, uh, for example, the optical illusion uh, where the straight stick that is halfway in water seems to be bent. Also, in, those ca in this case, we may say that we have scientific reasons to believe that the stick is actually not bent. And we also uh, know that in those kind of cases, our immediate perception cannot be trusted. And so illusion is proposed that we should adopt the same kind of attitude towards sensory qualities. Uh, but uh, in the case of, for example, this bent stick illusion, the illusory content itself can be analyzed and described in structural terms. And it also seems that it can be fully deduced or inferred from um, uh, the relevant underlying objective facts, like given the laws of optics and other relevant laws and the position of the stick, position of the water and position of the view, uh, viewer, this uh, illusory content simply uh, falls out. But in the case of um, sensory experiences, uh, this uh, illusory or supposedly illusory content itself cannot be given a precise structural description, which was a big part of the problem to begin with. And so this experience blueness uh, cannot be inferred from some, some, even if it is just an illusion or illusory content, it cannot be inferred from some objective underlying facts in such a 
straightforward and simple way as, as the content of the bent stick illusion. And since it cannot be inferred from any uh, underlying facts, we may say that in this sense it cannot be also reductively explained. And, and now we are again surprisingly close to uh, Chalmers' uh, original pessimistic conclusion, according to which uh, sensory qualities cannot be explained. Uh, but it is important to notice that this does not actually undermine the illusionist approach or, or the illusionist project, because one very natural way to think about illusions is that the, the illusory content is a perspective-induced artifact that has no counterpart uh, in the perspective-independent domain. So when we say that it only seems to us that the stick is bent, what we mean at, is that the stick appears to be bent from our perspective, but there are actually no bent sticks uh, in the uh, perspective-independent domain. Uh, and so uh, we may still hold that uh, those um, apparently non-structural sensory qualities are illusory in that sense, that they are perspective-induced artifacts, and there are actually no non-structural uh, uh, qualities in the perspective-independent domain. And even if uh, such uh, illusory uh, slash perspectivist interpretation does not allow us, uh, strictly speaking, to um, explain sensory qualities, it, it allows us to deal with uh, to deal with them in a way that avoids the, uh, uh, or even solves the paradox of phenomenal judgment, uh, because it is generally accepted that we can observe and talk about all kinds of perspective-induced phenomena, all kinds of perspe perspective-induced content, without assuming that, the, that there is anything like that content in the perspective-independent domain. So we can genuinely observe and talk about um, uh, perspective-induced content of a magic trick, without assuming that there is any real magic uh, in the perspective-independent basis of that trick. And also, uh, it is generally accepted that we can, uh, that, that perspectival phenomena or, or perspectival content does not have any autonomous causal powers. Uh, again, like we can observe and report that uh, uh, the stick in this bent stick illusion appears to be bent, yet uh, there are no bent sticks among the causes of our report. The only stick that somehow contributes causally to our, to our report is actually bent. Um, uh, and that way the paradox of phenomenal judgment is avoided, because if sensory qualities are just perspective-induced artifacts, then it becomes understandable how we can uh, uh, talk about them, how, how we can report them, even if there are no, uh, no non-structural uh, qualities among the causes of our reports. Um, so, in some sense, this perspectivist interpretation aligns very well with the traditional illusionist um, mm. approach, because according to this, there are no uh, structuralist qualities in the perspective-independent reality. There merely seem to be, which means that those apparently qualitative features are just perspective-induced artifacts. But uh, uh, on the other hand, this um, uh, perspectivist interpretation aligns also with some panpsychist intuitions, because indeed, if it is the case that, that uh, scientific explanations require or, or presuppose that the thing to be explained must be structurally or functionally analyzable, then we may, may say that, well, since that uh, qualitative and structuralist illusory content cannot be uh, well, structurally analyzed, therefore it is not like reductively inexplainable. But it's, uh, it is important to notice here that, that, um, mm, uh, that uh, since this, in this case, this um, inexplainable qualitative um, aspect would be uh, just a perspective-induced artifact, there is no reason to try to find a place for it in the perspective-independent domain. And most certainly, there is no reason to try to find a place for it in the domain of uh, fundamental physics uh, among mass, charge, or spin. Uh, rather, it, it fits uh, quite nat uh, naturally among things like, uh, li like uh, among all the other uh, perspective-induced impressions or appearances whose content we fail to analyze in fully structural terms. 
Like for example, we may assume that that properties like uh, cuteness or elegance or um, uh, like charisma uh, can be uh, like our complex properties, complex relational properties that can be analyzed in structural or functional terms in principle. But but uh, usually when we can quite easily recognize when something is cute or when, when something is elegant, we are not usually able to give a uh, like precise uh, and comprehensive structural account of what we mean by cuteness or what we mean by elegance. But in those cases, we are not tempted to propose that, well, since I cannot uh, like say what, like, or articulate in, in precise structural terms what I mean by cuteness, therefore it must be a fundamental property of cute objects. In those cases, we are happy to say that, well, it's probably some complex relational property, and just it seems to me that it is not. And so this perspectivist interpretation kind of allows us to take the same attitude towards sensory qualities. So in a way, this uh, perspectivist version of illusion is, uh, that I'm trying to defend or promote here would uh, allow us to have the cake and to eat it too. In this case, the cake would be uh, the general institution of empirical sciences where we value a maximal precision, precise structural descriptions, um, because we may say that, that the, maximal, the maximally precise description of the perspective independent nature of consciousness can be indeed given in some uh, structural and functional terms in principle, because this apparently non-structural aspect is just a perspective induced artifact, and therefore uh, it is not part of the perspective independent nature of consciousness. Uh, and on the other hand, we may eat the cake uh, uh, with Chalmers and with palm psychists by admitting that, yeah, indeed, in this sense that this uh, illusory content or this perspective-induced artifact cannot be described in fully structural terms. It cannot be, it cannot be uh, reductively explained. But that is not a problem for science, because in, in scientific context, it can be just brushed off as, a, as an impression or, or just an illusion or appearance uh, that has no autonomous causal powers, has no place in our maximally, price, uh, maximally precise descriptions or, uh, or in our uh, maximally accurate uh, predictions. But the fact that it can be ignored in the scientific context does not uh, mean that it must necessarily be, uh, or, or that, that it has to be ignored also in in the philosophical context or, or in the moral context, because it seems that we can make uh, a distinction between how things are and how they seem to be. And uh, in, in a lot of cases, it seems that we value things for not what they are, but for the, how they seem to be from our perspective. Like, for example, when we value uh, feelings like joy or happiness, or when we dislike or hate pain or suffering, we are not primarily concerned about the, about the uh, structurally describable perspective independent basis of those phenomena, but about how those phenomena seem to us, how they are from our perspective. And uh, as far as quite often uh, the content of those perspectival phenomena are not structurally describable, um, uh, we may say that, indeed, in, uh, in many cases, the things we value or, or, or things we find humanly important or, or morally relevant cannot be structurally analyzed because they are not uh, perspective-independent phenomena, but they are actually uh, perspective-induced artifacts or perspectival phenomena uh, that, uh, that have a non-structural content. Uh, so, uh -huh. I, I pushed completely wrong button, yeah. So uh, to sum up, uh, according to this um, uh, perspectivist slash illusionist interpretation, sensory qualities um, would be causally redundant perspective-induced artifacts uh, with observable and reductively inexplainable non-structural content. And uh, According to this view, there are no corresponding non-structural qualities in the perspective-independent domain. 
uh, and it would also mean that the uh, structuralist notion of uh, scientific objects that is emphasized by Chalmers, or more generally, uh, this framework of scientific structuralism uh, concerns mainly the perspective independent domain. Because although there are some uh, structure or some perspectival phenomena, like for example the content of the bent stick illusion that can be structural, structurally analyzed, there are like many perspective induced uh, artifacts whose content is not fully structural, at least not from the perspective that induces them. So that would be basically the idea I, I wanted to uh, yeah, introduce. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Christian. Again, we have uh, time for one or two questions here. Okay, so uh, thank you for a, for a very interesting talk. And uh, uh, I wanted to ask, uh, uh, if we are talking about um, uh, uh, sort of the co contents of consciousness and uh, uh, studying those, can we really make such a distinction between uh, objective and uh, perspectival uh, features of them? Because isn't it kind of that we are... Uh, trying to look at the perspective uh, as an object from the outside and trying to explain that. So, so we should be able to say something about it without just saying that we are seeing it, uh, I don't know, from a certain perspective. Uh, I don't know if I understand you correctly, but perhaps you... Do you mean like that, for example, Chalmers has suggested... Like Chalmers uses the word consciousness in a way that, that, that this consciousness is just reserved uh, to mean this phenomenal aspect or this uh, aspect that is tied to the first person perspective but I, 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 but but there are many other many other theories and hypotheses that kind of try to uh, give uh, or try to explain consciousness uh, in more reductive manner so so uh, I mean I think it, if, if we if we take such a strong stand for some uh, semantic reasons that we just define consciousness as something that is tied to our first person perspective, then, well, then we can just preserve, then we can say that, well, this uh, perspective independent nature of consciousness, we can just call it like, I don't know, the material basis of consciousness or, I don't know, material consti constituents of consciousness. But I, I, I see it more like a, a semantic problem here in this sense that uh, it is a fact that we have like this kind of reductionist and physicalist approaches to consciousness and and also Chalmers for example seems to acknowledge that uh, uh, that there is kind of uh, this kind of material counterpart kind of for consciousness which he, he calls I think uh, awareness at some point or like psychological consciousness and and and, uh, and uh, so I, I I'm not denying that there is a distinction, but, uh, but uh, I would rather uh, draw the line there that um, which in some traditions is just called phenomenal consciousness or like access consciousness or like in, in one side there is phenomenal consciousness and other side there is like psychological consciousness or whatever. Uh, in, in this my proposal, this, maybe this phenomenal consciousness would, would mean how consciousness or how some some underlying, like some conscious processes seem to be to us and, and, and uh, then this other side uh, would be how they are according to uh, like the best current or the best future scientific theories. So, so, so I guess my guess, question is uh, if phenomenal consciousness is just how it seems to us, uh, then can we make a distinction like uh, between uh, how it is objectively and uh, how it is from a certain perspective? Uh, I, I'm, I'm like, I'm just saying that 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 this distinction is. I'm not in. Uh, I'm not the one who I inventing it. Like that, this distinction is already in the liter literature, and I'm just trying to uh, offer an interpretation to deal, with, like to understand it or, or what to make of it. But. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, thank you everybody. This is a good place to stop. So let's thank Christian one more time. And now we have a coffee break, so uh, let's meet here again, 20 past. Thank you.
Uh, okay, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you all had a nice coffee break, and it's my pleasure to welcome you back to this afternoon's session. And I'm very glad to be introducing my colleague on the Profi5 Mind and Matter Research Initiative, Anna Katrina Pessinen, who's a professor in experimental mind and brain research and the leader of the uh, Sleep and Mind Research Group. And uh, Anna Katrina is going to be talking to us about the sleeping brain in learning and emotion. Uh, Processing. Thank you, Alex, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, okay, um, now we move towards, uh, I think, the matter uh, things more um, to empirical level to see kind of glimpses of sleep research and uh, uh, how sleep affects learning and emotion processing. So, just acknowledging the sleep and mind team first. The, the Quarter of the village here. I will show the entire village that is needed to conduct um, experimental uh, sleep research in my lab. Uh, but these this precious ones are, are the ones um, whom, whom I, I rely in in doing our experiments. So, um, what is sleep? So, this is a level of reduction, of course. And uh, my level of reduction today is a sleep EEG. Uh, brain electrical activity and sleep as you know can be divided in uh, different sleep stages just to go through them quickly to kind of familiarize with you with, with the topics I'm going to present so this is n1 the lightest of sleep that we experience few minutes only by night it's a transition from the waking condition to sleep condition it, it resembles wake and even for a very experienced sleep researcher, it's, it's a kind of sometimes hard to distinguish the moment when one falls asleep. So it's not really evident. There are rules for that from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. If you have this and this and this rule, then you are asleep. But as you know, these are human-made rules, so the kind of division between wake and sleep is not clear. Um, then uh, N2 sleep is a kind of a mixed EG uh, frequency sleep. Uh, definitely, we call it light sleep, like in everyday language, but it's not really light. It's, it's proper sleep. Uh, and very characteristic of N2 sleep is sleep spindles, this kind of high frequency burst of activity. And I will come to sleep spindles later on. And they are one. Uh, mechanism of brain auto-stimulation uh, during the night, uh, during sleep, uh, to promote, for example, learning. Then we enter uh, so-called deep sleep or slow-wave sleep, and that is characterized by, by uh, all the neurons uh, in, uh, synchronizing together and, and really, really slow wave brain activity. Also, there are spindles uh, in there. And um, uh, finally, the uh, one sleep stage that I'm going to talk a bit more is REM sleep, which is the most wake-like uh, dream states of, of this, um, wake-like brain states of these uh, four stages. Of course, N1 is two. So, um, it's also called, called paradoxical sleep because it's like wake, but you don't move. Your, your muscles are completely inhibited. Um, so, sleep is also divided in sleep stages, and there is a hypnogram uh, showing how the kind of the normal sleep goes on. In practice, it doesn't look like this because it's much more fragmented. But basically, you have the major chunk of slow-wave sleep in the first half of the uh, night, like early sleep, and the REM dominates the latter part of the sleep. For example, if you sleep, you are the one who sleep four or three hours per night, like Donald Trump and Emmanuel Macron, and what are the other big names? Usually, somehow, they are like, presidents or something like that, so maybe it's, it's, it's not entirely true. But of course, uh, it can be um, 
it can be assumed that the REM sleep part is cut off from the, uh, from the hypnogram because uh, after three hours, it starts to be more common. Then you have this kind of microstructures, if you think this staging and hypnogram as a, a macrostructure, then you have this kind of events in the sleep, e.g. activity, micro-events as we call them. And as I said, uh, sleep spindles are um, such, it's, it's uh, illustrated here, uh, this kind of hippocampal uh, ripples and uh, PGO waves and theta activity are ones. We are, to we are talking about sleep, sleep spindles a bit today and also coupled with this slow oscillation and neuronal upstates. And then we have all kinds of neuromodulators. I, we are not going there today, but just remember it's a kind of complex process. And also age is important. So the sleep is not the same at infancy and when you reach old age. For example, this picture here um, illustrates how the slow wave sleep decreases along age and also only increases towards uh, age 90 again, and if you're female, so, uh, but, but really um, even middle-aged uh, individuals, uh, they have much less slow wave sleep than, than uh, young adults. And the quality of sleep, uh, slow wave sleep also changes, so it becomes uh, weaker in its amplitude. So, uh, my talk is about sleep, which is not opposite to waking state. So, we often tend to think, like in a binary fashion, that we, we are either asleep or uh, we are awake. We know from animals that they have this really nice system of survival. They have uh, local sleep. If you think of uh, bottlenose dolphin, for example, they have this one hemisphere sleeping at time, another hemisphere is awake in order to, to guarantee to sur survival. But also humans have this feature of uh, local sleep. We know this now by um, by experiments where we can put electrodes inside the brain to measure brain electrical activity. For example, if you prepare for it, um, brain surgery, if you have epilepsy, and, and they use these intracranial electrodes in order to localize where is the problem. And, and sleep researchers, some sleep researchers take advantage of this data that these electrodes are sending. Um, insomnia is a form of um, uh, uh, sleep that you may experience that you are awake, but according to an objective measurement of your brain activity, you definitely sleep. So it's called paradoxical insomnia and it's quite common. There are patients complaining, oh, I didn't sleep at all last night, but when you look at the objective uh, measurement of the sleep, you see uh, progress sleep for, for some hours at least. And there is this very exciting phenomena of lucid dreaming, um, which refers to people who can actually control their dreaming a bit. They preserve a certain state of waking consciousness while they sleep or dream, and they can, they can do some mathematical problem solving or, uh, or conduct a dream scenery of, the, of their interest. And we study also this kind of fragmented sleep, especially fragmented REM sleep. It means that the sleep is not continuous, but it's kind of, uh, there are intermittent uh, awakening just for a few seconds. You're not even self-aware that you, it's, it's not continuous, but, but from the sleep EG, you can see that the sleep is really uh, fragmented. And we can also, also measure waking state brain waves during sleep this kind of higher uh, uh, waking style power of sleep activity during sleep. And if you deprive sleep for, I don't know, uh, uh, several days, you start to sleep, uh, you start to see sleep state brain waves during wake as well. 
So REM sleep is of particular interest because it's, as I said, it's awake like brain activity. The brain plasticity is extremely high. And you uh, go through emotional experiences in REM sleep, also in non-REM. It's, it's not exclusive to REM sleep as we think. But there are also this kind of emotional physiologic present. So, for example, our amygdala uh, is activated, uh, especially during REM sleep. Uh, and also, if you look at the psychiatric problem, it's very common to have, uh, for example, different kind of sleep issues, but, but very often your REM sleep is somehow disrupted, for example, in depression. Um, REM sleep has been kind of a, under a very keen interest since, I, I don't need, think, 1950s or 1960s. 60s, and there are even early reviews what happens to humans and animals when you deprive your REM sleep. The, the kind of the outcomes are really divergent and there is not an entire kind of picture of what happens. Um, but uh, this question is still valid and actually our sleep lab also has done some uh, REM sleep deprivation studies recently. But they are now more accurate and, and, and the kind of methodology have, has evolved. But what happens usually, kind of your emotional regulation is somehow disturbed. So why infants then have more REM sleep? Uh, you see this, um, okay, it's not here. Um, I will show it in, in the next slide. But there is this ontogenetic hypothesis that uh, that assumes that REM stimulates the brain optimally as it kind of resembles the wake state. So it's very beneficial for the infants and during gestation to have uh, abundance of REM sleep because you can't really uh, uh, gather experiences from the real world but you can stimulate your brain in a way that you were in, in the real world. Um, and it's kind of remarkable that we uh, preserve uh, the ability to, to experience REM sleep also throughout, throughout our life. So it's not really decreased as the slow wave sleep. You saw that the, the slope is re really deep uh, here, but the REM sleep, um, it's not so much change uh, after the infancy. But if you look at this, this on the, on the genetic kind of hypothesis, you see that in the third trimester before the birth, the REM sleep is really uh, almost 100% at some point of the uh, gestation. So uh, what then kind of makes the difference between waking state, lucid dreaming and REM sleep? This is uh, a, from a review by Hobson et al., a very good review if you're interested on, on this uh, question. Uh, it, it is thought that uh, you have this wake type activity, but your frontal uh, lobe is a bit inhibited during a proper REM sleep. But if you have lucid dreaming, you have some kind of conscious activity uh, in the frontal lobes uh, to direct your, your dreaming and, and, of course, waking, it's, it's highly active. So uh, there is a theory of uh, consciousness and REM sleep, and, and it's this uh, um, researcher, Hobson, who wrote it in uh, 2009. And he kind of postulates that there are different uh, levels of consciousness. Uh, the primary consciousness is a perception, emotion. It's a very um, common in humans and both in animals and humans. And, and when you come to the secondary conscious, you have this self-reflective awareness increasing, abstract thinking increasing, and you have this kind of metacognition uh, present. So dream consciousness is something like uh, having characteristics of both secondary consciousness and primary consciousness, it's richer than waking consciousness because it can, it can create a re reliable simulacrum, as the Hobson uh, states, of the world. And it kind of integrates highly disparate images and themes into a seamless scenario. And if you think of 
um, kind of metacognition in a way you can somehow know that you are sleeping when you are dreaming. And at least in the morning you can be aware that you saw a dream, it was not real. And for children who have nightmares, they can't do the difference because their metacognitive skills are not advanced enough, so they are highly frightened by, by nightmares. And Hobson uses this famous picture of uh, Salvador Dali picturing uh, Gala lying down just one minute before Gala wakes up. And, and uh, this is a dream that is kind of caused by a bee around a pomegranate, like buzzing around and what's, what's kind of Salvador Dali thinks uh, Gala is experiencing. So the REM sleep dream protoconsciousness hypothesis by Hobson, um, there are maybe a few theses. Uh, the development and maintenance of waking consciousness uh, depends on brain activation during sleep. Uh, brain state underlying waking and dreaming, they cooperate and there is a functional interplay that is crucial for the optional, optional functioning of both. And dreaming um, is, is a subjective experience of a brain state, and it has similarities and differences from waking consciousness. And uh, as there are hundreds of all kind of dream theories, but this kind of integrates them, saying that REM is a preparation for waking consciousness and a reaction to it. So kind of both directions are valid. So let's go to the empirical level. Uh, what we did in the first week of lockdown in, in Finland, uh, in the beginning of the pandemic in 2020, uh, we did a crowdsourcing through a, uh, a largest news, newspaper, Helsingin Sanomat in Finland, and we collected dream experiences from that week. Then we used unsupervised data-driven modeling uh, to see um, first, we deconstructed the sleep into word lists because the narrative were really complex. And then we did this kind of association chains and clustering. What kind of items, word lists belong uh, together? And, and we formed this kind of dream clusters. <laughs> and we saw this kind of, uh, lots of these kind of dreams where there's distancing, this disregard of distance, crowd, party, public, that were associated with or hugging, with, with like, kind of acknowledging that this is a mistake. I can't really do this handshake or hugging. I, I, I have to inhibit myself, but I did it already, so a big, big mistake. Uh, we also looked at those who felt uh, that their stress hadn't changed about pandemic and those who felt that they stretched increased and we saw much intensified dream networks uh, among those who who felt themselves uh, stressed and then we did some qualitative analysis we we tried to kind of come up with are there any thematic kind of titles for for the completely data-driven uh, dream clusters that we got and, and and of course this is a you can you can contest this is not uh, uh, maybe not the the most valid and reliable way, but it was quite of interesting and and very experienced uh, dream researchers were quite excited of a, this way of dealing dream reports with which is not conservative at all. So, but travel difficulties, overcrowding, disregard of distancing, surgery and troubles quarantine and disease symptoms, apocalyptic dreams, etc., were pandemic-specific. There were also other dreams, of course. So, um, what we do in our lab, it's experimental uh, sleep research on brain activity during sleep. And in practice, it's hard sleep lab work. So, overarching questions in our research is how stress affects sleep, how emotions are modulated during sleep, and what explains overnight memory consolidation. And if you are interested, this is a wonderful review by, uh, by Klintzing et al. in Nature Neuroscience, showing in practice or in theory how this kind of memory consolidation takes place in the brain. And the central concept is this uh, engram, kind of neurological engram that is produced by our, our experiences. And first, these engrams are hippocampal uh, associated, and 
when the memory consolidates and the kind of synaptic connections uh, are uh, amplified, this kind of hippocampal dependency of the engrams is then discontinuated. And uh, there is, of course, a bunch of animal studies behind uh, this, um, this model. Um, but the fate of a memory is not determined at the time of encoding. So there are also models explaining at the synaptic level what is happening. And uh, there are many mechanisms, for example, susceptibility of synaptic plasticity or uh, to modulation around the time of uh, induction. And this is the synaptic tagging and capture hypothesis explaining what, what is happening at the kind of molecular level. We are not going there, but, but uh, just for your knowledge, there are, have been kind of very good efforts to explain this. And these uh, sleep spindles that we have been extensively studied, this kind of thalamic uh, stimulated uh, co cortical activations, are one key mechanism how these synaptic connections are amplified or consolidated during sleep. So it's kind of no, with no external stimuli, your brain auto stimulates itself to do this consolidation process. But it's not random. How we kind of, um, we see that um, this kind of experiences that we had are replayed during sleep. It's called memory replay. Um, but what kind of, uh, is everything we experience replayed during uh, sleep? No. There is a very good evidence already that maybe some things that we tag relevant are kind of prioritized in this memory replay. And this kind of experiments where you have rewards, or, or uh, you're not rewarded, uh, explains the memory replays uh, during the next night. So this mechanism can be uh, boosted by a targeted memory replay paradigm. You can condition the encoded, stim uh, encoded material with the sound or smell stimuli, and then you can replay this during the night uh, and make the brain do more replays and thus boost the memory. So um, these are the questions that are important in our lab. I, I, I won't go there uh, reading them aloud, but uh, there are lots of open questions related to this process. And it's related both to learning um, like very semantic, semantic materials and emotional uh, episodic materials. And stress uh, plays a big role in this um, process. So what we can experiment with, we can modify stress level, we can induce social stress, uh, we can modify memory content, we can modify sleep, we can deprive or suppress certain sleep stages, or we can engineer sleep. We can do this kind of targeted memory reactivation paradigms. And what we have been do, uh, doing is um, inducing emotions lately, for example, using VR environments uh, where you have to, uh, we try to elicit self-conscious affect, shame, <laughs> basically, that you have to give be speech uh, in front of, uh, front of a seminar room or um, listen to your own singing of Dancing Queen by Appa without any playback. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I can say that it definitely uh, elicits a good uh, stress response, uh, also from the HPA axis level. Um, okay, uh, our first experiment, we didn't find any results, but that's the tricky part of the um, paradigm. So how much do you have to queue during the night in order not to wake the participant up, uh, but to really... Uh, uh, induce the replay. So we are continuing along these lines. But also here the REM sleep played a role. Not only learning, but also sleep-related inferences are part of these activity patterns. So uh, you can, for example, learn different words, but not kind of the upper level concept. But when you recall the list in the morning, you produce also the upper level concept. It's called uh, a lure or um, abstraction, or it can be a false memory agent. 
And just to, uh, if you're interested, there is a very good um, kind of um, uh, um, theoretical model uh, ready to understand how memory replays boost the creative problem solving. And part of this is this kind of uh, uh, abstraction that happens in REM sleep, kind of reorganizing your memory content. Okay, take home. Sleep is an active brain state. Uh, it's necessary learning for learning emotions and waking state cognition. There is an auto-stimulation of brain for recently acquired information. This includes sleep spindles, dendritic synaptic restructuring, and memory consolidation process. Inferences happen, uh, and the, it's not deterministic. It depends on many, uh, many personal and, and contextual factors. So this is the, the entire village that has have contributed to our studies. Many thanks and questions. So we have about six minutes for questions. So hands up, please. And uh, there's someone up at the top on the left there. Thank you, Ms. Pessinen, for your presentation. If I understood you correctly, one of your main arguments is that we shouldn't disregard sleep as an inactive state, rather to perceive it as an active state. Mm -hmm. So I'd be very interested to know what is your perspective, advice, willingness that we make the discussion about sleep as an active state more inclusive, so we won't continue this trend of seeing it as rather less than the active conscious state. Uh, okay, I, I think this is kind of a very like consolidated knowledge among sleep researchers already. But I think we are on the kind of verge to make this really um, common knowledge. So if I understood your question, uh, this pub popularizing of sleep research is quite important for people to understand really and to be curious of what is happening uh, during the sleep. So, um, I don't know if I answered your question, but um, that's kind of my view on the uh, issue. And what would be your perspective of how you wish this popularization would happen? So, more probably focused or investment scientific research would be dedicated to sleep analysis? Of course, yes. <laughs> it's very, very expensive, you know. <laughs> yes, but of course, this is, we compete with, with other important aspects, of course, and, and we have to be humble also. Sleep is not everything, but of course, um, yeah. But I think the kind of, the, lots of sleep research, it's increasing at, at a very good pace at the moment. The gentleman here. And In relation to the topic of artificial intelligence, uh, I have heard the recent model about the explanation of why, why do we dream in the first place. And that explanation goes that we dream because it's a result of kind of backpropagation algorithm, so to speak, of the brain during uh, the night time, during the sleep time, that kind of um, as the machine learning algorithms change their um, nodes in the graphs and, uh, and so forth, this, uh, this could be the analog in the brain. What would you think about that kind of model? Uh, like analog is what is happening during the wake. Yeah, so the, yeah. Mo so the model kind of connects that uh, backpropagation algorithm in machine learning would be sort of uh, analogous to dreaming uh, in the brain. Do, uh, do you think there is any idea in this model? Yeah, of course. We, we can discuss it deeper d during the break. Yeah, I, um, I can't really get the point now what, how, but I would ask you. Sure, thank you. Yeah. There's one. And, yep. Okay. Yeah. So 
Thank you. Very nice talk. There, there is this idea that during learning, synapses increase in size, and during sleep, and and you know they cannot keep on increasing. So one of the mechanisms of sleep could be to decrease the, yeah, the strength of the synapses, definitely. so that you know not all of them, because then yeah. you would unlearn everything. Yeah. But uh, you know, sort of selectively. Do you have any evidence for that theory or any support for that? Yeah, I'm absolutely for in for support. I didn't speak about it, but forgetting is really important. So forgetting irrelevant information and kind of this kind of synaptic descaling in REM sleep, uh, and otherwise we would be overloaded. So yeah. this is this is absolutely important. And of course, if you if you have spindles on the downstate of a slow wave, that's a kind of interesting hypothesis whether this is actually a mechanism for forgetting, but I and mean, kind of active mechanism. But we don't know it yet. How would that work? This so what is the relation between the spindles and the downregulation? Well, that that that's a good question. It's just purely empirical at at this stage. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think that's about all we have time for, if you're ready to go, Kimo. Um, yeah. Okay, unfortunately, I know there were some other hands up there, but unfortunately, we're going to have to call this session again. So it just remains to uh, thank uh, Anu Katrina once more for a really interesting and enjoyable talk. And now I'm very pleased to introduce another colleague from here at the University of Helsinki. Kimo Alho is a professor in the Department of Psychology and Logopedics, and will be talking to us today about brain activity during attention to audiovisual speech. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, good, thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, I want to first thank the organizers of this highly stimulating interdisciplinary meeting. I'm gonna uh, show you some of our recent research on brain activity during attention to audiovisual speech. Uh, as we have also experienced here, we can easily, in a crowd, uh, attend to one person and at the same time, we are not very much aware of the other persons around us when we are listening to this one person speaking, and we can also move our attention to another person and, and uh, flexibly select what we want to attend in the, in the, in the crowd, of, uh, in a noisy crowd. This research on this effect started already, what is that, 70 years ago? Uh, Colin Cherry did this shadowing experiment, many of you are probably aware of this, where he presented uh, one speech message to the left and one speech another to the right ear and asked the participants to attend selectively to one of the messages. Uh, to make sure that they were doing the task, he was using a shadowing task where he asked the uh, listener to repeat what was said uh, in the attended message. Of course, this is not very natural, but this was a way to ensure that uh, the uh, subjects are doing uh, what, what they were meant to do. And, and what he noticed is that this is rather easy task for all of us. We are all experts in selective listening, and, and uh, these uh, participants did not notice much what happened in the uh, unattended speech. For example, if the speaker, if the language changed from English to German, they didn't necessarily notice that. Uh, that that Jane's there. And this kind of findings uh, led to theories of early selection. And it was thought that uh, in this very quite simple model, uh, which I have outlined here, that after the auditory input uh, enters sensory processing of, say, location or pitch of the sound, sounds or the, or the voice, the, the timbre of the speaker's voice, uh, as this would work also when two speakers are in the same location but have different voices. Uh, for example, a male and female speaker in the, in the same location, you, could, you can easily attend to one of them. Um, so it was thought that there is somewhere here is a filter that lets through only the attended speech. Kind of simple uh, model. 
uh, for example, to semantic processing, if, if the, that would be other types of stimuli, say musical music, then that would be probably uh, processing of melodies and so on. And at the same time, you, you kind of use this information to maintain the filter uh, settings. But it was soon found out, as, as we can all experience, that actually if there is certain amount of intrusion of an unattended speech in this kind of situations, we all know the example of hearing one's own name. That's actually a very bad example because I think we have a very strong representation for our own name as we have heard it throughout our lives. But what was found is that if the unattended speech is semantically connected to the attended speech, you may have problems in repeating the attended speech. Um, well, this kind of went... Uh, uh, was against the early selection theories and, and uh, gave room to so-called late selection theories. There were people who were saying, well, the selection can occur only after you have processed the semantic content of the message, uh, which is not true. What was shown by Ann Triesman and others is that when you listen, certain, yes, there is an intrusion of unattended speech message, message or maybe, if, the, uh, if there is semantic context of the, of the attended and unattended speech overlap, but once you, if, the longer you listen, the better you are in attenuating the unattended speech uh, away. And so there's kind of an attenuating system where the, still the relevant message is going through uh, at some early stage of processing uh, and, and other messages are attenuated uh, somewhat or totally in, in, in the best case. And this system would still work out uh, like uh, a loop where uh, once these stimuli are selected, they also help you to maintain attention uh, in that, say, location or, or pitch or whatever you are using as a cue. Uh, why I have a brain here, of course, all these talk about early and late selection, let immediately the uh, people doing neurophysiology interested in at what stage of auditory processing the selection occurs. And, and there have been, of course, attempts to uh, find the, the le level of selection. I'm going to concentrate today on cortex. Uh, that's where our findings are. It doesn't rule out the possibility that there are earlier mechanisms also for such uh, attentional selection. What we have done is we went <laughs> from those auditory situations to audiovisual speech, because this is, of course, the natural situation we mostly have. We see the speakers. Uh, but we wanted to make this listening more difficult. And we know that in noisy crowds, you use the lip uh, movements or the so-called visual speech. It helps you to understand speech in noisy environments or if the quality of sound is bad. So, we varied the uh, quality of uh, visual inputs. Uh, our participants were watching these two people having a dialogue, and, and we masked their faces to a uh, uh, large extent, or then less. I say that good is not true. It's actually better. It's not good quality. It's a better quality. And, and same thing with auditory quality. We used so-called noise vocoding, where you take this um, uh, frequency bands and replace this, uh, this um, uh, frequencies with uh, white noise uh, varying in amplitude uh, the same way the speech would, uh, would vary. And the less you have these bands, the more difficult it is to understand the speech. I will show you some examples soon. So we had either four bands or 16 bands in this, uh, this uh, noise vocoding. We left intact the lowest frequencies to uh, make it easier to recognize the, uh, the voice of the speaker, because this is where, where these frequencies are, are typically uh, higher for female voices, lower for male voices. OK, um, as we are doing attention, very important thing is that we compare two conditions, one where the participants attend to something, and the other condition where the participants don't attend to this thing, uh, keep, while keeping the stimulation exactly the same. So what we did uh, in some of the conditions, in half of the conditions, we actually uh, asked the participants not to listen to the dialogue, but to look at that fixation cross that was presented in, uh, under one of the faces, and to count how many times it rotated from X to plus or from 
plus 2x. And as you can see, it was moving uh, uh, between the, uh, these two faces, lying, simulating the fact that when they were listening to the dialogue, they were attending to the either speaker. So we had kind of the attention shifting. Uh, uh, manipulation was there, but, but they were uh, asked not to attend to what was said. And yes, I forgot to mention, to make this dialogue listening even more difficult, we had a background uh, voice there all the time. It was an audio book not related to the dialogue and tried to simulate a situation where you are following a discussion, say, in a cafeteria, and there was somebody talking, say, to a uh, mobile phone at the same time. And that's, of course, very distracting, but as we have the ability to selectively listen, we, we can kind of be quite unaware of, the, of what is said in the, in the um, message. Um, let me see now. Okay, I have uh, here uh, some examples. I will show you one where the, both the auditory and visual quality are poor. These are in Finnish. I'm sorry, we have added here for you subtitles, not for our participants who were fin fin native speakers of Finnish, but you can uh, maybe get an idea what they were uh, our participants were doing. There's the fixation cross. Maailma oli vielä puolta vuosi tuhatta nuorena kuin nyt. Kaikilla tapahtumilla oli paljon selväpiirteisemmät ulkonaiset muodot. Surun ja ilon, onnettomuuden ja onnen välimatka näytti suuremmalta kuin meistä. Kaikissa oli vielä sitä korkea asti. You got the idea. Okay, after there were seven lines uh, in each dialogue, and after the... Uh, Dialogue, we ask questions about each line, uh, a simple yes, no answers. Uh, did the uh, discussant say something about the mobile phone or, or the, the, they go into a concert or whatever the uh, topic was? But all the dialogues were very neutral in emotional content. They, so we, we were, they were discussing just going to lunch, going to a concert, what are you going to do in, in, on a vacation and so on. Okay, I will give you another example, um, and here you probably see how the maailma oli vielä puolta vuosi tuhatta nuorena kuin nyt. Kaikilla tapahtumilla oli paljon selväpiirteisemmät ulkonaiset muodot. Surun ja ilon, onnettomuuden ja onnen välimatka näytti suuremmalta kuin meistä. Kaikessa oli vielä sitä korkea-asteista välittö. Let me ask, how, did any of you experience of understanding better when you saw the faces, when you saw the speech. Maybe it doesn't work here, it works better in a laboratory. <laughs> okay, I will, uh, of course we had a good auditory quality and poor visual quality, and we had also good auditory and visual quality. Maybe I let you to see, let you see what, it, what it's when it's good. Oh, sorry, uh, I probably have to click that. Kun maailma oli vielä puolta vuosituhatta nuorempi kuin nyt, kaikilla tapahtumilla oli paljon selväpiirteisemmät ulkonaiset muodot. Surun ja ilon, onnettomuuden ja onnen välimatka näytti suuremmalta kuin meistä. Kaikessa oli vielä sitä korkea aste. Okei, okay. I hope you got the point. Let's go on. Uh, okay, for, first of all, what we see here, we looked at the effects of auditory and visual quality. And, and here on, the, on this side, you have the auditory quality effect. Not surprisingly, in the, both hemispheres in the auditory cortices, here in the temporal lobe, these are inflated cortices, but it, you can see better the salsi and the gyri. Here we can see effect of auditory quality. This was not a surprise because people who study uh, comprehension of speech use exactly the same uh, noise vocoding manipulation as we did. And have, this has been shown in many studies that if, if the speech is more comprehensible, you get more activity in these areas that are in, involved in speech uh, listening and in human voice processing. Those of you who are really interested in this neuroanatomy, oh, primary auditory cortex is here and this seems to be left untouched by, by these manipulations. Uh, but interestingly, when we increase the visual quality, we get enhanced activity in the same auditory cortical areas. And today we heard a talk about, uh, by Lena Kühne about the, uh, the multisensory integration. This is exactly what's happening here. This is probably the same system that explains the McGurk effect. We have a route, uh, the so-called third visual pathway from the visual system to, the, uh, to these areas. Uh, and it's thought that this is especially has developed for social interaction, that we can use the visual speech, for example, to understand better the auditory inputs. 
Okay, the effects of attention. I didn't go to all the details in the results. I just go uh, show you the highlights. Okay, again, it's not a surprise that when you st start attending to something compared to when you attend to the, the cr uh, fixation crosser, we get more activity during listening. In the auditory cortices in both hemispheres, in the Broca's area, uh, here in the, in the left hemisphere, and in, in the analogous area in the right hemisphere. So this is all kind of expected. Uh, if you look at those blue things here, they show areas that were more active, in, active during this fixation cross task. It's not surprising that some of the uh, cortical areas are specialized in uh, visual processing uh, in this kind of task and show more activity. Of course, we can see here also, if you, these are the lateral views of the hemispheres. If you look at the medial views, you can see better that uh, attending to this audiovisual speech also enhanced activity in the visual cortex right here, and in the para, uh, parahippocampal gyrus, probably related to the fact that we asked the subject to memorize the discussion and because they had to answer to the questions afterwards. But what was a surprise to us is that we see activity in the orbitofrontal cortex right here, which is thought to be mostly for emotion control. This one, neutral, <laughs> these discussions. What is going on here? And also we see uh, activity in the posterior cingulate areas here. And we have replicated these results now in three different data sets. And in earlier studies where I uh, uh, studied with my colleagues' attention, you had two speakers with no visual input and you were attending one to, or to the other, we never saw anything like this. So it looks like these areas that are typically related to social processing, and uh, they, they are activated in our quite simplistic uh, social uh, per perceptual task. And uh, normally these areas uh, need to have experimental manipulations to be activated, like uh, making participants to solve difficult moral uh, questions or, or make moral judgments of other people's behavior, or uh, for example, theory of mind tasks where uh, the participant's task is to guess what the persons they are viewing are going to do next. It looks like we are activating in our experiments not only the attention network of the brain, but also the social uh, processing network of the brain. And uh, I don't know yet what to make out of this. First, I think it tells that the attention and social networks are, are, very, are kind of intertwined. And, um, I have recently read, uh, I wouldn't say this in other meetings, but here you have a lot of philosophers here, so uh, I don't normally give any philosophical explanation to my results, but I have, I would be very interested in you know, Michael Graziano's theory of attention, uh, attention scheme theory, where he thinks that uh, our consciousness is actually being conscious of what we are, our brain is selecting or attending to. And for, to, for, to maintain this kind of a, schema or how we feel it subjectively, uh, the model is actually based on the same neural system of the brain we use to theorize how other people's, uh, uh, how, how we model other people. So the theory of mind system, these areas belong to that, 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 that processing network. And, and I think we are getting close to there. And it seems that we are probing something very human with our uh, experiments here. I don't have, all explanations to this, but I know it's not only the inputs we are using, because we used exactly the same inputs, and we asked the participants in another experiment to attend not to the content, or in one condition, which we call semantic task, we asked them to memorize what was said by the persons. In the other task, we asked them to count how many times they, uh, uh, they heard uh, the, the phoneme R or Finnish R. How many times you hear this? And, and normally you don't, of course, do this unless you are a speech therapist and you want to recognize a speech problem with somebody. Then you may start listening to whether they are saying, saying correctly some uh, 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 phoneme. But, but here we can see the same. Of course, in the auditory cortex, we don't see anything because they are attending in both conditions. I mean, the attention manipulation is the same. But if you look at these uh, activations here, we can see even better activity here in the posterior cingulate areas in both hemispheres and here in the orbitofrontal and ventromedial cortical areas. So it's not the input. 
It, has, it is somehow related to the task and maybe interaction of our task and input. Uh, I hope we can do some more experiments on this. How much do I have? OK, thanks. OK, uh, here we see the performance. I'm a psychologist, so we are look at the uh, red lines here. Uh, the continuous uh, uh, line is for the good visual quality and, and uh, good auditory quality for these uh, discussions and, and, and uh, or dialogues. And you can see that, well, not much happens if we increase the auditory quality from poor to good. The visual quality seems to help there. But uh, if the visual quality is poor and auditory quality is poor, the performance in the memory task was uh, between 60 and 70 percent. It, of course, got better when we increased the auditory quality. OK, now you are wondering, what is this here? These were the coherent uh, dialogues I just showed you, where they were really discussing with each other. But in half, of, I didn't tell you that in half of the experiments or, or, or the conditions, we actually had incoherent dialogues, where we cut these dialogues uh, or, or, the, or the frames or from, uh, from different dialogues and made this kind of a conversations where they're not actually talking to each other and, and, and conversations that don't make too much sense. And we see that, yes, auditory quality makes uh, the memory task performance better, and the visual quality also helps. But, but of course, they are performing worse than in the, in the, with coherent dialogues, because the, the coherent dialogues are easier to remember. I will show you an example of an incoherent dialogue. Oops, we are not in the beginning. Okay, you got the point. Like you are talking to somebody and they're listen, not listening, but they're doing their own things. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, an interesting thing is what we found. We also look at the effect of coherence. And what we can see here is that semantic coherence seems to affect processing in exactly the same areas that are used for speech processing, right here, especially in the left hemisphere. And of course, so the left hemisphere is uh, dominant for language processing in most, most of us. We can see also uh, these left temporal uh, pole areas, which are thought to have something to do with uh, semantic processing in itself. And of course, if the conversation or dialogue is uh, coherent, it's kind of understandable that these areas are more active. Then we did also some multivariate decoding. So this is something uh, uh, that uh, people are now doing more and more in, in, uh, when analyzing brain uh, research data. And the idea here is that uh, these areas that are colored here, they carry information about the semantic uh, uh, co coherence of the dialogues, but don't show necessarily higher or lower activity during, during uh, one type of a dialogue. And here we can see that these effects are actually spreading very, to the audi even to the primary auditory cortex. So it looks like that not only <laughs> that the filter system might be actually affected by our semantic expectancies, which is kind of a new idea if you think of this model, that there would be this semantic processing would somehow affect this uh, filter settings here at the, at the quite early stage, if you think of primary auditory cortex, quite early stage of, of auditory process. OK, um, I have still three minutes. OK, now the problem with uh, functional magnetic uh, resonance imaging, what I just showed you, is that we don't have a temporal resolution there. We are talking about seconds, and, and, and it's far too slow to uh, figure out how early something is happening in the chain of auditory processing. It takes 25 milliseconds for input to arrive from uh, the inner ear to the cortex, and then a couple of hundred milliseconds to be processed to the semantic level. Uh, and and uh, maybe, yeah, three, 400 milliseconds after you hear a word, you are probably aware of what, what that was. 
Okay, what we've done is that uh, in this exactly similar experiment, that, like I showed you, we took the participants to an EEG experiment, and now uh, there are new methods to study speech envelope-related activity in EEG. So we actually calculate so-called temporal response functions that are related to the amplitude uh, changes in the, in the speech. So these are like event-related potentials, but, but they are uh, not evoked by discrete stimuli, but, but the changes in the, in the, in the amplitude of the, of the uh, speech message. And here we have the background audio book that you heard this distracting speech, and here we have attended speech message, and we can even separate these two responses to these two, as you can see right here. So we can, in a way, resolve this uh, attended speech message and see what is related there. And we are here talking about, we, I don't have a time scale here, I think I have it in the next one, but we are talking about here about one second after, the, after something has happened in this, in this uh, speech message. I think in the next figure is better. There I have a time scale, zero, 200, 400 milliseconds. After something happens in the an amplitude envelope, we measure from different scalp sites. So these are the same participants. So we take these data and we have their fMRI data. And now we can see when we look at these uh, responses, how do they correlate uh, in the, uh, or how they <laughs> behave in different experimental conditions, which are the different scores here. And then we can try to find out voxels that separate uh, at certain time uh, point of this uh, temporal response function, say 156 milliseconds, which voxels separate the conditions in the same way as these uh, temporal response functions or at 350 milliseconds, where I think the semantic processing is probably uh, uh, taking place uh, or uh, finalized. And as you can see here, in a way, we get a time scale to fMRI. Of course, some people say me, tell me it's impossible, it's not there, but the information must be there. The question is uh, if we can like, uh, reveal it, uh, because of course the fMRI is an integrated uh, activity over several seconds, but maybe we can this way find out which voxels correlate with these findings at certain time uh, windows. And here I have a, just to, this is my final slide, uh, to show you, here we have an attended and unattended message, uh, or responses to them, electrical responses in one channel, and the uh, dialogue, let me see now, uh, the blue one is for the, uh, well, you, you don't really necessarily, <laughs> It's not very important, but the blue one is for the for the uh, att when they attend to the dialogue, and the red one is for the during the visual task the responses to the same dialogue. And and we are talking about here about uh, hundreds of milliseconds here. Around this time, the uh, information arrives to auditory cortex. Here is probably the physical features are processed, and this is the time for probably for semantic processing, if those of you who have done event-related potentials, these are the latencies of the so-called N400 response related to semantic processing, among other things. And uh, this is very preliminary and in preparation, but I, will, I just wanted to show you uh, that we might get a time scale to fMRI by this correlation, with this correlation matrices. And this may, may be resolved for example, at what time in the primary auditory cortex something happens after the uh, stimulus onset. And oh, I forgot to say that, of course, these temporal response functions are mainly generated in the auditory cortex. It's, it's probably the main, main source of these, these activations here. very much for a great talk there, Kimo. So we've got time for one, maybe two questions. Um, is, no, that's someone using the camera. Ah, over here, please. Thank you for this talk. Um, was uh, curious about uh, um, the kind of which methods are you using to extract the global quantities from those uh, last correlation matrices? Sorry, I, I have problems hearing you. Oh, yeah. So, uh, 
if you are uh, using uh, specific methods uh, to analyze uh, those uh, um, correlation matrices, uh, yeah, and, uh, which are are they or yeah, well, uh, to extract the global quantities from those, extract information from those matrices. Yeah, well, this is um, dissimilarity matrices and and uh, and uh, correlating finding the differences between those, but did that answer to your question? Uh, well, kind of. Uh, I was, um, I mean, what we learn from those. Uh, what we learn from those? Yeah. Well, I mean, and the how? idea here is that if, if uh, electrical activity and our fMRI recordings are correlated, then this makes sense. If they are not, it doesn't. Okay. But so far, uh, because when I started doing this kind of uh, MRI work, I come from electrophysiology background, uh, I have tested several of our paradigms and they seem to work also in uh, brain imaging studies with fMRI or with positron emission tomography. So attention effects seem to be exactly what we expect them to be on the basis of our previous studies with event related potentials and magnet encephalography. So in essence, uh, you are looking for correlations, but then uh, you are not extracting global quantities from those. Yeah, yeah okay. you are right, yes. Understand. Are there methods uh, to extract global quantities? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not well, I'm, I'm, so I'm well, I mean, curious. Well, we should ask uh, my colleagues here. <laughs> okay. Patrick is, is, is the guy Wigman. Patrick Wigman, let me introduce you. Sitting next to Artur Yulinen, whose data I also showed. Could you hear me? Yes. Well, basically, okay, so basically, you can see places where you can look at which tasks are different from each other based on the EEG. And then at the same time, you can see my, uh, how the fMRI would show where you would see similar differences. But here, uh, we have not yet looked at what kind of effect uh, kind of cause it. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for any further questions, so it remains to thank Kimo once again for a fantastic talk. Thank you. And I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker, who is Marty Vainio, uh, another colleague from the University of Helsinki. Marty is professor in the Department of Digital Humanities, and will be talking to us about sound action symbolism, linking the physical world with meaning. All right. Everybody can hear me, can you? There's this nasty delay between this and, and my real voice. So people in the front <clears throat> only hear sort of double. Okay. Sound acts and symbolism linking the physical world with meaning. That's a highfalutin title, isn't it? <clears throat> There's a prologue, uh, uh, sort of from the semiotics of, 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 of whatever, the world. Sem uh, the, it was Charles Peirce who sort of, I guess, established the science. And, 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 it, and he talked about semiosis as, a, as any form of activity conduct or process that involves signs, including the production of meaning. So what might that mean? <laughs> okay, then there's another guy said semiosis is a criterial attribute of life, that, that, that this production of meaning, the process is, is somehow sort of a, a criterial attribute of life itself. And he says, that was uh, Damas Shabak, uh, he's a... I don't know, was he a Hungarian probably originally, but he, he worked in uh, 
Indiana University, I think, for a long time. Uh, so the semiotician. And he says that culture, so-called, is implanted in nature. The environment, or umwelt, which is uh, another sort of big term from, from uh, von Uyck school. And, the, and, it, and it's, the environment is a model generated by the organism. Semiosis links them. It links the organism and the environment. So link <laughs> is, is, is the important term. So uh, when I talk about speech and speaking, uh, I always sort of, or later in my career, I've taken the sort of uh, higher point of view and not, not sort of consider our skill to speak and communicate with, with our mouth and nose and whatever we use to, to produce the sound as, as something that just lives at the moment, but it has a natural history. And you have, if you want to understand the phenomenon, you have to understand its history. And it's natural history, not some, I know. It didn't come from any sort of platonic world or ideal world. It, 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 it evolved with us and before us. So um, uh, Maynard Smith has this list of sort of major transitions in life, sort of in, in, in evolution of life. But, but you can sort of, many biologists have talk about several sort of even bigger transitions, starting with the Big Bang. I mean, we would have nothing without, it, without that. Then we have the formation of Earth, and then sort of, the appearance of life, uh, whatever, for what, two billion years ago, a long time ago anyways. So life itself has these major transitions that lead to, to our, our uh, ability to communicate in, in a way that we do now. So for instance, the origin of chromosomes uh, sort of before the trans transition the independently replicated nucleic acid molecules you had, but after the transition you had a set of linked molecules that must replicate together. And if you, if you go through all these transitions, and, and the last one is sort of the uh, appearance of social groups, uh, when most insects, before that most insects can replicate individually or sexually, and after that the individual ants and bees and wasps and termites can survive and transmit genes only as a part of a social group and so forth. So all these transitions, if you look at them, deal with uh, some form of cooperation, that the cooperation is, is, is the sort of uh, important sort of feature of, of all these trans, uh, transitions that are sort of, on, on, on sort of have the uh, evolutionary meaning. So speech and language um, uh, of course, emerge after we have uh, social groups and, and some sort of need to communicate and cooperate. So speech and language are the, is the major transition in life, basically, in a sense that it produces a new type of evolution, and, and which is the cultural evolution. And, and with cultural evolution, which is sort of... Uh, <laughs> Like genes, language is a, sort of starts replicating information. So wh when we have the ability to speak, we can store information, replicate information, and, and store it over generations and so forth. So that produces a new cultural evolution, a tool for, for a totally new type of cultural evolution that, we, that was not there before. So it replicates the symbolic arbitrary information. And at the same time, it's a culturally transmitted system. So it has a life of its own uh, language, I mean. It's some, somewhat like an organism itself, which is an interesting sort of fact. It has to be acquired by the individual. So it's sort of as if in, in the sort of social of sphere, living its own life, and, and each individual acquires it through, 
through interaction with other people. So, <clears throat> usually at this point, people don't know anything about speech unless you studied at least some phonetics or linguistics, you typically don't know anything. You know about as much as you know about walking. Yeah, you move your legs and, and, and you get around. So you move your mouth and sound comes out, and that's, that's about it. <clears throat> On top of that, of course, there are all kinds of misconceptions that, that typically people's knowledge about speech is negative. It's, it's, it's wrong rather than, you know, reflecting the actual facts. So speech science, and, and for, me, for us phoneticians, it's kind of a problematic because it's, it's such a humongous thing. It's, it's, the, it's the biggest sort of, so, uh, in, in terms of sort of um, epistemics or epistemology, uh, it's, it's the sort of biggest thing in, in that, that, that's possibly there. It, it, you know, it, it, it goes from basic physics and acoustics of, of, of what happens in the mouth when I produce a sound and, and what, what, what is required for, for moving my organs around and so forth, all the way to, to how, how those uh, gestures that I produce encode language and what, what, what is language then and so forth and how, uh, how, is, how is the brain related to all that stuff and, how is our anatomy and physiology and all, all that stuff? So it's it's a humongous thing, and and it goes all the way to, uh, of course, uh, aesthetics and 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 further actually to uh, to to all the way sort of to religion in a sense that 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 uh, our Bible, which is we sort of our I mean in Finland Europe Europe you grow up as a Christian and show you the Bible early on and it starts I think that in the beginning there was a word anyways so speech is is the thing <laughs> it's 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 the most interesting thing there is it it encompasses more than anything it's bigger than cosmology or or whatever it, physics is physics is our auxiliary science <clears throat> okay so Speech signal, if you look at it, how it encodes information, is that this is a picture we did with, I think it's a, a complex wavelet spectrum, and, and then we did some Hilbert transform or whatever to get, get, get the information out. But the fact is, about that picture, that, that it shows from 0 0.2 hertz, which is, I think, five seconds, is it? All the way to to four kilohertz. So it's a it's a, it's a quite a few octaves of, of information. We uh, sort of analyzed with this scale invariant method, which means that 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 because it produces uh, nothing but relevant features for us to visualize, it means that that the system producing that signal. Uh, utilizes scale invariance or self-similarity sort of throughout the, the different scales, which is interesting. So you can see that at the top are the, what happens uh, in, in, in the mouth of, of the speaker when, when the sound that is produced in the larynx sort of uh, resonates in the vocal tract and produces these resonances and the differences between these resonances is what we then perceive as vowels. And the movements of those resonances tell us from which place the tongue moved to, to where in terms of, of our articulate, articulatory sort of gestures. And, and then we have fricatives like S with, with the, this sort of uh, fricative sound high up there. And then in that picture, you can see the two first sort of uh, harmonics of, of the, the vocal, uh, sort of voiced speech, and, and, and the first harmonic is the fundamental frequency of the uh, vibration of, a, of the vocal folds, which encodes what's called intonation. Like you can, 
you can say the same thing and, and raise your pitch and, and it becomes a question in English. You know, doesn't it? And, and then underlyingly you have what, what comes from, from the uh, energy envelope those sort of structures, hierarchical structures that, that reflect the, the sort of internal uh, structure of the sentence. So, it, for instance, here it says, high labor, small scale enterprises. So, high labor, small scale enterprises. It, it, those, those are linked. So, so, somehow the speaker can produce this thing that actually, it, out of his mouth, sort of. Uh, manipulating the, 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 the particle velocity in his mouth, uh, sort of in a one-dimensional sense, produces this multi-scale hierarchical signal. Nothing like that is produced by anything else in the universe. So, more about the physics is that, that the, the vocal tract now is interesting because most of the sort of linguistic content, that is, the, the, the vowels and the consonants, are produced in the vocal tract. And, 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 and here we have sort of MRI uh, pictures, sort of vocal tracts excised from the MRI. And, and, and we did with the mathematicians some studies that, that using, using sort of <clears throat> using these pictures and checking, checking whether, whether the, we could sort of produce the resonances and, and therefore the actual sounds in, so, in somewhat for, 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 for synthetic means. But, but anyways, what you see here is that when the, when the tongue is in the back, there's a constriction in the back, you get the sound ah. Ah. When the constriction is at the front, high, you get sound e. And that's it. It's, it you move your tongue around and you get these vowels. Ah, uh, e. Every language has those two. Okay, so here's ah, uh, and here's e. So sound symbolism, it's sort of the pervasive problem in linguistics, sort of muddying the picture of, of, of sort of uh, the pure, uh, sort of arbitrary form uh, meaning link as if that that's yeah there's every language seems to have this sort of this sort of iconicity and and, and sort of you we have our absolute direct imitation onomatopoeia like cuckoo is the name of the bird because it sounds exactly like so you imitate the, the sound of the bird and give the name to the bird with this imitative sound so you have relative ideophones like Japanese goro to go somewhere, goro goro, to go there faster. So you do more, it means faster. So you have size, then you have symbolism for size, shape, and distance. So for instance, here's a, Köhler did an experiment already, or, or noticed this in, 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 in 1929, almost 100 years ago, that if he gave these two objects name Mil and Mal, people would pretty sort of, uh, that the probability would be high that, that which one would, people, in people's opinion, be mil and mal. I, I'm not going to even ask you. Or this takete and maluma, which was uh, up here, it sort of resurfaced as kiki and buba. And, 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 and it's hard for anybody which is kiki and which is buba. I mean, is it not obvious to somebody? Good. So anyways, so there's this, so why Kiki and why Buba? What's, what's behind that, that sort of, that links obviously through that sound, the, the, those things. So we started looking at, uh, almost by accident, by, but some people had noticed that, that, that hand actions and, uh, uh, and the and sort of our speech articulation are connected in in the sort of uh, motor sense and motor areas and and so we started looking at it more in a bit more sort of linguistic 
way slowly and 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 we noticed and and we replicated it in many forms that 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 if you say t the syllable t which is a meaningless syllable in most languages at least in 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 finnish and and yeah well, many languages it mean meaningless anyways and 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 as opposed to ka which is a another sort of as if a random syllable so if you uh if you were to uh sort of press uh, a sensor with your finger and your thumb which is a sort of what's called a precision grip or grasp which is one of the sort of uh canonical ways of for us to use our hands to grasp and when, when we need precision and the thing is small we grasp it with with this way and if it's bigger we grasp it with our sort of palm of our hands so we we found out immediately that 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 those syllables ka and t are connected to to these grasp uh, gestures so so that they they reflect each other so that, so that you say the ka is much faster to to produce when you do the the sort of uh, power grasp as opposed to the precision grasp where the t is much faster and it and it replicated in 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 speech perception and 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 in planning phase so in premotor sort of action as well so there's there was a strong link between the mouth and the hand that 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 made sense also there was a strong link between pointing or sort of pushing your hand away from you as opposed to pulling your hand towards you which which uh, sort of was the similar with, with what what you do with your tongue when you say vowels and and syllables so they are connected like uh, uh, in many ways and but the fact is now that that because the other thing not the hands does the sound so that sound through that articulation encodes that articulation so 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 maybe maybe that has something to do with the with the with the sound symbolism so we did more of these studies with we had results with legs and 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 hands sort of backward and forward and so forth i don't know how many how many papers we have out about this now but anyways it's the the, the thing is that that we are connected sort of in this multisensory way and and we use it for for en encoding meaning in speech so in in, in this symbolic sense the, if 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 we want to really uh sort of mean <laughs> in this visceral sense that something is small we bring our tongue sort of closer like like we would grasp a small thing and the product of that in sound wise is e so e stands for small things in in many many languages you can you can start looking at the sort of different languages and and it's it, it's a it's a pervasive phenomenon that that is in many languages and and uh also in and, and all, all kinds of things we've recently found out that that uh the concept of an in front and back also probably before and after are also uh, encoded in in these sort of articulatory gestures and and therefore in the sound that is that is sort of produced from that so so we can we can we all, all we are all the time articulating the, the features of the our, our surroundings to to people i'll leave this this part because it's such a speculative study and it has a picture of a brain <laughs> anyways it's it's just a uh, preliminary study we did and didn't have any resources to follow up where where we sort of found that that uh, that if 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 the speech sound has meaning if 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 the sequences that you hear are meaningful they are actually encoding real meaningful words then then your uh motor cortex is uh activated when you hear the same speech scrambled so that so that there's no meaning it sounds exactly like like the original speech but but 
there's no words, then, then the motor cortex is not activated, sort of, which would, to me, sort of somehow suggest that that, that meaning in, in, as a whole, in wholesale is, is modulated by our motor action. So, so for more real modeling of meaning in order to reduce the uncertainties, whatever I was talking about here in another talk, our sort of grounding of meaning needs more, to be more concrete, not just some simple audiovisual linking, but it, it, it needs to take into account the motor system and action that is not just the motor sort of system itself, it's acting. So in, in a sense, it's, it's a somewhat sort of inactivist. <laughs> I'm not an inactivist in, in any radical sense, but, 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 but sort of, um, but, it, but it's obvious that, 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 that speech functions in that way. And, and, and our sort of, um, what we call meaning arises from, from, from our sort of interaction with the environment. So we need, need this physical temporal. We need to be alive, <laughs> you know, like, like a computer is never alive. I mean, what, 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 does, what, what, what requires for a computer to be alive? I mean, something like that. All right. So we, uh, my, my sort of take home message is that, that, that if, if we want to sort of study speech and, and, and language proper, we need to look at the evolutionary aspects. And, and Maynard Smith and, and Harper say that it will not be easy. It will require cooperation between two professions that have hardly been on speaking terms for a century. <laughs> will be worth it. So that is my sort of playground, trying to, trying to use sort of theories and ways of looking at our communicative actions in a sense that, that the natural scientists would understand that as well. All right, thanks. thanks. Many, many, many thanks, Marty. And we have about six minutes for questions. Oh, great. And, oh, yeah, the cat you. did nibble part of it and therefore the guilty look. The cat picture thing is the cognitive scientists always have to have the cats, and I couldn't find any any good sort of other than this. So thank you for this talk. Um, my question is about actually the the slide before this, the evolution of the language, and uh, I know that many people have been thinking that the descended uh, larynx is uh, key to the evolution of language, and that's what, that what's, that's what separates humans uh, in terms of this ability. Uh, so this is interesting because you're also connecting uh, the speech to the motor aspects, and we know that larynx is also, uh, so is for us, for example, if you're Grabbing something very heavy is impossible to not make a sound, and that's also associated with activating the larynx. So, how would you relate then the motor abilities to the to the language in this sense? Do you, do you think that this, these are things that separates uh, the the human ability in terms of okay, language so, skills? Yeah, the larynx getting lower and, and yeah. producing the vocal tract where absolutely we're doing when you sort of vowel distinctions. It is easy. Uh, I'm not sure if it, if that's, 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 I would say the, the, why we, why did that lower in the first place was because we started walking and, and we started walking for some, I don't know what reason to, to, to re reduce the sunlight sort of hitting us to the surface area or something, whoever knows that, but because we started walking, our hands got free and, and, and our larynx got down. So there are many, many of these sort of free adaptations that we, that we could adapt for language or speech really quickly. So of course they, 
they, uh, I don't know, they, they, they I, I wouldn't call, say that they were sort of the reason. They were just, uh, uh, what is this uh, in chemistry? The, the byproduct. So this is this sort of, sort of catalyst sort of yeah. process that, that things get faster because you have these pre-adaptations. I would say the most important thing is, is the need to communicate, the need to have that tool, and that's collaboration. And that, that sort of, uh, if, you, if you look at that sort of how, how which, which kind of sort of social groups collaborate the most, they will probably have the most complex signaling systems. That would be my, my guess, rather than looking at the larynx going and sort of lowering and producing a, that, that's just a, yeah, a catalyst. Unfortunately, that's probably about all we have time for. Sorry, but we are going to have just a very short sort of five-minute break before the uh, keynote, uh, which will be an online talk by Yana and Ismail. But uh, let's thank again our speaker.
I will Okay, let's go here. So, Yenan Ismail is, uh, of course, well known for many things, but also for uh, writing the book, How Physics Makes Us Free. So, often we feel that, you know, because of physics, there's determinism and, uh, you know, therefore, and if our minds are part of the physical world, the physical world is determined, there's no free will. But she has another view of this, and uh, so let's, let's hear what she has to tell us. Good to go. Okay, first, um, I'm going to share my screen. So first, um, thank you so much for having me. I'm very honored to be here and sorry that I can't be there in person. So suppose that you have a decision to make. So one of those soul trying, impossible decisions that we've all made. So a decision whether to stay in a safe but suffocating situation, or to turn your back on everything and take a leap of faith, whether to fight or flee, to proceed or retreat. We struggle with decisions, sometimes agonizingly, because we think that there, our decisions are going to make a difference to what happens, that the future hinges on what we decide. As William James so vividly put it, in the soul trying moments when fate scales seem to quiver and good snatches the victory from evil or shrinks nerveless from the fight, we think that the issue is decided nowhere else than in the here and now. So in 1687, at the very beginning of physics in its modern mathematical form, when Newton showed how to write down the equations that let us calculate the motion of a pendulum and the trajectories of planets, he also did something that was shocking to that lived sense of contingency. The laws that he wrote down in conjunction with the complete catalog of the positions and momenta of all of the particles of which the universe, that make up the universe were strong enough to determine everything that we will ever do every movement we will ever make, every word we will ever speak. Newton gave us, that is to say, a vision of a universe that unfolds with inexorable necessity from an initial state that was set at the very moment that God laid down the positions and the momenta of particles that make up the universe. And it also means that as you toss and turn in the throes of a difficult decision, there's really only one possible outcome. So this is the problem of free will. It's one of the most beautiful philosophical problems because it's stark and it's simple and it reaches right into the deepest questions about who we are and how we fit into the universe. And it's been discussed endlessly since um, 1687. The problem presents a strong challenge to our sense of contingency because it takes two very basic commitments. On the one hand, the idea that the laws of physics place fundamental constraints on what can happen. So for example, you throw a ball in the air or you set a pendulum in motion and you know exactly what is going to happen. And two, the idea that the past is fixed and then it uses the laws to leverage the fixity of the past into the fixity of the future. Now, neither of these two basic commitments seems negotiable. And there's a famous argument that makes this explicit. Oops, sorry. The basic argument is that the past is fixed and out of our control. The laws are fixed and out of our control. Our actions are jointly entailed by these two things together. So our actions are fixed and out of our control. 
So physics has changed a lot since Newton's times. And the changes I'm going to talk about come from relativity rather than from quantum mechanics. So one might have thought that since quantum mechanics is the more fundamental theory, and since quantum mechanics is indeterministic, that would diffuse the worry. Right? But we're too big, too warm, and too slow for quantum mechanics to very likely to make any difference at the level at which the problem applies. That is to say, classical physics is a physics that's likely to be the effective physics for understanding human behavior. The reason that relativity makes a difference is that determinism is a relationship between time and laws. And when relativity transforms our conception of both of those things. So the first part of what I'm going to say is a little bit technical. It's necessary because it sets the stage for what follows. But the important part of it is to get enough of a qualitative sense of what relati re relativity actually looks like and how profoundly it changes our conception of time. The main part of the talk will be understanding what human activity really looks like against this backdrop. That is how human action and human behavior is woven into the fabric of a relativistic universe. So according to relativity, and this will be familiar to some of you, the universe is a four dimensional structure called the manifold. The basic objects are events, these little dots here. Three of the dimensions are spatial and one of them is temporal. The structure of the manifold is given by what are called light cones. So at any given point O here, we can divide the universe into three regions. There's the causal past, this region here, which is the set, the, the, the temporal dimension goes up and then the, these three dimensions are spatial dimensions. The causal past, a set of points here, is a set of events that can have any effect on what happens at O. The causal future, which is a set of events here, which is a set of the points that can be affected by what happens at O. And then the set of events here in what's called the absolute elsewhere that can neither affect nor be affected by what happens at O. That's the whole story. Okay. We can divide space and time into these three regions at every point in the manifold. It's all, it was always true that spatial and temporal notions were connected to what could affect what and by what route. So it was always true that if something happens in a distant part of space and time, you know it can only affect you by a route that passes through all of the places in between. And if influence travels at a finite speed, that it will take longer depending on how far away it is. That is made much more explicit in relativity. So relativity takes the rather loose and inexplicit connections between spatial and temporal on the one hand and causal notions on the other, it places a limit on the speed at which influence can travel. And then it tells you everything there is to know about how everything hangs together in the universe. So if the basic things in a relativistic universe are events, what are material objects? Well, events is a bit of a misleading name. Events are really the localization of a bit of matter at a particular point in space time. So objects like tables and chairs and human bodies are tubes of events like this one laid along the temporal dimension. So here's you, here's your life, here's your history, that is to say. Okay. The width of your tube, and we're suppressing one of the spatial dimensions here. So the width of your tube represents the spatial volume occupied by your body, and the length represents the time span of your life. So these are the set of events that make up your life. Here's your birth, here's your death, here's your graduation from elementary school, your first kiss, and so on, all the way up to your death. This tube includes all of the things that happen inside your body through the course of your history, blood running through your veins, to the firing of neurons, to the shifting connections in your brain and the thoughts and experiences that those shifting connections underlie. We usually actually suppress the spatial breadth and just speak of world lines. So here's your world line. In a relativistic universe, the universe does not unfold in time. There is no notion of now that reaches across or spans 
the whole universe, the universe as a whole. There's no longer an initial moment in time. Certain ways that we have intuitively of thinking about space and time are no longer applicable. So for example, we usually think pre-relativistically, we think of the universe as a large spatially extended sort of object or substance that evolves over time. That doesn't fit the, the, um, a relativistic universe. In a relativistic universe, temporal development is always from the perspective of a particular system. From the perspective of any system, like a system like you or me, actually temporal development is largely unchanged. So if we follow your world line, things will look to you in a relativistic universe just as they do in life. You'll experience your life one event and then another. The difference is that there's an asynchrony between the development along distant world lines. So different world lines, that is the world lines of objects at some distance from another is gonna be a little bit out of sync so that we can't line up events along distant world lines perfectly tightly. So if you have a friend on Alpha Centauri and you wonder what she's doing at the precise moment that you lay down to sleep, there really isn't an answer to that question. You can send her a signal and wait for it to return and ask her what she's doing at that moment. And she can tell you what she is doing when she receives a signal, but the time it takes for the signal to go and come back is always gonna be a finite interval of time and that time interval is as tight a fit as we can get between the events along her world line and the events along yours. Now, none of this makes a discernible difference at everyday speeds and distances, but it does mean that the whole picture of space and time that frames common sense is wrong. There is no univ univocal notion of now in a relativistic universe and no uni univocal notion of the past. So when you talk about the past, you always have to say whose past. If there's someone located in a distant part of space, like your friend on Alpha Centauri, her past won't coincide with your past. It will include a different set of events. The time it takes for them, your friend, to travel to you at the speed of light is the time it takes for her past and your past to come to include one another. That is your past and her past come together or coincide when you and her meet. Now in, a, in, a relativist, in Newtonian mechanics, sorry, the laws came to be formulated in global terms. Okay. So in Newtonian mechanics, one is given the state of the universe as a, at a time and the laws are relations between the states of the universe at a whole, as a whole at different times. Relativity is different. In relativity, the laws are local constraints that relate what happens at a point in space-time to its immediate surrounding. So each point interacts only with those in its immediate neighborhood. Each point knows nothing of the larger world. Everything that's true about the universe in a relativistic setting is the product of local events and local interactions and the laws constrain only those local interactions. So what does determinism say in a relativistic universe? It says that if we choose a point in space-time, say what happens at some point P, that what happens at that point is determ determined by P's causal past. That is a set of points in the backward light cone of P. But here's the interesting thing. So if we consider a point P and we choose a point P star in P's, P, in P's future, even a finite fraction of a second between P and P star, then P's past does not determine what happens at P star. And that's generally true. For any point in space and time, the past of that point will not determine as a matter of physical law, anything that happens, even a finite fraction, in, uh, even a finite interval into its future. Why is that? 
because the light cone of the future event, the light cone of this event here, will always include events that fall outside the light cone of the earlier event. Um, that is, the light cone of the later event includes events that are not in the past light cone of the earlier event, not just in the obvious way that it's going to contain the events between the earlier and the later, but there's no way to go back far enough and cast your, your, your net wide enough in space to capture a set of events that's going to determine the events in the future of the earlier one. That's true for every point in a special relativistic space time and any space time that looks, we think anything like our space time, even in general relativity. Okay? It's going to be true that the past of an earlier event doesn't determine anything that happens in its future. Okay? So the worrisome idea that determinism seemed to present, the idea that is to say that we could use the physical laws to leverage the fixity of the past into the fixity of the future does not hold in a relativistic universe, even though the laws are deterministic. Not only is there no initial state for the universe as a whole, that is no instant of time at which God laid down the initial conditions for the universe as a whole, any attempt to find a point of view in a relativistic universe that spans all of space, that is to say that looks across all of space, will also span all of time. There won't be any point until the end of the universe at which you can capture the whole of the spatial past. Past and future in a relativistic universe are not related as slices through the world that separate the spatial past from the spatial future, they're rather related as stacks of nested light cones that piece together in this four dimensional structure. And at no point does the past determine the future. So in a relativistic universe, you can still be a fatalist. You can still think, yeah, what will be will be, but relativity rules out at the level of the very geometry or the shape of space and time, this point of view that seems to allow determinism to pose a distinctive worry to our sense of freedom. So in a relativistic universe, there was no initial moment at which the die was cast for the rest of the universe. If you trace up your world line, so remember that set of events that represents your life, or the world line of any object, okay? there is novelty at every step. So sort of looking into your future, there will be things that happen that aren't predictable from your past. And every event along your life is the convergence of lines of development it, that reach from distance, distant places in the universe. There is no, moreover, there is no univocal notion of temporal order for the universe as a whole. There's no place in the universe from which you could go back far enough and cast your net wide enough to capture a sufficient basis to predict its future. This whole mesh-like structure is a network of world lines that represent the possible histories of objects where there's a definite temporal order along each line, but no global order. Again, every event is the convergence of different pasts lines of developments coming together in an order that's dictated by the, the geometry. Now, imaginatively, it's irresistible to think that there must be some story about how this whole network of world lines unfolds, as though if you could transcend your own past, you could see what's coming down the pike into your future. Um, but there's unequivocally, that's not correct. There is no such point of view that lets you transcend your own past and capture the whole story about how the thing unfolds. Mathematically, this four-dimensional structure is perfectly well-defined. Looking forward along your own life, nothing in your past determines what will cross the past, what, what, what will come to cross your own path. Looking back, it looks like the things that happen to you have their own pasts and we're already on their way to meet you on the crossroads. 
But your own history and the history of the world is the history of these meetings. Einstein called these meetings point coincidences. There is no meaningful sense, literally in a relativistic universe in which time itself passes and no meaningful notion of temporal development because no global notion of now at the level of the universe as a whole. So you can maintain this sort of individual sense of temporal development along the world line. There is no global sense of temporal development. Every individual life unfolds one event at a time with a past that never predetermines its future, but a future that looking back post determines its own past. Now that doesn't end the discussion of free will. But rather by forcing us to get rid of that sort of simple and imaginatively powerful vision that says that the whole future of the universe was entailed by facts that were in place the minute that the positions and the momenta of all the particles that make up the universe were put in place or long before any of us were a gleam in anybody's eyes. It gets rid of that picture and it forces us instead to talk about how our actions are woven into the fabric of the universe. So relativity not only changes our notions of past and future in a way that makes the simple argument from determinism, that is that particularly simple argument from determinism unavailable, but by replacing global laws with laws that, um, uh, that remain silent about how, how one thing affects one another with local laws, it gives us a much more imminent and clear understanding of what's sort of happening on the ground, event by event, and interaction by interaction. So in this new setting, the sort of basic argument for, um, against the, uh, for the incompatibility of freedom and determinism gets reformulated in terms of local laws and without reference to the past of the universe as a whole. So here's what the reformulated argument looks like. If I'm looking into my future from some point in space time, P, what happens along my world line in my life between now and some future point, P star, so three days or a year from now, is jointly entailed by the past at P, the past at that earlier moment, plus all of the things that are going to come into my light cone and cross my path between now and then. So here's how the reformulated argument goes. Clearly, I don't control all of these external factors, these facts that come from outside my light cone to impact me between now and then. And I don't control the past. So on the face of it, this argument looks as strong as ever. But now I think two things become directly relevant. They're brought into focus by reformulating the argument this way. One, we can no longer locate a sufficient set of events to determine your future and your actions, and by extension, the future of the universe, that doesn't explicitly include you. And by you, I mean, I'm taking for granted that viewed through physical lenses, you are an embodied intelligence or if you like, a minded body, that is a body with a mind. Moreover, we can't find a sufficient basis for your future act. So what I'm saying here is that we can't find a sufficient basis for your future actions that doesn't include your body and your brain and what's going on in your brain. And since your action, uh, it's easy to show this, sorry, as a matter of physics. So if we put a toaster in your head, so we take the past of the universe and your body, but now we, we put a toaster in your head or we scramble up your brain. Your body is not going to do much of anything. If we put someone else's brain in your head, you're gonna do different things. That is the physics entails that different things are going to happen. So your brain and what's going on in your brain is directly relevant as a matter of physics to what your body does. Moreover, once we include your brain, we include the thoughts and the hopes and the dreams and so on that are embodied in your neural state. And things are arranged in physical terms inside your body to give those things 
control over your voluntary behavior. That is, those things regulate the bearing of external influences on your behavior. This too is straightforward. If we fix the state of, of the environment outside your body, and we fix the external influences impinging on your body, and we fix the physical laws, we can't predict anything. We have to add the state of your brain and what's going on inside your body to derive any predictions from the physical law. And typically in cases of voluntary behavior, your decisions and the deliberations that led up to them will play a pivotal role on what happens, meaning we can fix the external environment and fix the physical laws and fix the past, but we get very different behaviors depending on what's going on inside your brain. The locus of control over your voluntary behaviors are the deliberative processes going on inside your brain. Those processes play the role of a switch operator, regulating the flow of information from external influence into action. So as a matter of physics, it's, it's neither you alone nor the external variables that are impinging on the surface of your body between now and some future event that determine what will happen, but the two together. So what this looks like is that the physics is telling us that what happens in the future hinges on what we decide. And by hinges on, I mean our decisions play a pivotal role in determining the difference between different possible futures. And that the future hangs in the balance in just the way that we think from common sense point of view, as we toss and turn on the eve of a difficult decision. Now, if you worry about determinism though, there's one obvious thing to say. You're gonna say, yes, but determinism entails that what your thoughts and hopes and dreams are, are themselves the product of your past and all of the things that have happened to you up until the moment of decision. That's correct. Determinism does entail that. At a crude level, things are pretty much as common sense supposes. So your action, here's the moment at which you, make, you perform an action. Your, and here's your past, sorry for the crude diagrams. Here's your past light cone, here's your birth. Your action is the meeting of two different lines of development. One line of development is the thread of development that leads from your birth and growth up to this moment that puts you here fully formed as you stand, poised to meet the situation that presents itself. The other line of development is whatever incalculable confluence of factors come together, these external, the external aspects of the world that come, that come together and present you with a situation in the moment. Now, what I want to look like, look at, sorry, is what this really means, not in abstraction, by talk, but by talking in concrete terms about particular events in the actual lives of people like you and I, of the kind that you will recognize. So you can understand what physics really says about you and the status of your own decisions if you want to see yourselves through the lenses of classical physics. So first it's worth emphasizing, just in qualitative terms, the radical contingency of the confluence of actions, of, of sorry, of accidents that made our biosphere possible from the point of view of the physical laws themselves. So a good many universes that satisfy the laws of classical mechanics don't do anything interesting at all. To give you a sense of what I mean here is that if we're considering finite classical universes in a box, so not expanding, and we're looking at them from a macroscopic perspective, at the level, at the scale at which we see things through our ordinary senses. Most systems like that sit in macroscopic equilibrium, like a cup of water at room temperature 
or a cup of coffee with all of the cream mixed in. Right? So there's constant microscopic activity, but the microscopic activity is random and disordered. The macroscopic state of a system like that looks more or less uniform. There is no change, it just sits there. If there is change, it's not really development. Right? That is to say, it doesn't, it doesn't go through a developmental process. There's a little bit of bubbling change, but it's, it's sort of random and disordered. In our universe, however, it seems to have been in a quite special, highly ordered state in the distant past, a, low, a state of what's called low entropy. Something put it into a state, like the sort of coffee cup on the left here, or like the state of, of a gas where the different the particles are collected in two corners like this. In a universe that starts out in a state like that, microscopic activity, sort of the constant random movement of the particles that make up the system, is going to eventually lead it into a state like the uniformly mixed state on the right here, where it will stay. But in the meantime, while it's moving from this state to this state or this state to this state, interesting things are going to happen. We are living in this sort of beautiful and quite special era along the way in which the microscopic mixing is working on that ordered state to produce complex patterning. Indeed, we are products of that era. It is part of what is needed for the emergence of complexity and life. Now, the full set of conditions that are needed to support the emergence of life are not well understood. Whatever they are, whatever those conditions are, our planet has them, we know that. And with those conditions in place, some combination of self-organization and selection allowed a process of evolution to get started. Once that process gains traction, really interesting things begin to happen. So evolution at the long time scale is a very effective search mechanism for complex systems, that is systems made of a large number of parts right, that are able to survive and reproduce. What that means is a lot of different things. It means being able to meet their own energy requirements because they have to maintain, they have to work to maintain their own internal integrity by converting energy from the environment into work. It means competing for resources, resisting predators, adapting to change. It turns out that a very valuable commodity in doing those things, competing for resources, resisting predators, adapting to change, is the ability to capture and use information. Now, this is something that really emerged from the evolutionary record, rather than something that one would be able to guess just by looking at the equations of physics. Physics makes possible all, all kinds of high-level configurations of components. Selection pressures act on the emergent functionalities of systems of components of a very high degree of physical complexity, that is, systems of a huge number of individual components. Okay. The ones that get selected and survive and preserved by evolutionary dynamics and hence the ones that populate our world are the ones that, as it turns out, utilize and process information in effective ways. So if we line up biological systems from the very simple to the very complex, we can discern, looking historically, a line of development in which there's an increasing amount of internal activity inside the system between stimulus and response. That is to say, there's more and more activity inside the system that's decoupled from the environment and designed to support the uptake and use of information. By the time we get to the human being, large amounts of neural machinery are devoted not to the direct control of action, but to the trafficking and routing of information in the brain. So given the mix of regularity and randomness that we have in our environment, you can sort of see how evolution would reward increasingly sophisticated ways of using information. 
tangible signs of predator and prey will be available to any creature moving through forest or field. E um, creatures with evolved responses to the right stimuli, they don't need to do a lot of internal representation. But a creature that does, a creature that stores large bodies of information and organizes that information, a creature that can extract predictive regularities from what it sees and use what it knows about those regularities to avert, promote, facilitate, or de defray events that it predicts. A creature that can plan and strategize with an eye to specific ends at some temporal remove, a creature like that will have an advantage in a world as complex as ours. And that, of course, is the kind of thing that we are. So we're thinking, when we're thinking in these terms, that is in terms of, of creatures that do more and more explicit representation and use information to guide their behavior, we go from behavioral responses to stimuli selected by an evolutionary process okay, to information being stored internally and used in combination with other information to select behaviors in real time. The internalization of the information and selection progress, uh, process that increases the flexibility of the system, increases its flexibility to, to, um, to, to the, the differences that it can show, not just in how it reacts to stimuli, but to the larger situation of the world. From an internal perspective, this internalization and selection of response is a game changer because now we have a creature with a whole internal evolving image of a world with a past and future. And that internal evolving image is adjusted in real time to incoming information. Now we have a creature that's not just producing adaptive responses to a stimulus, but choosing action based on the past with an eye to their long-term effects. Eventually we have a system that's making plans forming projects, sorting out priorities. We have a creature that is to say that's deciding on its own terms how to live. Qualitatively, in physical terms. So what's happening here is that the underlying classical mechanical laws in the setting of this sort of gradient on the way from low to high entropy, where you've got a universe that's going from a, an ordered state to, um, a, a, to a, a less ordered state. With the principle of selection in play is allowing for the sifting of order out of disorder, for the creation of information from noise. So we start with these highly ordered conditions. So left to its own devices, the order will start to decay moving towards a more uniform state on the right. So from, from a state like this to a state like that. But this mixing is gonna generate complex systems and selection is acting to preserve the complex systems that metabolize energy from the, from the environment, work to maintain their own internal integrity and pursue their own ends. And these creatures in their own turn structure their surroundings. So they put down roots, they build dams, guiding the flow of, they dig ditches, they dig holes, guiding the flow of nutrients and energy. And voila, it's a kind of miracle of producing order from disorder, information from noise. The microscopic laws haven't changed. What is happening is that the microscopic components are being pulled together into new configurations, and then selection mechanisms are acting on configurations to preserve systems that do interesting things. And everything that happens here is, of course, compatible with the laws of physics and implicit in the physical laws under the right sorts of special conditions. But the really explanatory thread is seeing how evolution gets going under those conditions and the results of the evolutionary process. The process 
that leads through evolution to human beings is a slow one. So structure accumulates in an incremental process that takes billions of years and involves innumerable accents. This is all prehistory for you and I. We are sort of dropped into the world with brains and bodies that we didn't design, a collection of accumulated pledges that um, with a late addition of a kind of information hungry executive system that's building up an internal image of the world and guiding our voluntary behaviors. Okay. But unlike the simple hardwired responses of sort of a frog snapping out its tongue to catch a passing fly. And unlike the behaviors in your own body, like the beating of your heart that are, in, that are controlled by involuntary mechanisms or like immune responses or part, large parts of locomotion. Unlike those things, the movements controlled by that late, lately added executive system don't provide us with immediately scripted responses to stimuli. Rather, this is how it works. People who grow up with a rich and sufficiently diverse environment will extract out of the noisy accidents of their lives, a body of belief, a collection of hopes and fears and dreams and priorities, plans and projects. And when a person like this makes a choice, all of that stuff is brought to bear. That's how things are arranged in physical terms. I'm gonna to describe to you a particular event. When Philip Larkin started writing Obad, his famous poem in 1974, um, he worked on it for a long time. He only finished it three years later after the death of his mother. The poem, often said to be his last truly great poem is a kind of meditation on death. And I want you to think in physical terms about the physical state of Philip Larkin against the background of what we've just said when he sat down to write the poem and think about what was happening in his body over the course of the creative process. So the genes in his body and the blood flowing through his veins were the product of a long lineage of accidental couplings. So DNA testing nowadays tells us how far back that information goes and how specific it is. So the genes in my body carry evidence of thousands of years of specific encounters in places from the Arab Peninsula to Northern Germany. Now Larkin, all of that's encoded in Larkin's body. Larkin was educated at home until the age of eight by his mother and his sister. And then here's him, these are actual pictures of him. Then he went to a private school and began um, at Oxford University in October 1940, a year after the outbreak of the Second World War. So his mind was shaped by his education and by his experiences in a way that was no less specific and complex and, um, than yours and mine were by our educations and by our histories. He sought friends and read books. He fell in love. He saw Hitler march into Paris. He lived through bombings. He discovered jazz, lived through the blackouts with falling bombs. He picked and chose and constituted himself out of the myriad accidents of his history. There's no way of separating what was essential from what was incidental. So later experiences layer over previous ones and interactions backward and forward in one's mind are so complex that there's not in general a way of compressing the history that makes a person what they are. One thing had to grow into another which grew into another in a structure that was cumulative and developmental. At each moment, knitting old influences into new ones, discarding some things and amplifying others. 
from a physical perspective, what we think of as the organized body of information at his mind, in his mind. So the memories, the hopes, the dreams, all of that structure is encoded in the neural connections in his brain in the same way that our lineage is encoded in our genes. That's how nature makes the past relevant to the here and now. Who knows what prompting air, what sort of sorry, passing air prompted him to put to, to in that first moment that he began to conceive the poem. Maybe the morning light as the title of the poem suggests. It took three years for the poem to incubate. And one imagines that he worked on it on and off with visions and revisions coming in the shower over breakfast, triggered by a song, a butterfly, a shadow, and those thoughts that happen in the space that opens up in a conversation to let the train pass. Putting pen to paper and bringing those words somehow up out of the depths of his imagination. All of that is made concrete. It is a poem that couldn't have been written by anybody else and that he couldn't have written at any other stage of his life. And that maybe couldn't have happened except for the very specific events that happened over the course of his history and over the time that he was writing the poem. Now, maybe there's some temptation to say that the universe made Larkin what he was. It plopped him into the world and grew him over time, feeding him experience. But we don't grow like a plant grows. Nature gives us a brain that was designed to let us grow ourselves. We don't do it passively, that is to say. You should be able to recognize the process of self-constitution from your own case as an active process. You choose friends and experiences. You choose what to take. You choose which bit, books to read, which friends to have, what to remember and what to forget. Larkin is at least in part his own product. And I feel no inclination to say anything but that he made the poem. It, it was brought to life nowhere else than at the end of his pen. It couldn't have come from anyone else or at any other time. There's this wonderful book by Robert Sapolsky called Behave, where he talks about the layers of structure and the whole constellation of factors that are implicated in the production of a single human behavior. So he talks about all of the processes at all of the different time scales that come together to explain a single human act. He says here, a behavior has occurred. What occurred in the prior second that triggered that behavior. This is the province of the nervous system. What occurred in the prior seconds to minutes that triggered the nervous system to produce the behavior? This is the process of the world of sensory stimuli. What occurred in the prior hours to days to change the sensitivity of the nervous system to such stimuli? Acute actions of hormones and so on all the way back to the evolutionary pressures played out over prior millions of years that started the ball rolling. Now he seems to think that when all of those things are taken into account, there's no room for you. That is that your behavior is accounted for rather completely by all these other things, your genes, your hormones, your biology, the chemical reactions in your brain. Add into this the effects of your education, your culture, the particular experiences that you didn't chose, choose that happened to you over the course of your personal history. And lots of people, I think, have the kind of reaction that Sapolsky is encouraging here. Okay. But I always wonder what exactly those people think that they are. Okay. Those things, that list of things that Sapolsky is pointing to, those aren't something other than you that determines your behavior. Those things are you. You are a completely unique convergence of evolutionary, biological, historical, cultural, situational, and psychological forces that come together. Some of that is structure that's sort of given, structure that you didn't create. But some of it's structure that's actively creating, created and created by you 
the process of constituting yourself out of the noisy accidents of your experience, that does fall to you. That is your job. That's what nature made you to do. And in this process, this process of self-constitution, there's a soft but real separation of structure that's given to you. So for example, the fixed structure of your brain and body and structure that you play a role in creating, structure like the acquisition of beliefs, the seeking of experiences, the active process of making yourself out of the noisy accidents of your life. So I can't help thinking that if you feel your sense of autonomy challenged by the sort of thing that, that Sapolsky is pointing to and that I've said here, if you feel your sense of autonomy challenged by it, then your sense of autonomy is probably too strong. At the same time that we are shaped by history, we transform history. So you don't come from nothing, but you build on and transform the threads of history that pass through you. And they will in their turn be woven into the histories of others. In that sense, the world doesn't happen without you. It doesn't happen anyway, and it doesn't happen in the way that it would have had you not been there. Your, your, history, is integ your history and your choices are integrally woven in to what happens in the future. I should say, I could have chosen different poems. I chose Obad, but I could have chosen this poem, Harlem. So you may have encountered it before. This is by Langston Hughes. If you're American, it shows up in most anthologies and often on high school curricula for Americans. I'll give you a moment to read it if you don't know it. So this is a poem that most Americans will understand. Um, it, it's rooted in the history of a city and a culture. It's a poem that was in incubation much longer than the three years that it took, for example, the three years it took, for example, for Larkin to write Obam, Obad. It's, it was a poem that was in incubation much longer than its own author, Hughes. This poem was in incubation from the moment that the first slave was taken from the African coast. What had to happen in, this, in the world for this poem to happen was New York and Harlem, but also ineliminably the little boy from Missouri who grew, up, who grew himself on jazz and poetry. It was what that history did in him and what he did with that history that produced these words. Okay, so you might think, okay, well, writing a poem is a bit of a rarefied activity. It's, it's, an, it's maybe one of the most self-consciously creative and self-expressive forms of human activity. But let's think about an everyday human behavior. You come home after a hard day, you look in the fridge, you survey, you survey the detritus of last week's shopping, and you think, what shall I make? The decision, what shall I make, happens on the spot in a way that draws in a lot of different threads. It draws in the tastes and preferences that you've built up over the course of your life. That's part biology, part childhood, part self-consciously cultivated tastes, part idiosyncratically linked to specific experiences and specific memories. So this is structure that's there in the here and now encoded in your tastes and preferences, but it bears the traces of, say, the link between the taste of chili and the excitement of a first date, or the link between fish sauce and your first experiences with food poisoning. You also look at the, the um, things that you have in your fridge and on your shelves, maybe the smell of tomato sauce coming from downstairs and the twinge in your stomach evoked by a waft of hot air that came out of the Thai place whose door opened as you walked home in the snow. All of those things come together in that moment. Your thought, what do I want? What can I do with all of these things? Is the convergence of all of that. 
So summoning all of your creative energies, you check the time, you cast your eye across the, spa the spices that have accumulated on your shelf over the years, and you say, what can I pull into a meal for me? What is happening here is pretty generic. Again, there's a meeting or a confrontation between you with all of your built up tastes and preferences encoded in the soft structure of your brain okay? and a situation, whatever accidental confluence of things come together in just that way at just that time. Determinism entails that the choice is determined by neither of those things individually, neither purely by your tastes, neither purely by the situation, but by those things together. And that those things come together in just that way, nowhere else in the, the, than in the here and now. The decision is you meeting the moment. There's a couple of things that are worth, and that's all true just as a matter of physics. There are a couple of things that are worth bringing out here. One is the accumulation of information and the role that it plays causally makes that temporally extended character of some processes essential to them. Okay. Processes like this, processes that involve the accumulation of information and the use of that information to guide behavior, those processes have to run their course, building up structure in layers. The process that goes from past to your action has to be grown in stages from the microscopic disorder that was there in the distant past, mixed, proved, needed, and proved again before it is baked. And each stage nurtures and filters to produce the order that's there at the final stage. You yourself are the culmination of all of that. No single piece of the passage from the distant past to the here and now can generally be excised or taken out of the chain events that puts you here to confront the situation that presents itself. That last, that sorry, that includes, that is when I said no, no part of that can be excised from the chain. Right? That includes the last stage, the stage of deliberation, where a decision is being forced out of all of that accumulated structure in your head in a sifting process that involves tossing and turning, weighing and wavering, a step forward, two steps back, choices between priorities, reordering and uh, um, incommensurable um, priorities. Each part of that is essential and integral to the process that produces the decision. The magic is not in the conditions around the time of the Big Bang, nor in the microscopic laws that are the same always and everywhere, but, in, but the magic is in the way that those microscopic laws, mixing regularity and randomness and allowing structure to accumulate and selection to operate happen over the course of the passage from the distant past to the here and now. That process takes time, and it's the result of a whole incompressible chain of events. The other thing to emphasize is spontaneity. There's also a real-time coupling with an external environment that brings divergent threads of development together in a way that could only happen in the here and now. The, that sense that one has in living a life of the threads coming together in just that way and in just that, at just that moment in a way that wasn't even predictable in advance. That's not illusory, that's built right in, it goes right down to the level of fundamental geometry. It's encoded in what I said before about the way that the light cones come together in a relativistic universe. It's not illusory and it's not merely an artifact of you're not knowing the past. Okay. I'm almost done. I want to say one final, give you one final example of what human action looks like through the lenses of physics um, in concrete detail. So when I was in graduate school, I signed up for the cheap tickets for an Isaac Stern concert at Carnegie Auditorium. The concert itself was supposed to be nothing extraordinary, 
But the night before Leonard Bernstein, this man here, um, composer, musician, musical ambassador, and beloved New Yorker who had conducted the New York Philharmonic for 32 years and played, conducted time and time again in um, Carnegie Auditorium. He had retired just a week before, and the night before the conference, uh, the concert, he died suddenly of a heart attack in his Upper West Side apartment. The auditorium, of course, was full of people that revered Bernstein. At the concert, Stern appeared, oops, sorry, let me go back. Um, I should say a couple of things. So Stern and Bernstein, here's Bernstein, here's Stern, were friends and collaborators for decades. So Leonard Bernstein, in fact, wrote a poem, this poem here for Stern on his 60th birthday, that's so affectionate, it will melt your heart. And uh, these are them over the years, they played time and again together. At the concert, Stern appeared on stage, raised his instrument and then played alone. The other musicians sat with their instruments in their laps. There was nothing in the auditorium, but the pure solitary sound coming from the strings on Stern's violin. Now think for a moment about all of the different threads of development that had to come together to produce the sounds coming out of that violin. The vibrations in the air produced by the motion of the bow over the strings. What had to happen for there to be human beings and violins? Think about the years of training it took to build the muscles in Stern's arm and the ex exquisite sensitive, sensitivity of the responsiveness of those muscles to what he was hearing in his ears. Think about the built up emotion of Stern's history with Bernstein, all of those particular specific occasions. Think about the auditorium full of people that revered Bernstein. It's as though the whole history prepared Stern and put him there on that stage to meet that moment. All of that, the history, the emotion, the years of practice transformed there into sound. But I think it was undoubtedly he, Stern himself, that met that moment. Stern himself, a singular, unique, non-repeated product of a history that himself is a part, a product of his own choices. Now you get to choose what to make of this for the questions that interest you. Increasingly, I don't find it useful to ask whether this amounts to free will. Free will is a natural concept when one has in one's imagination the idea of a universe unfolding with inexorable necessity from initial conditions that were laid down long ago. Okay. That sort of pre-relativistic vision of a universe in which the deterministic laws have a very specific kind of import. But it's really dual to that picture. And once that picture is given up, as it was, I think, with relativity, it has little specific content a little positive content of its own. If you look at the philosophical debate, everyone seems to agree on what determinism entails and they have in mind here that broadly kind of Newtonian vision, but there's no agreement on what freedom is or what would have to be possible for us to be free. Maybe a better notion to have in mind in this new setting, a notion through which to understand ourselves is creativity. What's remarkable about the biosphere is its creativity. But we have to think of creativity here, not in terms of production, but in terms of transformation. Creativity is mixing and sifting and filtering and amplifying. It's creating order out of disorder, making information from noise. Evolution, biology in its myriad ways does this, but you extracting beliefs, desires, priorities from the noisy accidents of your life, becoming a person and a specific person with plans and projects, and your own special view of the world, you're doing the same sort of thing. 
on a shorter time scale when you make a decision, imposing just a little more order on the beliefs, desires, commitments, and so on that go into your utility function. You are part of this process of creating order. This is what it looks like, I think, to really see us absorbed into the fabric of the universe as it's described by physics. Of course, most of the universe is beyond our reach and we beyond its in the most absolute sense. Current estimates put the size of the universe at least 250 times bigger than the part of the universe um, from which light can reach us. The rest of the, the inaccessibility of the rest of the universe is analogous to us being surrounded by a giant black hole. We can't get information from it. It can't get information from us. Eventually, the expectation is that all of the accumulated structure that we're a part, we're both a product of and a part of creating will fade like a footprint in the sand. But the idea that it is inevitable, preordained, that the actual sifting of order out of the microscopic chaos of the world is somehow written in stone rather than a surprising feature of otherwise unremarkable laws operating in the extraordinary setting, that sort of gradient from low to higher entropy is just mistaken. The conditions that allow for all of this to happen, that allow for structure to accumulate in this way are special, contingent and fleeting. I can hear you, yeah. Excellent. Thank you for the amazing talk. I think you're all pretty moved to hear that. Anyway, if anybody wants to ask questions, please maybe put them over. I think it's better probably if you can come here to the chair. <clears throat> we are running a little bit of over time. Yeah, you sit over here and you can come here. We're running a little bit of our time, but let's see if we can, we probably have a few more minutes here. Let's see. Hi, Jinan. Hi. Can you see me? Good to see you. Yeah. Okay. Hey. If you speak close to the microphone, I can hear you much better. Oh, dear Lord. Uh, Perfect. <laughs> oh. Good way of explicating your ideas. Thank you for that. And I have a, one question regarding Sophia, wisdom. Okay. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Is there, a is there a comprehensive explanation for the nature of wisdom in terms of natural history, evolution and so? Uh, we like to think every feature of mind has an evolutionary advantage, but is wisdom still something more? Is wisdom real, something more than just evolutionary advantage? Um, it's a good question. Um, I think so. My my natural response is that we would need an understand. We would need an analysis of wisdom, which is something that we don't have right now. Before we're able to answer that, um, so if one can say more specifically what wisdom is, then we can begin to ask well, in a rigorous and specific way. Yeah, but it is the pressure of natural selection not to explain comprehensively the nature of wisdom. Is it enough to explain what is wisdom if we just say it's an evolutionary advantage? Is it really ex really enough just to explain? I think, um, so there are a lot of things that we do that were selected without being selected for. So the kind of curiosity that we have and the capability of encoding of, of you know, encoding and storing large bodies of information, the ability to take our own beliefs as sort of objects of, 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 of thought and to, and to employ things like you know, sort of standards of consistency and coherence and to, uh, to, to reflexively think about our beliefs and to aim for certain sort of standards, all of that um, was selected because it had an evolutionary advantage, but it gives rise to a whole cascade 
of uniquely intellectual capacities that I think wisdom and understanding are the products of. Yeah, wisdom seems um, to be I, Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Wisdom, okay. Wisdom seems to be something more than just accumulation of experiences. It's something a little bit more. It doesn't pre uh, present itself from the experience itself, but it is something that we are a part of in making. And uh, it's, 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 it's just a very in interesting phenomenon, since I understand that you, you, it is the core of your work, the philosophy of, of, or, or the, of wisdom. And I think that to explain wisdom and to really the capture of nature of wisdom, we need something more than just an idea of natural selection. And I'm wondering what is that, that something more? Thank you. Hi. I don't know where Hi. You are. Where's the camera? Are you here? Yeah. Yeah, there it is. Thanks for a wonderful talk. Um, just a, a delight to uh, to attend. Um, I wanted to ask you. I mean, I, I happen to be a compatibilist, so um, I really don't have a problem with free will, and um, for many of the reasons you cite. But when I talk to not uh, incompatibilists, they often confront me with the problem of, um, they believe that there's a principle of could have done otherwise. And I was just wondering what advice you would give. Do you say to such people that if they have a really strong notion of could have done otherwise, then they need to abandon that, that it's too strong a notion of autonomy? Or do you think that your notion, that the notion that they could have done otherwise in the very same situation can be explained in a deterministic framework? Yeah. So that was the, the point of going through the relativistic stuff at the beginning. It is literally, so could have done otherwise is always could have done otherwise given what? Right? So we've got laws, we fix the, I mean, the usual story in a Newtonian setting is, well, you know, we, we don't say, for example, could have done otherwise given the way the future will be, but it's rather that determinism is supposed to present a challenge because given the past and given the laws, you're supposed to think, that um, you couldn't have done otherwise than what you in fact did. The whole point of the beginning of the talk was to tell you that's literally false. If you're in a relativistic universe by the past, you mean the causal past. It's literally true that given the past at any point in space time and given the deterministic laws, could you do something otherwise than you in fact do at any point in the future? The answer is yes. The laws do not entail a definite prediction. Oh no, I meant from the perspective of P star. So um, given P star's past, um, P star had to occur. It couldn't have been the case that P star didn't occur. There's never a, there was never a world, there was never a universe, and there was never an evolution of my uh, two, uh, um, of, my, uh, mm -hmm. of my world line in which P star didn't happen. Right. Good. So right. So, but as soon as you do on, move to the point sorry, of view, oh, sorry. So one of the things that happens when you move to that later point of view and you say, given its past, you know, it couldn't have happened otherwise than it did, but included in its past are your growth and your, you know, formation of plans and projects and your deliberation. So yes, it couldn't have happened otherwise than it did, given that you made the choice that you did, calling on your hopes and dreams and start and 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 you know plans and projects. That looks to me like a straight forward vindication of the the essential and integral role that your decisions and your you know, specific thoughts and hopes and dreams play in producing that action. It looks to me like it precisely vindicates your sense that it doesn't happen anyways and it doesn't happen without me and it comes from that core of things that I identify with as being the, you know, the, the kind of the, 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 the encoding of the universe of my soul. Okay, thank you very much. The encoding in the universe of my soul. So thank you so much. We are, I think, over here. Our schedule requires us to 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 move on, but uh, it's it was real lovely, 
and we uh, we hope also i hope that we will soon meet in the same space time region although it's fantastic to meet virtually as well let's let's thank Yenon once more thank, thank you. you so much for having me and i'm so sorry i'm not there okay so so bye bye and i will be in touch yeah Yeah, so that made all the illness that Sally only one food and I'll stay at Santa Kia.